Preface of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Yu Ting in Singapore. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Preface. The manuscript of Sir William Osler's lectures on the evolution of modern medicine, delivered at Yale University in April 1913 on the Silliman Foundation, was immediately turned into the Yale University Press for publication. Duly set in type, proofs and galley form had been submitted to him, and despite countless interruptions, he had already corrected and revised a number of the galleys when the Great War came. But with the war on, he threw himself with energy and devotion into the military and public duties, which devolved upon him, and so never completed his proofreading and intended alterations. The careful corrections which Sir William made in the earlier galleys show that the lectures were dictated, in the first instance, as loose memoranda for oral delivery, rather than as finished compositions for the eye, while maintaining throughout the logical continuity and the engaging commoto which was so characteristic of his literary style. In revising the lectures for publication, therefore, the editors have merely endeavoured to carry out, with care and befitting reverence, the indications supplied in the earlier galleys by Sir William himself. In supplying dates and references which were lacking, these preferences as to editions and readings have been borne in mind. The slight alterations made, the adaptation of the text to the eye, detract nothing from the original freshness of the work. In a letter to one of the editors, Osler described these lectures as an aeroplane flight over the progress of medicine through the ages. They are, in effect, a sweeping panoramic survey of the whole vast field, covering wide areas at a rapid pace, yet with extraordinary variety of detail. The slow, painful character of the evolution of medicine from the fearsome, superstitious mental complex of the primitive man, with his amulets, healing gods and diseased demons, to the ideal of a clear-eyed rationalism, is traced with faith and a serene sense of continuity. The author saw clearly and felt deeply that the men who have made an idea or discovery viable and valuable to humanity are the deserving men. He has made the great names shine out without any depreciation of the important work of lesser men and without cluttering up his narrative with a tedious prehistory of great discoveries or with shrill claims to priority. Of his skill in differentiating the sundry strains of medicine, there is specific witness in each section. Osler's wide culture and control of the best available literature of his subject permitted him to arrange the ampler ether of Greek medicine or the earth-fettered schools of today with equal mastery. There is no quick set of pedantry between the author and the reader. The illustrations which he had doubtlessly planned as fully for the last as for the earlier chapters, are as he left them, save that, lacking legends, these have been supplied, and a few, which could not be identified, have, with regret, been omitted. The original galley proofs have been revived and corrected from different viewpoints by Fielding H. Garrison, Harvey Cushing, Edward C. Streeter, and latterly by Leonard L. McCall whose zeal and persistence in the painstaking verification of citations and references cannot be too highly commended. In the present revision, a number of important corrections, most of them based upon the original manuscript, have been made by Dr. W. W. Francis, Oxford, Dr. Charles Singer, London, Dr. E. C. Streeter, Mr. L. L. McCall, and others. This work, composed originally for a lay audience and for popular consumption, will be to the aspiring medical student and the hard-working practitioner a lift into the blue, an inspiring vista, or Pisgah's sight of the evolution of medicine, a realisation of what devotion, perseverance, valour and ability on the part of physicians have contributed to this progress, and of the credible part 
which our profession has played in the general development of science. The editors have no hesitation in presenting these lectures to the profession and to the reading public as one of the most characteristic productions of the best balanced, best equipped, most sagacious, and most lovable of all modern physicians. F. H. G. Quote, But on that account, I say, we ought not to reject the ancient art as if it were not and had not been properly founded, because it did not attain accuracy in all things, but rather, since it is capable of reaching to the greatest exactitude by reasoning, to receive it and admire its discoveries, made from a state of great ignorance, and as have been well and properly made, and not from chance. End quote. Hippocrates. Quote, the true and lawful goal of the sciences is none other than this, that human life be endowed with new discoveries and powers. End quote. Francis Bacon. Quote, a golden thread has run throughout the history of the world, consecutive and continuous, the work of the best men in successive ages. From point to point it still runs, and when near, you feel it as the clear and bright and certainly irresistible light which truth throweth forth when great minds conceive it. End quote. Walter Moxon. Quote, For the mind depends so much on the temperament and disposition of the bodily organs that if it is possible to find a means of rendering men wiser and cleverer than they have hitherto been, I believe that it is in medicine that it must be sought. It is true that the medicine which is now in vogue contains little of which the utility is remarkable, but without having any intention of decrying it, I am sure that there is no one, even among those who make it study a profession, who does not confess that all that men know is almost nothing in comparison with what remains to be known, and that we could be free of an infinitude of maladies both of body and mind, and even also possibly of the infirmities of age, if we had sufficient knowledge of their causes, and of all the remedies with which nature has provided us. End quote. Descartes. End of preface. Recording by Yu Ting in Singapore. Section 1 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami, M.D. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Chapter 1. Origin of Medicine. Introduction. Sail to the Pacific with some ancient mariner and traverse day by day that silent sea, until you reach a region never before furrowed by keel, where a tiny island, a mere speck on the vast ocean, has just arisen from the depths, a little coral reef capped with green, an atoll, a mimic earth, fringed with life, built up through countless ages by life, on the remains of life that has passed away. And now, with wings of fancy, Join Ianthe in the magic car of Shelley, pass the eternal gates of the flaming ramparts of the world, and see his vision. Below lay stretched the boundless universe, there far as the remotest line that limits swift imagination's flight, unending orbs mingled in mazy motion, immutably fulfilling eternal nature's law. Above, below, around, the circling systems formed a wilderness of harmony. And somewhere as fast and far the chariot flew, amid the mighty globes would be seen a tiny speck, Earth's distant orb, one of the smallest lights that twinkle in the heavens. Alighting, Ianthe would find something she had probably not seen elsewhere in her magic flight. Life everywhere encircling the sphere. And as the little coral reef out of a vast depth had been built up by generations of polyzoa, so she would see that on the earth, through illimitable ages, successive generations of animals and plants had left in stone their imperishable records. And at the top of the series she would meet 
the thinking, breathing creature known as man. Infinitely little, as is the architect of the atoll in proportion to the earth on which it rests, the polyzoan, I doubt not, is much larger relatively than is man in proportion to the vast systems of the universe, in which he represents an ultra-microscopic atom less ten thousand times than the tiniest of the gay motes that people the sunbeams. Yet with colossal audacity this thinking atom regards himself as the anthropocentric pivot around which revolve the eternal purposes of the universe. Knowing not whence he came, why he is here, or whither he is going, man feels himself of supreme importance, and certainly is of interest, to himself. Let us hope that he has indeed a potency and importance out of all proportion to his somatic insignificance. We know of toxins of such strength, that an amount too infinitesimal to be gauged may kill, and we know that the unit adopted in certain scientific work is the amount of emanation produced by one million millionth of a grain of radium, a quantity which itself has a volume of less than a million millionth of a cubic millimeter and weighs a million million times less than an exceptionally delicate chemical balance will turn to. May not man be the radium of the universe? At any rate, let us not worry about his size. For us, he is a very potent creature, full of interest, whose mundane story we are only beginning to unravel. Civilization is but a filmy fringe on the history of man. Go back as far as his records carry us, and the story written on stone is of yesterday in comparison with the vast epochs of time which modern studies demand for his life on the earth. For two millions, some hold even three millions, of years, Man lived and moved and had his being in a world very different from that upon which we look out. There appear indeed to have been various types of man, some as different from us as we are from the anthropoid apes. What upstarts of yesterday are the pharaohs in comparison with the men who survived the tragedy of the glacial period? The ancient history of man, only now beginning to be studied, dates from the Pliocene or Miocene period. The modern history as we know it embraces that brief space of time that has elapsed since the earliest Egyptian and Babylonian records were made. This has to be borne in mind in connection with the present mental status of man, particularly in his outlook upon nature. In his thoughts and in his attributes, Mankind at large is controlled by inherited beliefs and impulses which countless thousands of years have ingrained like instinct. Over vast regions of the earth today, magic, amulets, charms, incantations are the chief weapons of defense against malignant nature, and in disease the practice of Asa is comparatively novel and unusual. In days of illness, many millions more still seek their gods rather than the physicians. In an upward path, man has had to work out for himself a relationship with his fellows and with nature. He sought in the supernatural an explanation of the pressing phenomena of life, peopling the world with spiritual beings, deifying objects of nature, and assigning to them benign or malign influences which might be invoked or propitiated. Primitive priest, physician, and philosopher were one, and struggled, on the one hand, for the recognition of certain practices forced on him by experience, and on the other, for the recognition of mystical agencies which control the dark, uncharted region about him, to use Professor Gilbert Murray's phrase, and were responsible for everything he could not understand, and particularly for the mysteries of disease. Pliny remarks that physic was early fathered upon the gods, and to the ordinary non-medical mind there is still something mysterious about sickness, something outside the ordinary standard. Modern anthropologists claim that both religion and medicine took origin in magic, that spiritual protoplasm, as Miss Jane Harrison calls it. To primitive man, magic was the setting in motion of a spiritual power to help or to hurt the individual, 
and early forms may still be studied in the native races. This power, or mana, as it is called, while possessed in a certain degree by all, may be increased by practice. Certain individuals come to possess it very strongly. Among native Australians today, it is still deliberately cultivated. Magic in healing seeks to control the demons or forces causing disease, and in a way it may be thus regarded as a lineal ancestor of modern science, which too seeks to control certain forces, no longer, however, regarded as supernatural. Primitive man recognized many of these superhuman agencies relating to disease, such as the spirits of the dead, either human or animal, independent disease demons, or individuals who might act by controlling the spirits or agencies of disease. We see this today among the Negroes of the southern states. A hoodoo put upon a Negro may, if he knows of it, work upon him so powerfully through the imagination that he becomes very ill indeed, and only through a more powerful magic exercised by someone else can the hoodoo be taken off. To primitive man life seemed full of sacred presences, connected with objects in nature, or with incidents and epochs in life, which he began early to deify, so that until a quite recent period his story is largely associated with a pantheon of greater and lesser gods, which he has manufactured wholesale. Xenophanes was the earliest philosopher to recognize man's practice of making gods in his own image, and endowing them with human faculties and attributes. The Thracians, he said, made their gods blue-eyed and red-haired, the Ethiopians snub-nosed and black, while if oxen and lions and horses had hands and could draw, they would represent their gods as oxen and lions and horses. In relation to nature and to disease, all through early history, we find a pantheon full to repletion bearing testimony no less to the fertility of man's imagination than to the hopes and fears which led him in his exodus from barbarism to regard his gods as pillars of fire by night and pillars of cloud by day. Even so late a religion as that of Numa was full of little gods to be invoked on special occasions. Vatican, who causes the infant to utter his first cry. Fabulinus, who prompts his first word. Cuba, who keeps him quiet in his cot, Domitica, who watches over one's safe homecoming. And Numa believed that all diseases came from the gods and were to be averted by prayer and sacrifice. Besides the major gods, representatives of Apollo, Aesculapius, and Minerva, there were scores of lesser ones who could be invoked for special diseases. It is said that the young Roman mother might appeal to no less than fourteen goddesses, from Juno Lucina to Prosa and Port Warta. Temples were erected to the goddess of fever, and she was much invoked. There is extant a touching tablet erected by a mourning mother and inscribed, Febri Dy, Febri Sancte, Febri Maniae, Camillo Amato Pro Filio Mel Defecto, Pasuit. It is marvelous what a long line of superhuman powers, major and minor, man has evoked against sickness. In Swinburne's words, God by God flits past in thunder till his glories turn to shades. God by God bears wondering witness how his gospel flames and fades. More was each of these, while yet they were, than man their servant seemed. Dead are all of these, and man survives who made them while he dreamed. Most of them have been benign and helpful gods. Into the dark chapters relating to demonical possession and to witchcraft we cannot here enter. They make one cry out with Lucretius, O genus in felix humanum, talia divis cum tribuit facta, atque iris adjunctia cerbas, quantos tum gemitus ipsi sibi, Quantaque nobis vulnera, quas lacrimas peperere minoribu nostris. In every age and in every religion there has been justification for his bitter words, tantum religio patuit suadere malorum. Such wrongs, 
religion in her train doth bring. Yet one outcome of a belief in spiritual beings, as Tyler defines religion, has been that man has built an altar of righteousness in his heart. The comparative method applied to the study of his religious growth has shown how man's thoughts have widened in the unceasing purpose which runs through his spiritual, no less than his physical, evolution. Out of the spiritual protoplasm of magic have evolved philosopher and physician, as well as priest. Magic and religion control the uncharted sphere, the supernatural, the superhuman. Science seeks to know the world and through knowing to control it. Ray Lancaster remarks that man is nature's rebel, and goes on to say, The mental qualities which have developed in man, though traceable in a vague and rudimentary condition in some of his animal associates, are of such an unprecedented power and so far dominate everything else in his activities as a living organism that they have, to a very large extent, if not entirely, cut him off from the general operation of that process of natural selection and survival of the fittest, which up to their appearance had been the law of the living world. They justify the view that man forms a new departure in the gradual unfolding of nature's predestined scheme. Knowledge, reason, self-consciousness, will, are the attributes of man. It has been a slow and gradual growth, and not until within the past century has science organized knowledge, so searched out the secrets of nature as to control her powers, limit her scope, and transform her energies. The victory is so recent that the mental attitude of the race is not yet adapted to the change. A large proportion of our fellow creatures still regard nature as a playground for demons and spirits to be exorcised or invoked. Side by side, as substance and shadow, in the dark backward and abyss of time, in the dawn of the great civilizations of Egypt and Babylon, in the bright morning of Greece, and in the full noontide of modern life, together have grown up these two diametrically opposite views of man's relation to nature, and more particularly of his personal relation to the agencies of disease. The purpose of this course of lectures is to sketch the main features of the growth of these two dominant ideas, to show how they have influenced man at the different periods of his evolution, how the lamp of reason, so early lighted in his soul, burning now bright, now dim, has never even in his darkest period been wholly extinguished, but retrimmed and refurnished by his indomitable energies, now shines more and more toward the perfect day. It is a glorious chapter in history, in which those who have eyes to see may read the fulfillment of the promise of Eden, that one day man should not only possess the earth, but that he should have dominion over it. I propose to take an aeroplane flight through the centuries, touching only on the tall peaks from which may be had a panoramic view of the epochs through which we pass. End of Section 1 Section 2 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2020. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 2. Chapter 1. Origin of Medicine. Origin of Medicine. Medicine arose out of the primal sympathy of man with man, out of the desire to help those in sorrow, need, and sickness. In the primal sympathy which having been must ever be, in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering. The instinct of self-preservation, the longing to relieve a loved one, and above all the maternal passion, for such it is, gradually softened the hard race of man, tum genus humanum primum molestere coepit. In his marvellous sketch of the evolution of man, nothing illustrates more forcibly the prescience of Lucretius than the picture of the growth of sympathy. 
when with cries and gestures they taught with broken words that tis right for all men to have pity on the weak i heard the well-known medical historian the late dr payne remark that the basis of medicine is sympathy and the desire to help others and whatever is done with this end must be called medicine the first lessons came to primitive man by injuries accidents bites of beasts and serpents perhaps for long ages not appreciated by his childlike mind but little by little such experiences crystallized into useful knowledge the experiments of nature made clear to him the relation of cause and effect but it is not likely as pliny suggests that he picked up his earliest knowledge from the observation of certain practices in animals as the natural phlebotomy of the platoric hippopotamus or the use of emetics from the dog or the use of enemata from the ibis on the other hand celsus is probably right in his account of the origin of rational medicine some of the sick on account of their eagerness took food on the first day some on account of loathing abstained and the disease in those who refrained was more relieved some ate during a fever some a little before it others after it had subsided and those who had waited to the end did best for the same reason some at the beginning of an illness used a full diet others a spare and the former were made worse occurring daily such things impressed careful men who noted what had best helped the sick then began to prescribe them in this way medicine had its rise from the experience of the recovery of some of the death of others distinguishing the hurtful from the salutary things book one the association of ideas was suggestive the plant eyebright was used for centuries in diseases of the eye because a black speck in the flower suggested the pupil of the eye the old herbals are full of similar illustrations upon which indeed the so-called doctrine of signatures depends observation came and with it an ever-widening experience no society so primitive without some evidence of the existence of a healing art which grew with its growth and became part of the fabric of its organization with primitive medicine as such i cannot deal but i must refer to the oldest existing evidence of a very extraordinary practice that of trephining neolithic skulls with discs of bone removed have been found in nearly all parts of the world many careful studies have been made of this procedure particularly by the great anatomist and surgeon paul broca and m lucas champonniere has covered the subject in a monograph broca suggests that the trephining was done by scratching or scraping but as lucas champonniere holds it was also done by a series of perforations made in a circle with flint instruments and a round piece of skull in this way removed traces of these drill holes have been found the operation was done for epilepsy infantile convulsions headache and various cerebral diseases believed to be caused by confined demons to whom the hole gave a ready method of escape the practice is still extant lucas champonniere saw a kabyle toubib who told him that it was quite common among his tribe he was the son of a family of trephiners and had undergone the operation four times his father twelve times he had three brothers also experts he did not consider it a dangerous operation he did it most frequently for pain in the head and occasionally for fracture the operation was sometimes performed upon animals shepherds trephined sheep for the staggers we may say that the modern decompression operation so much in vogue is the oldest known surgical procedure end of section 2「section 3 of the evolution of modern medicine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by melody coriati 
The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Section 3, Chapter 1, Origin of Medicine Egyptian Medicine Out of the ocean of oblivion, man emerges in history in a highly civilized state on the banks of the Nile some sixty centuries ago. After millenniums of a gradual upward progress, which can be traced in the records of the Stone Age, civilization springs forth Minerva-like, complete and highly developed, in the Nile Valley. In this sheltered, fertile spot, Neolithic man first raised himself above his kindred races of the Mediterranean basin, and it is suggested that by the accidental discovery of copper, Egypt forged the instruments that raised civilization out of the slough of the Stone Age. Of special interest to us is the fact that one of the best-known names of this earliest period is that of a physician— guide, philosopher, and friend of the king, a man in a position of wide trust and importance. On leaving Cairo to go up the Nile, one sees on the right in the desert behind Memphis a terraced pyramid 190 feet in height, the first large structure of stone known in history. It is the royal tomb of Zoser, the first of a long series with which the Egyptian monarchy sought to adorn the coming bulk of death. The design of this is attributed to Imhotep, the first figure of a physician to stand out clearly from the mists of antiquity. In priestly wisdom, in magic, in the formulation of wise proverbs in medicine and architecture, this remarkable figure of Zoser's reign left so notable a reputation that his name was never forgotten, and 2,500 years after his death he had become a god of medicine, in whom the Greeks— who called him Mimuthes, recognized their own Aesculapius. He became a popular god, not only healing men when alive, but taking good care of them in the journeys after death. The facts about this medicine primus inventor, as he has been called, may be gathered from Kurt Seth's study. He seems to have corresponded very much to the Greek Asclepius. As a god, he is met with comparatively late, between 700 and 332 B.C., Numerous bronze figures of him remain. The oldest memorial mentioning him is a statue of one of his priests, Amasis. Ptolemy V dedicated to him a temple on the island of Philae. His cult increased much in later days, and a special temple was dedicated to him near Memphis. Seth suggests that the cult of Imhotep gave the inspiration to the Hermetic literature. The association of Imhotep with the famous temple at Edfu is of special interest. Egypt became a center from which civilization spread to the other peoples of the Mediterranean. For long centuries, to be learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians meant the possession of all knowledge. We must come to the land of the Nile for the origin of many of man's most distinctive and highly cherished beliefs. Not only is there a magnificent material civilization, but in records so marvelously preserved in stone we may see, as in a glass— here clearly, there darkly, the picture of man's search after righteousness, the earliest impressions of his moral awakening, the beginnings of the strife in which he has always been engaged for social justice and for the recognition of the rights of the individual. But above all, earlier and more strongly than in any other people, was developed the faith that looked through death, to which, to this day, the noblest of their monuments bear an enduring testimony. With all this, it is not surprising to find a growth in the knowledge of practical medicine, but Egyptian civilization illustrates how crude and primitive may remain a knowledge of disease when conditioned by erroneous views of its nature. At first, the priest and physician were identified, and medicine never became fully dissociated from religion. Only in the later periods did a special group of physicians arise who were not members of priestly colleges— Maspero states that the Egyptians believed that disease and death were not natural and inevitable, but caused by some malign influence which could use any agency, natural or invisible, and very often belonging to the invisible world. Often, though, it belongs to the invisible world, and only reveals itself by the malignity of its attacks. It is a god, a spirit, the soul of a dead man that has cunningly entered a living person, or that throws itself upon him with irresistible violence. Once in possession of the body, the evil influence breaks the bones, sucks out the marrow, drinks the blood, gnaws the intestines and the heart, and devours the flesh. The invalid perishes according to the progress of this destructive work, and death speedily ensues, 
unless the evil genius can be driven out of it before it has committed irreparable damage. Whoever treats a sick person has therefore two equally important duties to perform. He must first discover the nature of the spirit in possession, and, if necessary, its name, and then attack it, drive it out, or even destroy it. He can only succeed by powerful magic, so he must be an expert in reciting incantations and skillful in making amulets. He must then use medicine, drugs, and diet to contend with the disorders which the presence of the strange being has produced in the body. In this way, it came about that diseases were believed to be due to hostile spirits, or caused by the anger of a god, so that medicines, no matter how powerful, could only be expected to assuage the pain. But magic alone, incantations, spells, and prayers, could remove the disease. Experience brought much of the wisdom we call empirical, and the records, extending for thousands of years, show that the Egyptians employed emetics, purgatives, enemata, diuretics, diaphoretics, and even bleeding. They had a rich pharmacopoeia derived from the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms. In the later periods, specialism reached a remarkable development, and Herodotus remarks that the country was full of physicians. One treats only the diseases of the eye, another those of the head, the teeth, the abdomen, or the internal organs. Our knowledge of Egyptian medicine is derived largely from the remarkable papyri dealing specially with this subject. Of these, six or seven are of the first importance. The most famous is that discovered by Ebers, dating from about 1500 BC. A superb document, one of the great treasures of the Leipzig Library, it is 20.23 meters long, and 30 centimeters high, and in a state of wonderful preservation. Others are the Cahoon, Berlin, Hearst, and British Museum papyri. All these have now been published, the last three quite recently, edited by Rosinski. I show here a reproduction from which an idea may be had of these remarkable documents. They are a motley collection, filled with incantations, charms, magical formulae, symbols, prayers, and prescriptions for all sorts of ailments. One is impressed by the richness of the pharmacopoeia and the high development which the art of pharmacy must have attained. There were gargles, salves, snuffs, inhalations, suppositories, fumigations, enemata, polytuses, and plasters. And they knew the use of opium, hemlock, the copper salts, squills, and castor oil. Surgery was not very highly developed, but the knife and actual cautery were freely used. Ophthalmic surgery was practiced by specialists, and there are many prescriptions in the papyri for ophthalmia. One department of Egyptian medicine reached a high stage of development, vis hygiene. Cleanliness of the dwellings, of the cities and the person, was regulated by law, and the priests set a splendid example in their frequent ablutions, shaving of the entire body, and the spotless cleanliness of their clothing. As Diodorus remarks, so evenly ordered was their whole manner of life that it was as if arranged by a learned physician rather than by a lawgiver. Two worldwide modes of practice found their earliest illustration in ancient Egypt. Magic, the first of these, represented the attitude of primitive man to nature, and really was his religion. He had no idea of immutable laws, but regarded the world about him as changeable and fickle like himself and to make life go as he wished, he must be able to please and propitiate or to coerce those forces outside himself. The point of interest to us is that in the pyramid texts, the oldest chapter in human thinking preserved to us, the remotest reach in the intellectual history of man which we are now able to discern, one of their sixfold contents relates to the practice of magic. A deep belief existed as to its efficacy, particularly in guiding the dead, who were said to be glorious by reason of mouths equipped with the charms, prayers, and ritual of the pyramid texts, armed with which alone could the soul escape the innumerable dangers and ordeals of the passage through another world. Man has never lost his belief in the efficacy of magic, in the widest sense of the term. Only a very few of the most intellectual nations have escaped from its shackles. Nobody else has so clearly expressed the origins and relations of magic as Pliny, in his natural history. Now, if a man consider the thing well, no marvel is it that it hath continued thus in so great request and authority, 
for it is the only science which seems to comprise in itself three possessions besides, which have the command and rule of man's mind above any other whatsoever. For to begin with all, no man doubteth but that magic took root first, and proceeded from physic, under the presence of maintaining health, curing, and preventing diseases, things plausible to the world, crept and insinuated further into the heart of man, with a deep conceit of some high and divine matter therein more than ordinary, and in comparison whereof all other physic was but basely accounted. And having thus made way and entrance, the better to fortify itself, and to give a goodly color and luster to those fair and flattering promises of things, which our nature is most given to hearken after, on goeth the habit also and cloak of religion, a point, I may tell you, that even in these days holdeth captivate the spirit of man, and draweth away with it a greater part of the world, and nothing so much. But not content with this success and good proceeding, to gather more strength and win a greater name, she intermingled with medicinable receipts and religious ceremonies the skill of astrology and arts mathematical, presuming upon this that all men by nature are very curious, and desirous to know their future fortunes, and what shall betide them hereafter, persuading themselves that all such foreknowledge dependeth upon the course and influence of the stars, which give the truest and most certain light of things to come. Being thus wholly possessed of men, and having their senses and understanding by this means fast enough bound with three sure chains, no marvel if this art grew in process of time to such a head that it was and is at this day reputed by most nations of the earth for the paragon and chief of all sciences, insomuch as the mighty kings and monarchs of the Levant are altogether ruled and governed thereby. The second worldwide practice which finds its earliest record among the Egyptians is the use of secretions and parts of the animal body as medicine. The practice was one of great antiquity with primitive man, but the papyri already mentioned contain the earliest known records. Saliva, urine, bile, feces, various parts of the body dried and powdered, worms, insects, snakes were important ingredients in the pharmacopoeia. The practice became very widespread throughout the ancient world. Its extent and importance may best be gathered from chapters 7 and 8 in the 28th book of Pliny's Natural History. Several remedies are mentioned as derived from man, others from elephant, lion, camel, crocodile, and some 79 are prepared from the hyena. The practice was widely prevalent throughout the Middle Ages and the pharmacopoeia of the 17th and even the 18th century contains many extraordinary ingredients. The royal pharmacopoeia of Moses Shiraz, the most scientific work of the day, is full of organotherapy and directions for the preparation of medicines from the most loathsome excretions. A curious thing is that with the discoveries of the mummies, a belief arose as to the great efficacy of powdered mummy in various maladies. As Sir Thomas Brown remarks in his urn burial, Mummy has become merchandise. Mitzrayim cures wounds, and Pharaoh is sold for balsams. One formula in everyday use has come to us in a curious way from the Egyptians. In the Osiris myth, the youthful Horus loses an eye in his battle with Set. This eye, the symbol of sacrifice, became, next to the sacred beetle, the most common talisman of the country and all museums are rich in models of the Horus eye in glass or stone. When alchemy, or chemistry, which had its cradle in Egypt and derived its name from Khami, an old title for this country, passed to the hands of the Greeks and later the Arabs, this sign passed with it. It was also adopted to some extent by the Gnostics of the early Christian church in Egypt. In a cursive form, it is found in medieval translations of the works of Ptolemy the Astrologer, as the sign of the planet Jupiter. As such, it was placed upon horoscopes and upon formula containing drugs made for administration to the body, so that the harmful properties of these drugs might be removed under the influence of the lucky planet. At present, in a slightly modified form, it still figures at the top of prescriptions written daily in Great Britain, Rx. For centuries, Egyptian physicians had a great reputation, and in the Odyssey, Book 4, Polydamna, the wife of Thonis, gives medicinal plants to Helen in Egypt, a country producing an infinite number of drugs, where each physician possesses knowledge above all other men. Jeremiah refers to the virgin daughter of Egypt, who should in vain use many medicines. 
Herodotus tells that Darius had at his court certain Egyptians, whom he reckoned the best skilled physicians in all the world, and he makes the interesting statement that medicine is practiced among them on a plan of separation. Each physician treats a single disorder, and no more. Thus, the country swarms with medical practitioners, some undertaking to cure diseases of the eye, others of the head, others again of the teeth, others of the intestines, and some those which are not local. A remarkable statement is made by Pliny in the discussion upon the use of radishes, which are said to cure a tizic, or ulcer of the lungs. Proof where it was found and seen in Egypt by occasion that the KK there caused dead bodies to be cut up and anatomies to be made for to search out the maladies whereof men died. The study of the anatomy of mummies has thrown a very interesting light upon the diseases of the ancient Egyptians, one of the most prevalent of which appears to have been osteoarthritis. This has been studied by Elliot Smith, Wood Jones, Ruffer, and Rietti. The majority of the lesions appear to have been the common osteoarthritis, which involved not only the men, but many of the pet animals kept in the temples. In a much higher proportion, apparently, than in modern days, the spinal column was involved. It is interesting to note that the determinative of old age in hieroglyphic writing is the picture of a man afflicted with arthritis deformans. Evidence of tuberculosis, rickets, and syphilis, according to these authors, have not been found. A study of the internal organs has been made by Ruffer, who has shown that arteriosclerosis with calcification was a common disease 8,500 years ago, and he holds that it could not have been associated with hard work or alcohol, for the ancient Egyptians did not drink spirits, and they had practically the same hours of work as modern Egyptians, with every seventh day free. End of section three. Recording by Melody Coriati. Section four of the evolution of modern medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melody Coriati. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Section 4 Chapter 1 Origin of Medicine Assyrian Medicine and Babylonian Medicine Of equally great importance in the evolution of medicine was the practically contemporary civilization in Mesopotamia. Science here reached a much higher stage than in the Valley of the Nile. An elaborate scheme of the universe was devised, a system growing out of the divine will, and a recognition for the first time of a law guiding and controlling heaven and earth alike. Here, too, we find medicine ancillary to religion. Disease was due to evil spirits or demons. These demons, invisible to the naked eye, were the precursors of the modern germs and microbes, while the incantations recited by the priests are the early equivalents of the physician's prescriptions. There were different incantations for different diseases, and they were as mysterious to the masses as are the mystic formulas of the modern physician to the bewildered, yet trusting, patient. Indeed, their mysterious character added to the power supposed to reside in the incantations for driving the demons away. Medicinal remedies accompanied the recital of the incantations, but despite the considerable progress made by such nations of hoary antiquity as the Egyptians and Babylonians in the diagnosis and treatment of common diseases— leading in time to the development of an extensive pharmacology. So long as the cure of disease rested with the priests, the recital of sacred formulas, together with rites that may be conveniently grouped under the head of sympathetic magic, was regarded as equally essential with the taking of the prescribed remedies. Three points of interest may be referred to in connection with Babylonian medicine. Our first recorded observations on anatomy are in connection with the art of divination, the study of the future by the interpretation of certain signs. The student recognized two divisions of divination, the involuntary, dealing with the interpretation of signs forced upon our attention, such as the phenomena of the heavens, dreams, etc., and voluntary divination, the seeking of signs, more particularly through the inspection of sacrificial animals. This method reached an extraordinary development among the Babylonians, and the cult spread to the Etruscans, Hebrews, and later to the Greeks and Romans. Of all the organs inspected in a sacrificial animal, 
The liver, from its size, position, and richness in blood, impressed the early observers as the most important of the body. Probably on account of the richness in blood, it came to be regarded as the seat of life, indeed, the seat of the soul. From this important position, the liver was not dislodged for many centuries, and in the Galenic physiology, it shared with the heart and the brain in the triple control of the natural, animal, and vital spirits. Many expressions in literature indicate how persistent was this belief. Among the Babylonians, the word liver was used in hymns and other compositions precisely as we use the word heart, and Yastrov gives a number of illustrations from Hebrew, Greek, and Latin sources illustrating this usage. The belief arose that through the inspection of this important organ in the sacrificial animal, the course of future events could be predicted. The life, or soul, as the seed of life, in the sacrificial animal is, therefore, the divine element in the animal, and the god in accepting the animal, which is involved in the act of bringing it as an offering to a god, identifies himself with the animal, becomes, as it were, one with it. The life in the animal is a reflection of his own life, and since the fate of men rests with the gods, if one can succeed in entering into the mind of a god and thus ascertain what he purposes to do, the key for the solution of the problem as to what the future has in store will have been found. The liver being the center of vitality, the seat of the mind, therefore, as well as the emotions, it becomes the case of the sacrificial animal, either directly identical with the mind of the god who accepts the animal, or, at all events, a mirror in which the god's mind is reflected. Or, to use another figure, a watch regulated to be in sympathetic and perfect accord with a second watch. If, therefore, one can read the liver of the sacrificial animal, one enters, as it were, into the workshop of the divine will. Hepatoscopy thus became, among the Babylonians, of extraordinary complexity, and the organ of the sheep was studied and figured as early as 3000 B.C., in the divination rites, the lobes, the gallbladder, the appendages of the upper lobe, and the markings were all inspected with unusual care. The earliest known anatomical model, which is here shown, is the clay model of a sheep's liver with a divination text dating from about 2000 BC, from which Yastrov has worked out the modern anatomical equivalents of the Babylonian terms. To reach a decision on any point, the phenomena of the inspection of the liver were carefully recorded, and the interpretations rested on a more or less natural and original association of ideas. Thus, if the gallbladder were swollen on the right side, it pointed to an increase in the strength of the king's army, and was favorable. If on the left side, it indicated rather success of the enemy, and was unfavorable. If the bile duct was long, it pointed to a long life. Gallstones are not infrequently mentioned in the divination texts, and might be favorable or unfavorable. Various interpretations were gathered by the scribes in the reference notebooks, which serve as guides for the interpretation of the omens and for textbooks of instructions in the temple schools. The art of divination spread widely among the neighboring nations. There are many references in the Bible to the practice. The elders of Moab and Midian came to Balaam with the rewards of divination in their hand. Joseph's cup of divination was found in Benjamin's sack, and in Ezekiel, the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way and looked in the liver. Hepatoscopy was also practiced by the Etruscans, and from them it passed to the Greeks and the Romans, among whom it degenerated into a more or less meaningless form. But Yastrov states that in Babylonia and Assyria, where for several thousand years the liver was consistently employed as the sole organ of divination, there are no traces of the rite having fallen into decay or having been abused by the priests. In Roman times, Philostratus gives an account of the trial of Apollonius of Tiana, accused of human hepatoscopy by sacrificing a boy in the practice of magical arts against the emperor. The liver, which the experts say is the very tripod of their art, does not consist of pure blood, for the heart retains all the uncontaminated blood and irrigates the whole body with it by the conduits of the arteries, whereas the gall, which is situated next to the liver, is stimulated by anger and depressed by fear into the hollows of the liver. We have seen how early and how widespread was the belief in amulets and charms against the occult powers of darkness. One that has persisted with extraordinary tenacity is the belief in the evil eye, the power of certain individuals to injure with a look. Of general belief in the older civilizations, 
and referred to in several places in the Bible. It passed to Greece and Rome, and today is still held fervently in many parts of Europe. The sign of Lacorna, the first and fourth fingers extended, the others turned down and the thumb closed over them, still used against the evil eye in Italy, was a mystic sign used by the Romans in the festival of Lemuralia, and we meet with the belief also in this country. A child with hemiplegia at the Infirmary for Diseases of the Nervous System, Philadelphia, from the central part of Pennsylvania, was believed by its parents to have had the evil eye cast upon it. The second contribution of Babylonia and Assyria to medicine, one that affected mankind profoundly, relates to the supposed influence of the heavenly bodies upon man's welfare. A belief that the stars in their courses fought for or against him arose early in their civilizations, and directly out of their studies on astrology and mathematics. The macrocosm, the heavens that declare the glory of God, reflect, as in a mirror, the microcosm, the daily life of man on earth. The first step was the identification of the sun, moon, and stars with the gods of the pantheon. Assyrian astronomical observations show an extraordinary development of practical knowledge. The movements of the sun and moon and the planets were studied. The Assyrians knew the precision of the equinoxes and many of the fundamental laws of astronomy, and the modern nomenclature dates from their findings. In their days, the signs of the zodiac corresponded practically with the twelve constellations whose names they still bear, each division being represented by the symbol of some god, as the scorpion, the ram, the twins, etc. Changes in the heavens portend changes on earth. The biblical expression hosts of heaven for the starry universe admirably reflects the conception held by the Babylonian astrologers. Moon, planets, and stars constituted an army in constant activity, executing military maneuvers which were the result of deliberation and which had in view a fixed purpose. It was the function of the priest, the barku or inspector as the astrologer as well as the inspector of the liver was called, to discover this purpose. In order to do so, a system of interpretation was evolved, less logical and less elaborate than the system of heptoscopy, which was analyzed in the preceding chapter, but nevertheless meriting attention both as an example of the pathetic yearning of man to peer into the minds of the gods, and of the influence that Babylonian Assyrian astrology exerted throughout the ancient world. With the rationalizing influence of the Persians, the hold of astrology weakened, and according to Yastrov, it was this, in combination with Hebrew and Greek modes of thought, that led the priests in the three centuries following Persian occupation to exchange their profession of diviners for that of astronomers. And this, he says, marks the beginning of the conflict between religion and science. At first an expression of primitive science, astrology became a superstition from which the human mind has not yet escaped. In contrast to divination, astrology does not seem to have made much impression on the Hebrews, and definite references in the Bible are scanty. From Babylonia, it passed to Greece, without, however, exerting any particular influence upon Greek medicine. Our own language is rich in words of astral significance derived from the Greek, e.g. disaster. The introduction of astrology into Europe has a passing interest. Apparently, the Greeks had made important advances in astronomy before coming in contact with the Babylonians, who, in all probability, received from the former a scientific conception of the universe. In Babylonia and Assyria, we have astrology first and astronomy afterwards. In Greece, we have the sequence reversed, astronomy first and astrology afterwards. It is surprising to learn that, previous to their contact with the Greeks, astrology as relating to the individual, that is to say, the reading of the stars to determine the conditions under which the individual was born, had no place in the cult of the Babylonians and Assyrians. The individualistic spirit led the Greek to make his gods take note of every action in his life, and his preordained fate might be read in the stars. A connecting link between the individuals and the movements in the heavens was found in an element which they shared in common. Both man and stars moved in obedience to forces from which there was no escape. An inexorable law controlling the planets corresponded to an equally inexorable fate ordained for every individual from his birth. Man was a part of nature and subject to its laws. The thought could therefore arise that, 
if the conditions in the heavens were studied under which a man was born, that man's future could be determined in accord with the beliefs associated with the position of the planets rising or visible at the time of birth, or, according to other views, at the time of conception. These views take us back directly to the system of astrology developed by Babylonian Baru priests. The basis on which the modified Greek system rests is likewise the same that we have observed in Babylonia, a correspondence between heaven and earth, but with this important difference, that instead of the caprice of the gods, we have the unalterable fate controlling the entire universe, the movements of the heaven and the life of the individual alike. From this time on until the Renaissance, like a shadow, astrology follows astronomy, regarded as two aspects of the same subject, the one, natural astrology, the equivalent of astronomy, was concerned with the study of the heavens. The other, judicial astrology, was concerned with the casting of horoscopes and reading in the stars the fate of the individual. As I mentioned, Greek science in its palmy days seems to have been very free from the bad features of astrology. Gilbert Murray remarks that astrology fell upon the Hellenistic mind as a new disease falls upon some remote island people. But in the Greek conquest of the Roman mind, astrology took a prominent role. It came to Rome as part of the great Hellenizing movement, and the strength of its growth may be gauged from the edicts issued against astrologers as early as the middle of the 2nd century BC. In his introduction to his recent edition of Book Two of the Astronomicon of Manilis, Garrod traces the growth of the cult, which under the empire had an extraordinary vogue. Though these heavenly signs be far removed from us, Yet does he, the god, so make their influence felt, that they give to nations their life and their fate, and to each man his own character. Oracles were sought on all occasions, from the planting of a tree to the mating of a horse, and the doctrine of the stars influenced deeply all phases of popular thought and religion. The professional astrologers, as Pliny says, were Chaldeans, Egyptians, and Greeks. The Etruscans, too, the professional diviners of Rome, cultivated the science. Many of these Isiasi conjectores and astrology de circo were worthless charlatans, but on the whole, the science seems to have attracted the attention of thoughtful men of the period. Garrod quotes the following remarkable passage from Tacitus. My judgment wavers, he says. I dare not say whether it will be fate and necessity immutable which governs the changing course of human affairs or just chance. Among the wisest of the ancients, as well as among their apes, you will find a conflict of opinion. Many hold fixedly the idea that our beginning and our end, that man himself, is nothing to the gods at all. The wicked are in prosperity and the good meet tribulation. Others believe that fate and the facts of this world work together. But this connection they trace not to planetary influences, but to a concatenation of natural causes. We choose our life that is free, but the choice once made, what awaits us is fixed and ordered. Good and evil are different from the vulgar opinion of them. Often, those who seem to battle with adversity are to be accounted blessed, but the many, even in their prosperity, are miserable. It needs only to bear misfortune bravely, while the fool perishes in his wealth. Outside these rival schools stands the man in the street— no one will take from him his conviction that at our birth are fixed for us the things that shall be. If some things fall out differently from what was foretold, that is due to the deceit of men that speak what they know not, calling into contempt a science to which past and present alike bear a glorious testimony. Cato waged war on the Greek physicians, and forbade his Wilicus all resort to Herispicem augurim hariolum caldeum, but in vain. So widespread became the belief that the great philosopher Panaceus, who died about 111 BC, and two of his friends alone among the Stoics, rejected the claim of astrology as a science. So closely related was the subject of mathematics that it, too, fell into disfavor, and in the Theodosian Code sentence of death was passed upon mathematicians. Long into the Middle Ages, the same unholy alliance with astrology and divination caused mathematics to be regarded with suspicion and even Abelard calls it a nefarious study. The third important feature in Babylonian medicine is the evidence afforded by the famous Hammurabi Code, circa 2000 BC, a body of laws, civil and religious, 
many of which relate to the medical profession. This extraordinary document is a black diorite block eight feet high, once containing 21 columns on the obverse, 16 and 28 columns on the reverse, with 2,540 lines of writing, of which now 1,114 remain, and surmounted by the figure of the king receiving the law from the sun god. Copies of this were set up in Babylon, that anyone oppressed or injured who had a tale of woe to tell might come and stand before his image, that of a king of righteousness, and there read the priceless orders of the king, and from the written monument solve his problem. From the enactments of the code, we gather that the medical profession must have been in a highly organized state, for not only was practice regulated in detail, but a scale of fees was laid down and penalties exacted for malpraxis. Operations were performed, and the veterinary art was recognized. An interesting feature, from which it is lucky that we have in these days escaped, is the application of the lex talionis, an eye for an eye, bone for a bone, and tooth for a tooth, which is a striking feature of the code. Some of the laws may be quoted. Paragraph 215. If a doctor has treated a gentleman for a severe wound with a bronze lances, and has cured the man, or has opened an abscess of the eye for a gentleman with the bronze lances, and has cured the eye of the gentleman, he shall take ten shekels of silver. 218. If the doctor has treated a gentleman for a severe wound with a lances of bronze, and has caused the gentleman to die, or has opened an abscess of the eye for a gentleman, and has caused the loss of the gentleman's eye, one shall cut off his hands. 219. If a doctor has treated the severe wound of a slave or a poor man with a bronze lances, and has caused his death, he shall render slave for slave. 220. If he has opened his abscess with a bronze lances and has made him lose his eye, he shall pay money half his price. 221. If a doctor has cured the shattered limb of a gentleman, or has cured the diseased bowel, the patient shall give five shekels of silver to the doctor. 224. If a cow doctor or a sheep doctor has treated a cow or a sheep for a severe wound and cured it, the owner of the cow or sheep shall give one-sixth of a shekel of silver to the doctor as his fee. End of section four. Recording by Melody Coriati. Section five of the evolution of modern medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 5. Hebrew Medicine. The medicine of the Old Testament betrays both Egyptian and Babylonian influences. The social hygiene is a reflex of regulations, the origin of which may be traced in the pyramid texts and in the papyri. The regulations in the Pentateuch codes revert in part to primitive times, in part represent advanced views of hygiene. There are doubts if the Pentateuch code really goes back to the days of Moses, but certainly someone learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians drew it up. As Neuberger briefly summarizes, the commands concern prophylaxis and suppression of epidemics, suppression of venereal disease and prostitution, care of the skin, baths, food, housing, and clothing, regulation of labor, sexual life, discipline of the people, etc., Many of these commands, such as Sabbath rest, circumcision, laws concerning food, interdiction of blood and pork, measures concerning menstruating and lying in women, and those suffering from gonorrhea, isolation of lepers, and hygiene of the camp, are, in view of the conditions of the climate, surprisingly rational. Divination, not very widely practiced, was borrowed, no doubt, from Babylonia. Joseph's cup was used for the purpose, and in numbers the elders of Balak went to Balaam with the rewards of divination in their hands. The belief in enchantments and witchcraft was universal, and the strong enactments against witches in the Old Testament made a belief in them almost imperative 
until more rational beliefs came into vogue in the 18th and 19th centuries. Whatever view we may take of it, the medicine of the New Testament is full of interest. Divination is only referred to once in the Acts 16.16, 16, where a damsel is said to be possessed of a spirit of divination, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. There is only one mention of astrology, Acts 7.43. There are no witches, neither are there charms or incantations. The diseases mentioned are numerous, demoniac possession, convulsions, paralysis, skin diseases as leprosy, dropsy, hemorrhages, fever, fluxes, blindness, and deafness. And the cure is simple, usually a fiat of the Lord, rarely with a prayer or with the use of means such as spittle. They are all miraculous, and the same power was granted to the apostles, power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And more than this, not only the blind received their sight, the lame walked, the lepers were cleansed, the deaf heard, and even the dead were raised up. No question of the mandate. He who went about doing good was a physician of the body as well as of the soul, and could the rich promises of the gospel have been fulfilled, there would have been no need of a new dispensation of science. It may be because the children of this world have never been able to accept its hard sayings, the insistence upon poverty, upon humility, upon peace that Christianity has lost touch, no less with the practice than with the principles of its founder. Yet all through the centuries, the Church has never wholly abandoned the claim to apostolic healing, nor is there any reason why she should. To the miraculous there should be no time limit. Only conditions have changed, and nowadays to have a mountain-moving faith is not easy. Still, the possession is cherished, and it adds enormously to the spice and variety of life to know that men of great intelligence, for example, my good friend Dr. James J. Walsh of New York, believe in the miracles of lords. Only a few weeks ago the Bishop of London followed with great success, it is said, the practice of St. James. It does not really concern us much, as Oriental views of disease and its cure have had very little influence on the evolution of scientific medicine, except an illustration of the persistence of an attitude towards disease always widely prevalent, and indeed increasing. Nor can we say that the medicine of our great colleague, St. Luke, the beloved physician, whose praise is in the Gospels, differs so fundamentally from that of the other writings of the New Testament that we can claim for it a scientific quality. The stories of the miracles have technical terms and are in a language adorned by medical phraseology. But the mental attitude towards disease is certainly not that of a follower of Hippocrates, nor even of a scientifically trained contemporary of Dioscorides. End of Section 5 Section 6 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avayi in December 2019 The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Section 6 Chapter 1 Origin of Medicine Chinese and Japanese medicine. Chinese medicine illustrates the condition at which a highly intellectual people may arrive, among whom thought and speculation were restricted by religious prohibitions. Perhaps the chief interest in its study lies in the fact that we may see today the persistence of views about disease similar to those which prevailed in ancient Egypt and Babylonia. The Chinese believe in a universal animism, all parts being animated by gods and spectres, and devils swarm everywhere in numerous incalculable. The universe was spontaneously created by the operation of its Tao, composed of two souls, the Yang and the Yin. The Yang represents light, warmth, production and life, as also the celestial sphere from which all those blessings emanate. 
the yin is darkness cold death and the earth which unless animated by the yang or heaven is dark cold dead the yang and the yin are divided into an infinite number of spirits respectively good and bad called shen and kuei every man and every living being contains a shen and a kuei infused at birth and departing at death to return to the yang and the yin thus man with his dualistic soul is a microcosmos born from the macrocosmos spontaneously every object is animated as well as the universe of which it is a part in the animistic religion of china the wu represented a group of persons of both sexes who wielded with respect to the world of spirits capacities and powers not possessed by the rest of men many practitioners of wu were physicians who in addition to charms and enchantments used death-banishing medicinal herbs of great antiquity wuism has changed in some ways its outward aspect but has not altered its fundamental characters the wu as exercising physicians and practitioners of the medical art may be traced in classical literature to the time of confucius in addition to charms and spells there were certain famous poems which were repeated one of which by han yu of the tang epoch had an extraordinary vogue the Chod says that the ling or magical power of this poem must have been enormous seeing that its author was a powerful mandarin and also one of the loftiest intellects china has produced this poetic febrifuge is translated in full by the Chod, and the demon of fever potent chiefly in the autumn is admonished to be gone to the clear and limpid waters of the deep river in the high medical college at court in the tang dynasty there were four classes of masters attached to its two high medical chiefs masters of medicine of acupuncture of manipulation and two masters for frustration by means of spells soothsaying and exorcism may be traced far back to the fifth and sixth centuries b c in times of epidemic the specialists of wuism who act as seers soothsayers and exorcists engage in processions stripped to the waist dancing in a frantic delirious state covering themselves with blood by means of prick bowls or with needles thrust through their tongues or sitting or stretching themselves on nail points or rows of sword edges in this way they frighten the spectres of disease they are nearly all young and are spoken of as divining youths and they use an exercising magic based on the principle that legions of spectres prone to evil live in the machine of the world the chinese believe that it is the tao or order of the universe which affords immunity from evil and according to whether or no the birth occurred in a beneficent year dominated by four double cyclical characters the horoscope is heavy or light those with light horoscopes are specially prone to incurable complaints but much harm can be averted if such an individual be surrounded with exercising objects if he be given proper amulets to wear and proper medicines to swallow and by selecting for him auspicious days and hours two or three special points may be referred to the doctrine of the pulse reached such extraordinary development that the whole practice of the art centered round its different characters there were scores of varieties which in complication and detail put to confusion the complicated system of some of the old greco-roman writers the basic idea seems to have been that each part and organ had its own proper pulse and just as in a stringed instrument each chord has its own tone so in the human body if the pulses were in harmony it meant health if there was discord it meant disease these chinese views reached europe in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries and there is a very elaborate description of them in floyer's well-known book 
and the idea of harmony in the pulse is met with into the eighteenth century organotherapy was as extensively practiced in china as in egypt parts of organs various secretions and excretions are very commonly used one useful method of practice reached a remarkable development viz the art of acupuncture the thrusting of fine needles more or less deeply into the affected part there are some 388 spots on the body in which acupuncture could be performed and so well had long experience taught them as to the points of danger that the course of the arteries may be traced by the tracts that are avoided the chinese practiced inoculation for smallpox as early as the eleventh century even the briefest sketch of the condition of chinese medicine leaves the impression of the appalling stagnation and sterility that may afflict the really intelligent people for thousands of years it is doubtful if they are today in a very much more advanced condition than were the egyptians at the time when the abers papyrus was written from one point of view it is an interesting experiment as illustrating the state in which a people may remain who have no knowledge of anatomy physiology or pathology early japanese medicine has not much to distinguish it from the chinese at first purely theurgic the practice was later characterized by acupuncture and a refined study of the pulse it has an extensive literature largely based upon the chinese and extending as far back as the beginning of the christian era european medicine was introduced by the portuguese and the dutch whose factory or company physicians were not without influence upon practice an extraordinary stimulus was given to the belief in european medicine by a dissection made by mayeno in 1771 demonstrating the position of the organs as shown in the european anatomical tables and proving the chinese figures to be incorrect the next day a translation into japanese of the anatomical work of calmus was begun and from its appearance in seventeen seventy three may be dated the commencement of reforms in medicine in seventeen ninety three the work of the Kotter on internal medicine was translated and it is interesting to know that before the so-called opening of japan many european works on medicine had been published in eighteen fifty seven a dutch medical school was started in yedo since the political upheaval in eighteen sixty eight japan has made rapid progress in scientific medicine and its institutions and teachers are now among the best known in the world End of section six. Section 7 of the Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matea Bracic. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Chapter 2. Greek Medicine. O Grae Gentis Decus, let us sing with Lucretius one of the great interpreters of Greek thought. How grand and how true is his pian! Out of the night, out of the blinding night, thy beacon flashes. Hail, beloved light of Greece and Grecian! Hail, for in the murk thou cost reveal each valley and each height. Thou art my leader, and the footprints shine, wherein I plant my own. The world will shine to read, and having read, before thy children's eyes thou didst outspread the fruitful page of knowledge, all the wealth of wisdom, all her plenty for their bread. Let us come out of the murky night of the east, heavy with phantoms, into this bright daylight of the west, into the company of men whose thoughts made our thoughts, and whose ways made our ways, the men who first dared to look on nature with the clear eyes of the mind. Browning's famous poem, Child Rolling to the Dark Tower Came, is an allegory of the pilgrimage of man through the dark places of the earth, on a dismal path beset with demons and strewn with the wreckage of generations of failures. 
In his ears told the knell of all the lost adventures, his peers all lost, lost within sight of the dark tower itself. The round squat turret, blind as the fool's heart, built of brown stone, without a counterpart in the whole world. Lost in despair at an all-encircling mystery. Not so the Greek child Roland, who set the slughorn to his lips and blew a challenge. Neither Shakespeare nor Browning tells us what happened, and the old legend, Child Roland, is the incarnation of the Greek spirit, the young, light-hearted master of the modern world, at whose trumpet blast the dark towers of ignorance, superstition and deceit have vanished into thin air, as the baseless fabric of a dream. Not that the jeering phantoms have flown. They still beset, in varied form, the path of each generation. But the Achaean child Roland gave to man self-confidence, and taught him the lesson that nature's mysteries, to be solved, must be challenged. On a portal of one of the temples of Isis in Egypt was carved, I am whatever hath been, is, or ever will be, and my veil no man has yet lifted. The veil of nature the Greek lifted, and herein lies his value to us. What of this genius? How did it arise among the peoples of the Aegean Sea? Those who wish to know the rock when science was hewn may read the story told in vivid language by Professor Gompertz in his Greek Thinkers, the fourth volume of which has recently been published. In 1912, there was published a book by one of the younger Oxford teachers, The Greek Genius and Its Meaning to Us, from which those who shrink from the serious study of Gompertz's four volumes may learn something of the spirit of Greece. Let me quote a few lines from his introduction. Europe has nearly four million square miles. Lancashire has 1,700. Attica has 700. Yet this tiny country has given us an art which we, with it and all that the world has done since it for our models, have equaled perhaps, but not surpassed. It has given us the staple of our vocabulary in every domain of thought and knowledge. Politics, tyranny, democracy, anarchism, philosophy, physiology, geology, history. These are all Greek words. It has seized and up to the present day kept hold of our higher education. It has exercised an unfailing fascination, even on minds alien or hostile. Rome took her culture thence. Young Romans completed their education in the Greek schools. And so it was with natures less akin to Greece than the Roman. St. Paul, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, who called the wisdom of the Greeks foolishness, was drawn to their Oropagus, and found himself accommodating his gospel to the style, and quoting verses from the poets of this alien race. After him, the Church, which was born to protest against Hellenism, translated its dogmas into the language of Greek thought and finally crystallized them in the philosophy of Aristotle. Whether a plaything of the gods or a cog in the wheels of the universe, this was the problem which life offered to the thinking Greek. And in undertaking its solution, he set in motion the forces that had made our modern civilization. That the problem remains unsolved is nothing in comparison with the supreme fact that in wrestling with it, and in studying the laws of the machine, man is learning to control the small section of it with which he is specially concerned. The veil of thaumaturgy which shrouded the Orient, while not removed, was rent in twain, and for the first time in history man had a clear vision of the world about him, had gazed on nature's naked loveliness, unabashed, and unaffrighted by the supernatural powers about him. Not that the Greek got rid of his gods, far from it, but he made them so like himself, and lived on terms of such familiarity with them, that they inspired no terror. Livingstone discusses the Greek genius as displayed to us in certain notes. The note of beauty, the desire for freedom, the note of directness, the note of humanism, the note of sanity, and of many-sidedness. 
upon some of these characteristics we shall have occasion to dwell in the brief sketch of the rise of scientific medicine among this wonderful people we have seen that the primitive man and in the great civilizations of egypt and babylonia the physician evolved from the priest in greece he had a dual origin philosophy and religion let us first trace the origins in the philosophers particularly in the group known as the ionian physiologists whether at home or as colonists in the south of Italy, in whose work the beginnings of scientific medicine may be found. Let me quote a statement from Gompatz. We can trace the springs of Greek success achieved and maintained by the great men of Hellas on the field of scientific inquiry to a remarkable conjunction of natural gifts and conditions. There was the teeming wealth of constructive imagination united with the sleepless critical spirit which shrank from no test of audacity. There was the most powerful impulse to generalization coupled with the sharpest faculty for decrying and distinguishing the finest shades of phenomenal peculiarity. There was the religion of Hellas, which afforded complete satisfaction to the requirements of sentiment and yet left the intelligence free to perform its destructive work. There were the political conditions of a number of rival centres of intellect, of a friction of forces, including the possibility of stagnation, and, finally, of an order of state and society strict enough to curb the excesses of children crying for the moon, and elastic enough not to hamper the soaring flight of superior minds. We have already made acquaintance with two of the sources from which the spirit of criticism derived its nourishment, the metaphysical and dialectical discussions practised by the Eleatic philosophers and the semi-historical method which was applied to the myths by Hecatus and Herodotus. A third source is to be traced to the schools of the physicians. These aimed at eliminating the arbitrary element from the view and knowledge of nature, the beginnings of which were bound up with it in a greater or less degree, though practically without exception and by the force of an inner necessity. A knowledge of medicine was destined to correct that defect, and we shall mark the growth of its most precious fruits in the increased power of observation and the counterpoise it offered to hasty generalizations, as well as in the confidence which learned to reject untenable fictions whether produced by luxuriant imagination or by a priori speculations, on the similar ground of self-reliant sense perception. The nature philosophers of the Ionian days did not contribute much to medicine proper, but their spirit and their outlook upon nature influenced its students profoundly. Their bold generalizations on the nature of matter and of the elements are still the wonder of chemists. We may trace to one of them Anaximenes, who regarded air as the primary principle, the doctrine of the pneuma, or the breath of life, the psychic force which animates the body and leaves it at death. Our soul, being air, holds us together. Of another, the famous Heraclitus, possibly a physician, the existing fragments do not relate specially to medicine but to the philosopher of fire may be traced the doctrine of heat and moisture and their antithesis, which influenced practice for many centuries. There is evidence in the Hippocratic treatise Peri Sarkin of an attempt to apply this doctrine to the human body. The famous expression, Panta Rei, all things are flowing, expresses the incessant flux in which he believed and in which we know all matter exists. No one has said a ruder thing of the profession, for an extant fragment reads, Physicians who cut, burn, stab, and rack the sick, then complain that they do not get any adequate recompense for it. The South Italian nature philosophers contributed much more to the science of medicine, and in certain of the colonial towns there were medical schools as early as the 5th century B.C., the most famous of these physician philosophers was Pythagoras, whose life and work had an extraordinary influence upon medicine, particularly in connection with his theory of numbers and the importance of critical days. 
his discovery of the dependence of the pitch of sound on the length of the vibrating cord is one of the most fundamental in acoustics among the members of the school which he founded at crotona were many physicians who carried his views far and wide throughout magna graecia nothing in his teaching dominated medicine so much as the doctrine of numbers the sacredness of which seems to have had an enduring fascination for the medical mind many of the common diseases such as malaria or typhus terminating abruptly on special days favoured this belief how dominant it became and how persistent you may judge from the literature upon critical days which is rich to the middle of the eighteenth century one member of the crotonian school alcmion achieved great distinction in both anatomy and physiology he first recognized the brain as the organ of the mind and made careful dissection of the nerves which he traced to the brain he described the optic nerves and the eustachian tubes made correct observations upon vision and refuted the common view that the sperma came from the spinal cord he suggested the definition of health as the maintenance of equilibrium or an isonomy in the material qualities of the body of all the south italian physicians of this period the personality of none stands out in stronger outlines than that of empedocles of agrigentum physician physiologist religious teacher politician and poet a wonder worker also and magician he was acclaimed in the cities as an immortal god by countless thousands desiring oracles or begging the word of healing that he was a keen student of nature is witnessed by many recorded observations in anatomy and physiology he reasoned that sensations travel by definite paths to the brain but our attention must be confined to his introduction of the theory of the four elements fire air earth and water of which in varying quantities all bodies were made up health depended upon the due equilibrium of these primitive substances disease was their disturbance corresponding to those were the four essential qualities of heat and cold moisture and dryness and upon this fourfold division was engrafted by the later physicians the doctrine of the humours which from the days of hippocrates almost to our own dominated medicine all sorts of magical powers were attributed to empedocles the story of panthea whom he called back to life after a thirty days trance has long clung in the imagination you remember how matthew arnold describes him in the well-known poem empedocles on etna but his power swells with the swelling evil of this time and holds men mute to see where it will rise he could stay swift diseases in old days chain madmen by the music of his lyre cleanse to sweet airs the breath of poisonous streams and in the mountain chinks inter the winds this he could do of old a quotation which will give you an idea of some of the powers attributed to this wonder-working physician but of no one of the men of this remarkable circle have we such definitive information as of the crotonian physician democedes whose story is given at length by herodotus and his story has also the great importance of showing that even at this early period a well-devised scheme of public medical service existed in the greek cities it dates from the second half of the sixth century b c fully two generations before hippocrates a crotonian democedes by name was found among the slaves of Orotes. of his fame as a physician some one had heard and he was called in to treat the dislocated ankle of king darius the wily greek longing for his home feared that if he confessed to a knowledge of medicine there would be no chance of escape but under threat of torture he undertook a treatment which proved successful then herodotus tells his story how ill-treated at home in crotona democedes went to aegina where he set up as a physician and in the second year the state of aegina hired his services at the price of a talent in the third year the athenians engaged him at one hundred nini and in the fourth polycrates of samos at two talents democedes shared the misfortunes of polycrates and was taken prisoner by Orotes. then herodotus tells how he cured a tossa the daughter of cyrus 
and wife of Darius, of a severe abscess of the breast, but on condition that he help him to escape, and she induced her husband to send an expedition of exploration to Greece under the guidance of Demosthenes, but with the instructions at all costs to bring back the much-prized physician. From Tarentum, Demosthenes escaped to his native city, but the Persians followed him, and it was with the greatest difficulty that he escaped from their hands. Deprived of their guide, the Persians gave up the expedition and sailed for Asia. In palliation of his flight, Demosthenes sent a message to Darius that he was engaged to the daughter of Milo, the wrestler, who was in high repute with the king. Plato has several references to these state physicians, who were evidently elected by a public assembly. When the assembly meets to elect a physician, and the office was yearly, for in the statesman we find the following. When the year of office has expired, the pilot or physician has to come before a court of review to answer any charges. The physician must have been in practice for some time and attained eminence before he was deemed worthy of the post of state physician. If you and I were physicians and were advising one another that we were competent to practice as state physicians, should I not ask about you? And would you not ask about me? Well, but how about Socrates himself? Has he good health? And was any one else ever known to be cured by him, whether slave or freeman? All that is known of these state physicians has been collected by Paul, who has traced their evolution into Roman times, that they were secular, independent of the Esculapian temples, that they were well paid, that there was keen competition to get the most distinguished men, that they were paid by a special tax, and that they were much esteemed are facts to be gleaned from Herodotus and from the inscriptions. The lapidary records, extending over 1,000 years, collected by Professor Euler of Rhina, throw an important light on the state of medicine in Greece and Rome. Greek vases give representations of these state doctors at work. Dr. E. Potier has published one showing the treatment of a patient in the clinic. That dissections were practiced by this group of nature philosophers is shown not only by the studies of Alcmeon, but we have evidence that one of the latest of them, Diogenes of Apollonia, must have made elaborate dissections. In the Historia Animalium of Aristotle occurs his account of the blood vessels, which is by far the most elaborate met with in the literature until the writings of Galen. It has, too, the great merit of accuracy. If we bear in mind the fact that it was not until after Aristotle that arteries and veins were differentiated, and indications are given as to the vessels from which blood may be drawn. End of section 7。section 8 of the evolution of modern medicine。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matea Bracic. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Chapter 2. Greek Medicine. Asclepios. No god made with hands, to use the scriptural phrase, had a more successful run than Asclepios. For more than a thousand years the consoler and healer of the sons of men, Shorn of his divine attributes, he remains our patron saint, our emblematic god of healing, whose figure with the serpents appears in our seals and charters. He was originally a Thessalian chieftain, whose sons, Machaon and Pedalirius, became famous physicians and fought in the Trojan War. Nestor, you may remember, carried off the former, declaring, in the oft-quoted phrase, that a doctor was better worth saving than many warriors unskilled in the treatment of wounds. Later genealogies trace his origin to Apollo, as whose son he is usually regarded. In the wake of northern tribes, this god Asclepius, a more majestic figure than the blameless leech of Homer's song, came by land to Epidaurus and was carried by sea to the eastward island of Kos. Asclepius grew in importance with the growth of Greece, but may not have attained his greatest power until Greece and Rome were one. 
a word on the idea of the serpent as an emblem of the healing art which goes far back into antiquity. The mystical character of the snake, and the natural dread and awe inspired by it, early made it a symbol of supernatural power. There is a libation vase of Gudea, circa 2350 BC, found at Tello, now in the Louvre, probably the earliest representation of the symbol, with two serpents entwined round a staff. From the earliest times, the snake has been associated with mystic and magic power, and even today, among native races, it plays a part in the initiation of medicine men. In Greece, the serpent became a symbol of Apollo, and prophetic serpents were kept and fed at his shrine, as well as at that of his son, Asclepios. There was an idea, too, that snakes had a knowledge of herbs, which is referred to in the famous poem of Nicander and Theriaca. You may remember that when Alexander, the famous quack and oracle monger, depicted by Lucian, started out for revenue, the first thing he did was to provide himself with two of the large, harmless yellow snakes of Asia Minor. The exact date of the introduction of the cult into Greece is not known, but its great centres were at Epidaurus, Kos, Pergamos and Tricca. It throve with wonderful rapidity. Asclepios became one of the most popular of the gods. By the time of Alexander, it is estimated that there were between three and four hundred temples dedicated to him. His worship was introduced into Rome at the time of the Great Plague at the beginning of the 3rd century BC, as told by Livy in Book 11, and the temple on the island of Tiber became a famous resort. If you can transfer in imagination the hot springs of Virginia to the neighbourhood of Washington, and put there a group of buildings such as are represented in these outlines of cadence, add a sumptuous theatre with seating capacity for 20,000, a stadium 600 feet long with a seating capacity of 12,000, and all possible accessories of art and science, you will have an idea of what the temple at Epidaurus, a few miles from Athens, was. The cult flourished mostly in places which, through climatic or hygienic advantages, were natural health resorts. Those favoured spots on hill or mountain, in the shelter of forests, by rivers or springs of pure flowing water, were conducive to health. The vivifying air, the well-cultivated gardens surrounding the shrine, the magnificent view, all tended to cheer the heart with new hope of cure. Many of these temples owe their fame to mineral or merely hot springs, to the homely altars erected originally by sacred fountains in the neighbourhood of health-giving mineral springs, were later added magnificent temples, pleasure grounds for festivals, gymnasia in which bodily ailments were treated by physical exercises, baths and inunctions, also, as is proved by excavations, living rooms for the patients. Access to the shrine was forbidden to the unclean and the impure, Pregnant women and the mortally afflicted were kept away. No dead body could find a resting place within the holy precincts, the shelter and the cure of the sick being undertaken by the keepers of inns and boarding houses in the neighbourhood. The suppliants for aid had to submit to careful purification, to bathe in sea, river or spring, to fast for a prescribed time, to abjure wine and certain articles of diet, and they were only permitted to enter the temple when they were adequately prepared by cleansing, inunction, and fumigation. This lengthy and exhausting preparation, partly dietetic, partly suggestive, was accompanied by a solemn service of prayer and sacrifice, whose symbolism tended highly to excite the imagination. The temples were in charge of members of the guild or fraternity, the head of which was often though not necessarily a physician. The chief was appointed annually. From Caton's excellent sketch, you can get a good idea of the ritual, but still better is the delightful description given in the Plutus of Aristophanes. After offering honey cakes and baked meats on the altar, the suppliants arranged themselves on the pallets. Soon the temple servitor put out the lights and bade us fall asleep, not stir, nor speak whatever noise we heard so down we lay in orderly repose and i could catch no slumber not one wink 
struck by a nice tureen of broth which stood a little distance from an old wife's head, whereto I marvellously longed to creep. Then, glancing upwards, I beheld the priest whipping the cheesecakes and figs from off the holy table. Thence he coasted round to every altar spying what was left, and everything he found he consecrated into a sort of sack. Caton a procedure which reminds one of the story of Bell and the dragon. Then the god came, in the person of the priest, and scanned each patient. He did not neglect physical measures, as he braided in the mortar cloves, tenian garlic, verjuice, squills, and setian vinegar, with which he made application to the eyes of the patient. Then the god clucked, and out there issued from the holy shrine two great enormous serpents and underneath the scarlet cloth they crept and licked his eyelids as it seemed to me and mistress dear before you could have drunk of wine ten goblets wealth arose and saw aristophanes the incubation sleep in which indications of cure were divinely sent formed an important part of the ritual the asclepion or health temple of Kos, recently excavated, is of special interest, as being at the birthplace of Hippocrates, who was himself an Asclepiad. It is known that Kos was a great medical school. The investigations of Professor Rudolf Herzog have shown that this temple was very nearly the counterpart of the temple at Epidaurus. The Asclepian temples may have furnished a rare field for empirical inquiry. As with our modern hospitals, the larger temple had rich libraries, full of valuable manuscripts and records of cases. That there may have been secular Asclepiads connected with the temple who were freed entirely from its superstitious practices and thurgic rites is regarded as doubtful, yet is perhaps not so doubtful as one might think. How often have we physicians to bow ourselves in the house of Rimen? It is very much the same today at Lord where lay physicians have to look after scores of patients whose faith is too weak or whose maladies are too strong to be relieved by Our Lady of this famous shrine. Even in the Christian era, there is evidence of the association of distinguished physicians with the Esculapian temples. I noticed that in one of his anatomical treatises, Galen speaks with affection of a citizen of Pergamos, who has been a great benefactor of the Esculapian temple of that city. In Marius the Epicurean, Peter gives a delightful sketch of one of those temple health resorts, and brings in Galen, stating that he had himself undergone the temple sleep. But to this I can find no reference in the general index of Galen's works. From the votive tablets found at Epidaurus, we get a very good idea of the nature of the cases and of the cures. A large number of them have now been deciphered. There are evidences of various forms of diseases of the joints, affections of women, wounds, baldness, gout. But we are again in the world of miracles, as you may judge from the following. Arrakis of Mytilene is bald and entreats the god to make his hair grow. An ointment is applied overnight, and the next morning he has a thick crop of hair. There are indications that operations were performed and abscesses opened. From one we gather that dropsy was treated in a novel way. Asclepios cuts off the patient's head, holds him up by the heels, lets the water run out, claps on the patient's head again. Here is one of the invocations. O oh, blessed Asclepios, God of healing, it is thanks to thy skill that Diophantes hopes to be relieved from his incurable and horrible gout. No longer to move like a crab, no longer to walk upon thorns, but to have sound feet as thou hast decreed. The priest did not neglect the natural means of healing. The inscriptions show that great attention was paid to diet, exercise, massage and bathing, and that when necessary, drugs were used. Birth and death were believed to defile the sacred precincts, and it was not until the time of the Antonines that provision was made at Epidaurus for these contingencies. One practice of the temple was of special interest, the delicit, the incubation sleep, in which dreams were suggested to the patients. In the religion of Babylonia, an important part was played by the mystery of sleep. 
and the interpretation of dreams and no doubt from the east the greeks took over the practice of divination in sleep for in the Aesculapian cult also the incubation sleep played a most important role that it continued in later times is well indicated in the orations of aristides the arch neurasthenic of ancient history who was a great dreamer of dreams the oracle of Amphiaraus in attica sent dreams into the hearts of his consultants the priest take the inquirer and keep him fasting from food for one day and from wine for three days to give him perfect spiritual lucidity to absorb the divine communication Philemor's apollonius of tiana how incubation sleep was carried into the christian church its association with st cosmos and st damien and other saints its practice throughout the middle ages and its continuation to our own time may be read in the careful study of the subject made by miss hamilton now mrs dickens there are still in parts of greece and in asia minor shrines at which incubation is practised regularly and if one may judge from the reports with as great success as in epidorus at one place in britain christ church in monmouthshire incubation was carried on till the early part of the nineteenth century now the profession has come back to the study of dreams and there are professors as ready to give suggestive interpretations to them as in the days of aristides as usual aristotle seems to have said the last word on the subject even scientific physicians tell us that one should pay diligent attention to dreams and to hold this view is reasonable also for those who are not practitioners but speculative philosophers but it is asking too much to think that the deity would trouble to send dreams to very simple people and to animals if they were designed in any way to reveal the future in its struggle with christianity paganism made its last stand in the temples of asclepios the miraculous healing of the saints superseded the curses of the heathen god and it was wise to adopt the useful practice of his temple end of section eight Section 9 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matea Bracic. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Chapter 2 Greek Medicine Hippocrates and the Hippocratic Writings deservedly the foundation of greek medicine is associated with the name of hippocrates a native of the island of kos and yet he is a shadowy personality about whom we have little accurate first-hand information this is in strong contrast to some of his distinguished contemporaries and successors for example plato and aristotle about whom we have such full and accurate knowledge you will perhaps be surprised to hear that the only contemporary mention of hippocrates is made by plato in the protagoras the young hippocrates son of apollodorus has come to protagoras that mighty wise man to learn the science and knowledge of human life socrates asked him if you had thought of going to hippocrates of kos the asclepiad and were about to give him your money and some one had said to you you are paying money to your namesake hippocrates o oh, hippocrates tell me what is he that you give him money how would you have answered i should say he replied that i gave money to him as a physician and what will he make of you a physician he said and in the phaedrus in reply to a question of socrates whether the nature of the soul could be known intelligently without knowing the nature of the whole phaedrus replies Hippocrates, the Asclepiad, says that the nature, even of the body, can only be understood as a whole. Several lives of Hippocrates have been written. The one most frequently quoted is that of Sorinus of Ephesus, not the famous physician of the time of Trajan, and the statements which he gives are usually accepted. Videlicet, that he was born in the island of Kos in the year 460 BC, that he belonged to an Asclepiad family of distinction, that he travelled extensively, visiting Thrace, Thessaly, and various other parts of Greece, that he returned to Kos, where he became the most renowned physician of his period, 
and died about 375 BC. Aristotle mentions him but once, calling him the great Hippocrates. Busts of him are common, one of the earliest of which, and I am told the best, dating from Roman days, and now in the British Museum, is here represented. Of the numerous writings attributed to Hippocrates, it cannot easily be determined which are really the work of the father of medicine himself. They were collected at the time of the Alexandrian school, and it became customary to write commentaries upon them. Much of the most important information we have about them we derive from Galen. The earliest manuscript is the Codex Laurentianus of Florence, dating from the 9th century, a specimen page of which, thanks to Commendatore Biagi, is annexed. Those of you who are interested and wish to have full references to the various works attributed to Hippocrates will find them in Die Handschriften der Antiken Ärzte of the Prussian Academy, edited by Diels. The Prussian Academy has undertaken the editorship of the Corpus Medicorum Graecorum. There is no complete edition of them in English. In 1849, the Deeside physician Adams published, for the Old Sidenham Society, a translation of the most important works, a valuable edition and easily obtained. Littre's ten-volume edition, Oeuvre Complète d'Hippocrate, Paris 1839 to 1861, is the most important for reference. Those of you who want a brief but very satisfactory account of the Hippocratic writings with numerous extracts will find the volume of Theodore Beck very useful. I can only indicate, in a very brief way, the special features of the Hippocratic writings that have influenced the evolution of science and art of medicine. The first is undoubtedly the note of humanity. In his introduction to The Rise of the Greek Epic, Gilbert Murray emphasizes the idea of service to the community as more deeply rooted in the Greeks than in us. The question they asked about each writer was, does he help to make better men, or does he make life a better thing? Their aim was to be useful, to be helpful, to make better men in the cities, to correct life, to make gentle the life of the world. In this brief phrase were summed up the aspirations of the Athenians, likewise illuminated in that remarkable saying of Prodicus, 5th century BC, that which benefits human life is God. The Greek view of man was the very antithesis of that which St. Paul enforced upon the Christian world. One idea pervades thought from Homer to Lucian, like an aroma, pride in the body as a whole. In the strong conviction that our soul in its rose mesh is quite as much helped by flesh as flesh by the soul the Greeks sang his song, for pleasant is this flesh. Just so far as we appreciate the value of the fair mind and the fair body, so far do we apprehend ideals expressed by the Greek in every department of life. The beautiful soul harmonizing with the beautiful body was as much the glorious ideal of Plato as it was the end of the education of Aristotle. What a splendid picture in Book Three of the Republic, of the day when our youth will dwell in a land of health, amid fair sights and sounds, and receive the good in everything, and beauty, the effluence of fair works, shall flow into the eye and ear like a health-giving breeze from a purer region, and insensibly draw the soul from earliest years into likeness and sympathy with the beauty of reason. The glory of this zeal for the enrichment of this present life was revealed to the Greeks as to no other people, but in respect to care for the body of the common man, we have only seen its fulfilment in our own day, as a direct result of the methods of research initiated by them. Everywhere throughout the Hippocratic writings we find this attitude towards life, which has never been better expressed than in the fine phrase, where there is love of humanity, there will be love of the profession. This is well brought out in the qualifications laid down by Hippocrates for the study of medicine. Whoever is to acquire a competent knowledge of medicine ought to be possessed of the following advantages, a natural disposition, instruction, a favourable position for the study, early tuition, love of labour, leisure. First of all, a natural talent is required, for when nature opposes, everything else is vain. But when nature leads the way to what is most excellent, instruction in the arts takes place, 
which the student must try to appropriate to himself by reflection, becoming a nearly pupil in a place well adapted for instruction. He must also bring to task a love of labour and perseverance, so that the instruction taking root may bring forth proper and abundant fruits. And the directions given for the conduct of life and for the relation which the physician should have with the public are those of our code of ethics today. Consultations in doubtful cases are advised, touting for fees is discouraged. If two or more ways of medical treatment were possible, the physician was recommended to choose the least imposing or sensational. It was an act of deceit to dazzle the patient's eye by brilliant exhibitions of skill, which might very well be dispensed with. The practice of holding public lectures in order to increase his reputation was discouraged in the physician, and he was especially warned against lectures tricked out with quotations from the poets. Physicians who pretended to infallibility in detecting even the minutest departure from their prescriptions were laughed at, and, finally, there were precise bylaws to regulate the personal behaviour of the physician. He was enjoined to observe the most scrupulous cleanliness, and was advised to cultivate an elegance removed from all signs of luxury, even down to the detail that he might use perfumes, but not in an immoderate degree. But the high watermark of professional morality is reached in the famous Hippocratic Oath, which Gompert calls a monument of the highest rank in the history of civilization. It is of small matter whether this is of Hippocratic date or not, or whether it has in it Egyptian or Indian elements. Its importance lies in the accuracy with which it represents the Greek spirit. For twenty-five centuries it has been the credo of the profession, and in many universities it is still the formula with which men are admitted to the doctorate. I swear by Apollo the physician, and Esculapius, and health, Hygieia, and all heal, Panacea, and all the gods and goddesses, that, according to my ability and judgment, I will keep this oath and this stipulation, to reckon him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents, to share my substance with him, and relieve his necessities if required to look upon his offspring in the same footing as my own brothers, and to teach them this art, if they shall wish to learn it, without fee or stipulation, and that by precept, lecture, and every other mode of instruction, I will impart a knowledge of my art to my own sons, and those of my own teachers, and to disciples bound by a stipulation and oath according to the law of medicine, but to none others. I will follow that system of regimen which, according to my ability and judgment, I consider for the benefit of my patients, and abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous. I will give no deadly medicine to any one if asked, nor suggest any such counsel, and in like manner I will not give to a woman a pessary to produce abortion. With purity and with holiness I will pass my life and practice my art. I will not cut persons labouring under the stone, but will leave this to be done by men who are practitioners of this work. Into whatsoever houses I enter, I will go into them for the benefit of the sick, and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption, and further from the abduction of females and males, of free men and slaves. Whatever, in connection with my professional practice, or not in connection with it, I see or hear, in the life of men which ought not to be spoken of abroad, I will not divulge, as reckoning that all such should be kept secret. While I continue to keep this oath unviolated, may it be granted to me to enjoy life and practice of the art, respected by all men, in all times. But should I trespass and violate this oath, may the reverse be my lot. In his ideal republic, Plato put the physician low enough in the last tratum, indeed, but he has never been more honourably placed than the picture of Athenian society given by this author in the symposium. Here the physician is shown as a cultivated gentleman, mixing in the best, if not always the most sober, society. Eryximachus, the son of Achaemenus, himself a physician, plays in this famous scene a typical Greek part, a strong advocate of temperance in mind and body, deprecating, as a physician, excess in drink, 
he urged that conversation should be the order of the day and he had the honour of naming the subject praise of the god of love incidentally eryximachus gives his view of the nature of the disease and shows how deeply he was influenced by the views of empedocles so too in the body the good and healthy elements are to be indulged and the bad elements and the elements of disease are not to be indulged but discouraged and this is what the physician has to do and in this the art of medicine consists for medicine may be regarded generally as the knowledge of the loves and desires of the body and how to satisfy them or not and the best physician is he who is able to separate fair love from foul or to convert one into the other and he who knows how to eradicate and how to implant love whichever is required and can reconcile the most hostile elements in the constitution and make them loving friends is a skilful practitioner the second great note in greek medicine illustrates the directness with which they went to the very heart of the matter out of mysticism superstition and religious ritual the greek went directly to nature and was the first to grasp the conception of medicine as an art based on accurate observation and an integral part of the science of man what could be more striking than the phrase in the law there are in effect two things to know and to believe one knows to know is science to believe one knows is ignorance but no single phrase in the writings can compare for directness with the famous aphorism which has gone into the literature of all lands life is short and art is long the occasion fleeting experience fallacious and judgment difficult everywhere one finds a strong clear common sense which refuses to be entangled either in theological or philosophical speculations what socrates did for philosophy hippocrates may be said to have done for medicine as socrates devoted himself to ethics and the application of right thinking to good conduct so hippocrates insisted upon the practical nature of the art and in placing its highest good in the benefit of the patient empiricism experience the collection of facts the evidence of the senses the avoidance of philosophical speculations were the distinguishing features of hippocratic medicine one of the most striking contributions of hippocrates is the recognition that diseases are only part of the processes of nature that there is nothing divine or sacred about them with reference to epilepsy which was regarded as a sacred disease he says it appears to me to be no wise more divine nor more sacred than other diseases but has a natural cause from which it originates like other affections men regard its nature and cause as divine from ignorance and in another place he remarks that each disease has its own nature and that no one arises without a natural cause he seems to have been the first to grasp the conception of the great healing powers of nature in his long experience with the cures in the temples he must have seen scores of instances in which the god had worked the miracle through the vis medicatrix naturae and to the shrewd wisdom of his practical suggestions and treatment may be attributed in large part the extraordinary vogue which the great koan has enjoyed for twenty-five centuries one may appreciate the veneration with which the father of medicine was regarded by the attribute divine which was usually attached to his name listen to this for directness and honesty of speech taken from the work on the joints characterized by litre as the great surgical monument of antiquity i have written this down deliberately believing it is valuable to learn of unsuccessful experiments and to know the causes of their non-success the note of freedom is not less remarkable throughout the hippocratic writings and it is not easy to understand how a man brought up and practising within the precincts of a famous esculapian temple could have divorced himself so wholly from the superstitions and vagaries of the cult there are probably grounds for pliny's suggestion that he benefited by the receipts written in the temple registered by the sick cured of any disease afterwards Pliny goes on to remark in his characteristic way, he professed that course of psyche, which is called clinis, whereby physician found such sweetness that afterwards there was no measure nor end of feeds. 
Natural History There is no reference in the Hippocratic writings to divination. Incubation sleep is not often mentioned, and charms, incantations, or the practice of astrology, but rarely. Here and there we do find practices which jar upon modern feeling, but on the whole we feel in reading the Hippocratic writings nearer to their spirit than to that of the Arabians or of the many writers of the 15th and 16th centuries AD. And it is not only against the thaumaturgic powers that the Hippocratic writings protested, but they express an equally active reaction against the excesses and defects of the new philosophy, a point brought out very clearly by Gompatz. He regards it as an undying glory of the school of Kos, that after years of vague, restless speculation, it introduces steady, sedentary habits into the intellectual life of mankind. Fiction to the right, reality to the left, was the battle cry of this school in the war they were first to wage against the excesses and defects of the nature philosophy. Though the protest was effective in certain directions, we shall see that the authors of the Hippocratic writings could not entirely escape from the hypotheses of older philosophers. I can do no more than indicate in the briefest possible way some of the more important views ascribed to Hippocrates. We cannot touch upon the disputes between the Koan and Snidian schools. You must bear in mind that the Greeks at this time had no human anatomy. Dissections were impossible. Their physiology was of the crudest character, strongly dominated by the philosophies. Empedocles regarded the four elements, fire, air, earth and water, as the roots of all things, and this became the cornerstone in the humoral pathology of Hippocrates. As in the macrocosm, the world at large, there were four elements, fire, air, earth and water, so in the microcosm, the world of man's body, there were four humours, elements, budelicet, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, or colour, and black bile, or melancholy, and they corresponded to the four qualities of matter, heat, cold, dryness, and moisture. For more than 2,000 years, these views prevailed. In his Regiment of Life, Thomas Fair says, Which humours are called ye sons of the elements, because they be complexioned like the four elements, for like as the air is hot and moist, so is the blood hot and moist, and as the fire is hot and dry, so is colour hot and dry, and as water is cold and moist, so is phlegm cold and moist. And as the earth is cold and dry, so melancholy is cold and dry. As the famous Regimen Sanitatis of Salernum, the popular family handbook of the Middle Ages, says, Four humours reign within our bodies wholly, and these compared to four elements. According to Littre, there is nowhere so strong a statement of these views in the genuine works of Hippocrates, but they are found at large in the Hippocratic writings and nothing can be clearer than the following statement from the work The Nature of Man. The body of man contains in itself blood and phlegm and yellow bile and black bile, which things are in the natural constitution of his body, and the cause of sickness and of health. He is healthy when they are in proper proportion between one another as regards mixture and force and quantity, and when they are well mingled together. He becomes sick when one of these is diminished or increased in amount, or is separated in the body from its proper mixture, and not properly mingled with all the others. No words can more clearly express the views of disease which, as I mentioned, prevailed until quite recent years. The black bile melancholy has given us great word in the language, and that we have not yet escaped from the humoral pathology of Hippocrates is witnessed by the common expression of biliousness, too much bile, or he has a touch of the liver. The humours, imperfectly mingled, prove irritant in the body. They are kept in due proportion by the innate heat, which, by a sort of internal coction, gradually changes the humours to their proper proportion. Whatever may be the primary cause of the change in the humours manifesting itself in disease, the innate heat, or, as Hippocrates terms it, the nature of the body itself, tends to restore conditions to the norm, and this change occurring suddenly or abruptly he calls the crisis, 
which is accomplished on some special day of the disease and is often accompanied by a critical discharge or by a drop in the body temperature. The evil or superabundant humours with discharged and this view of a special materies morbi to be got rid of by a natural processor a crisis dominated pathology until quite recently. Hippocrates had a great belief in the power of nature, the vis medicatrix naturae, to restore the normal state. A keen observer and an active practitioner, his views of disease, thus hastily sketched, dominated the profession for twenty five centuries. Indeed, echoes of his theories are still heard in the schools, and his very words are daily on our lips. If asked what was the great contribution to medicine of Hippocrates and his school, we could answer the art of careful observation. In the Hippocratic writings is summed up the experience of Greece to the golden age of Pericles. Out of philosophy, out of abstract speculation, had come a way of looking at nature for which the physicians were mainly responsible, and which has changed forever men's views on disease. Medicine broke its leading strings to religion and philosophy, a tottering, though lusty child, whose fortunes we are to follow in these lectures. I have a feeling that, could we know more of the medical history of the older races of which I spoke in the first lecture, we might find that this was not the first born of Asclepios, that there had been many premature births, many stillborn offspring, even live births, the products of the fertilization of nature by the human mind. But the record is dark, and the infant was cast out like Israel in the chapter of Isaiah. But the high watermark of mental achievement had not been reached by the great generation in which Hippocrates had laboured. Socrates had been dead sixteen years, and Plato was a man of forty-five, when far away in the north, in the little town of Stagira, on the peninsula of Mount Athos in Macedonia was, in 384 BC, born a man of men, the one above all others to whom the phrase of Milton may be applied, the child of an Asclepiad, Nicomachus, physician to the father of Philip. There must have been a rare conjunction of the planets at the birth of the great Stagorite. In the first circle of the Inferno, Virgil leads Dante into a wonderful company, Star seated on the verger, he says, the philosophic family looking with reverence on the master of those who know, il maestro di color chisano. And with justice has Aristotle been so regarded for these twenty-three centuries. No man has ever swayed such an intellectual empire in logic, metaphysics, rhetoric, psychology, ethics, poetry, politics, and natural history, in all a creator and in all still a master. The history of the human mind offers no parallel to his career. As the creator of the sciences of comparative anatomy, systematic zoology, embryology, teratology, botany and physiology, his writings have an eternal interest. They present an extraordinary accumulation of facts relating to the structure and functions of various parts of the body. It is an unceasing wonder how one man even with a school of devoted students, could have done so much. Dissection, already practised by Alcneon, Democritus, Diogenes and others, was conducted on a large scale, but the human body was still taboo. Aristotle confesses that the inward parts of man are known least of all, and he had never seen the human kidneys or uterus. In his physiology, I can refer to but one point, the pivotal question of the heart and blood vessels. To Aristotle, the heart was the central organ controlling the circulation, the seat of vitality, the source of the blood, the place in which it received its final elaboration and impregnation with animal heat. The blood was contained in the heart and vessels as in a vase, hence the use of the term vessel. From the heart, the blood vessels extend throughout the body, as in the anatomical diagrams which are represented on the walls, for the parts lie round these because they are formed out of them. The nutriment oozes through the blood vessels and the passages in each of the parts, like water in unbaked pottery. He did not recognize any distinction between arteries and veins, calling both plebs litre. The vena cave is the great vessel, and the aorta the smaller, 
but both contain blood. He did not use the word arteria, arthria, for either of them. There was no movement from the heart to the vessels, but the blood was incessantly drawn upon by the substance of the body, and as unceasingly renewed by absorption of the products of digestion, the mesenteric vessels taking up nutriment very much as the plants take theirs by the roots from the soil. From the lungs was absorbed the pneuma, or spiritus, which was conveyed to the heart by the pulmonary vessels, one to the right and one to the left side. These vessels in the lungs, through mutual contact with the branches of the trachea, took in the pneuma. A point of interest is that the windpipe, or trachea, is called arteria, both by Aristotle and by Hippocrates. Anatomy, litre. It was the air tube, disseminating the breath throughout the lungs. We shall see in a few minutes how the term came to be applied to the arteries as we know them. The pulsation of the heart and arteries was regarded by Aristotle as a sort of ebullition, in which the liquids were inflated by the vital or innate heat, the fires of which were cooled by the pneuma, taken in by the lungs, and carried to the heart by the pulmonary vessels. In volume 4 of Gompat's Greek Thinkers, you will find an admirable discussion on Aristotle as an investigator of nature, and those of you who wish to study his natural history works more closely may do so easily, in the new translation which is in process of publication by the Clarendon Press Oxford. At the end of the chapter De Respirazione, in the Parva Naturalia, we have Aristotle's attitude towards medicine expressed in a way worthy of a son of the profession. But health and disease also claim the attention of the scientist, and not merely of the physician, insofar as an account of their causes is concerned. The extent to which these two differ and investigate diverse provinces must not escape us, since facts show that their inquiries are, at least to a certain extent, conterminous. For physicians of culture and refinement make some mention of natural science, and claim to derive their principles from it, while the most accomplished investigators into nature generally push their studies so far as to conclude with an account of medical principles. Works Theophrastus, a student of Aristotle and his successor, created the science of botany and made possible the pharmacologists of a few centuries later. Some of you doubtless know him in another guise, as the author of the Golden Booklet on Characters, in which... The most eminent botanist of antiquity observes the doings of men with the keen and unerring vision of a natural historian. Gompatz. In the Hippocratic writings, there are mentioned 236 plants. In the botany of Theophrastus, 455. To one trait of master and pupil I must refer. The human feeling, not alone of man for man, but a sympathy that even claims kinship with the animal world. The spirit with which he, Theophrastus, regarded the animal world found no second expression till the present age. Gompatz. Halliday, however, makes the statement that porphyry goes as far as any modern humanitarian in preaching our duty towards animals. End of section 9. Section 10 of the Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Emerson. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 10. Alexandrian School. From the death of Hippocrates about the year 375 BC till the founding of the Alexandrian School, the physicians were engrossed largely in speculative views, and not much real progress was made, except in the matter of elaborating the humoral pathology. Only three or four men of the first rank stand out in this period. Diocles the Charistian, both in time and reputation next and second to Hippocrates. A keen anatomist and an encyclopedic writer, but only scanty fragments of his work remain. In some ways, the most important member of this group was Praxagoras, a native of Cos, about 340 B.C. 
Aristotle, you remember, made no essential distinction between arteries and veins, both of which he held to contain blood. Praxagoras recognized that the pulsation was only in the arteries, and maintained that only the veins contained blood and the arteries air. As a rule, the arteries are empty after death, and Praxagoras believed that they were filled with an aeriform fluid, a sort of pneuma, which was responsible for their pulsation. The word arteria, which had already been applied to the trachea as an air-containing tube, was then attached to the arteries. On account of the rough and uneven character of its walls, the trachea was then called the arteria tracheae, or the rough air tube. We call it simply the trachea, but in French the word trache artère is still used. Proxagoras was one of the first to make an exhaustive study of the pulse, and he must have been a man of considerable clinical acumen, as well as boldness, to recommend in obstruction of the bowels the opening of the abdomen, removal of the obstructive portion, and uniting the ends of the intestines by sutures. After the death of Alexander, Egypt fell into the hands of his famous general, Ptolemy, under whose care the city became one of the most important on the Mediterranean. He founded and maintained a museum, an establishment that corresponded very much to a modern university for the study of literature, science, and the arts. Under his successors, particularly the third Ptolemy, the museum developed, more especially the library, which contained more than a half a million volumes. The teachers were drawn from all centers, and the names of the great Alexandrians are among the most famous in the history of human knowledge, including such men as Archimedes, Euclid, Strabo, and Ptolemy. In mechanics and physics, astronomy, mathematics, and optics, the work of the Alexandrians constitutes the basis of a large part of our modern knowledge. The schoolboy of today, or at any rate of my day, studies the identical problems that were set by Euclid 300 B.C., and the student of physics still turns to Archimedes and Heron, and the astronomer to Aristophanes and Hipparchus. To those of you who wish to get a brief review of the state of science, in the Alexandrian school, I would recommend the chapter in Volume 1 of Daneman's History. Of special interest to us in Alexandria is the growth of the first great medical school of antiquity. Could we have visited this famous museum about 300 B.C., we should have found a medical school in full operation, with extensive laboratories, libraries, and clinics. Here, for the first time, the study of the structure of the human body reached its full development, till then barred everywhere by religious prejudice. But full permission was given by the Ptolemies to perform human dissection and, if we're to credit some authors, even vivisection. The original writings of the chief men of this school have not been preserved, but there is a possibility that any day a papyrus may be found which will supplement the scrappy and imperfect knowledge afforded us by Pliny, Celsus, and Galen. The two most distinguished names are Herophilus, who Pliny says has the honor of being the first physician, quote, who searched into the causes of diseases, end quote, and Erisistratus, Herophilus, Ile Anatomicorum Corypheus, as Vesalius calls him, was a pupil of Praxagoras, and his name is still in everyday use by medical students, attached to the torcular Herophili. Anatomy practically dates from these Alexandrines, who described the valves of the heart, the duodenum, and many of the important parts of the brain. They recognized the true significance of the nerves, which before their day had been confounded with the tendons, distinguished between motor and sensory nerves, and regarded the brain as the seat of the perceptive faculties and voluntary action. Herophilus counted the pulse, using the water clock for the purpose, and made many subtle analyses of its rate and rhythm, and, influenced by the musical theories of the period, he built up a rhythmic pulse lore which continued in medicine until recent times. He was a skillful practitioner, and to him is ascribed the statement that drugs are the hands of the gods. There is a very modern flavor to his oft-quoted expression that the best physician was the man who was able to distinguish between the possible and the impossible. Erisistratus 
elaborated the view of the pneuma, one form of which he believed came from the inspired air and passed to the left side of the heart and to the arteries of the body. It was the cause of the heartbeat and the source of the innate heat of the body, and it maintained the processes of digestion and nutrition. This was the vital spirit. The animal spirit was elaborated in the brain, chiefly in the ventricles, and sent by the nerves to all parts of the body, endowing the individual with life and perception and motion. In this way, a great division was made between the two functions of the body and two sets of organs. In the vascular system, the heart and arteries and abdominal organs, life was controlled by the vital spirits. On the other hand, in the nervous system were elaborated the animal spirits, controlling motion, sensation, and the various special senses. These views on the vital and animal spirits held unquestioned sway until well into the 18th century, and we still, in a measure, express the views of the great Alexandrian when we speak of high or low spirits. End of section 10. Recording by Catherine Emerson. Section 11 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Koenig. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 11. Chapter 2. Greek Medicine. Galen. Pergamon has become little more than a name associated in our memory with the fulminations of St. John against the seven churches of Asia, and on hearing the chapter read, we wondered what was Satan's seat and who were the Nicolaitanes whose doctrine he so hated. Renewed interest has been aroused in the story of its growth and of its intellectual rivalry with Alexandria since the wonderful discoveries by German archaeologists which have enabled us actually to see this great Ionian capital, and even the seat of Satan. The illustration here shown is of the famous city, in which you can see the Temple of Athena Polis on the rock, and the amphitheater. Its interest for us is connected with the greatest name after Hippocrates in Greek medicine, that of Galen, born at Pergamon 8130, in whom was united as never before, and indeed one may say never since, the treble combination of observer, experimenter, and philosopher. His father, Nikon, a prosperous architect, was urged in a dream to devote his son to the profession of medicine, upon which study the lad entered in his seventeenth year under Satyrus. In his writings, Galen gives many details of his life, mentioning the names of his teachers, and many incidents in his Wanderjahre, during which he studied at the best medical schools, including Alexandria. Returning to his native city, he was put in charge of the gladiators, whose wounds he said he treated with wine. In the year 162, he paid his first visit to Rome, the scene of his greatest labors. Here he gave public lectures on anatomy and became the fashion. He mentions many of his successes. One of them is the well-worn story told also of Erisistratus and Stratonike, but Galen's story is worth telling, and it is figured as a miniature in the manuscripts of his works. Called to see a lady, he found her suffering from general malaise without any fever or increased action of the pulse. He saw at once that her trouble was mental, and, like a wise physician, engaged her in general conversation. Quite possibly he knew her story, for the name of a certain actor, Pylades, was mentioned, and he noticed that her pulse at once increased in rapidity and became irregular. On the next day he arranged that the name of another actor, Morphus, should be mentioned, and on the third day the experiment was repeated, but without effect. Then on the fourth evening it was again mentioned that Pylades was dancing, and the pulse quickened and became irregular, so he concluded that she was in love with Pylades. He tells how he was first called to treat the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who had a stomachache after eating too much cheese. He treated the case so successfully that the Emperor remarked, I have but one physician, and he is a gentleman. He seems to have had good fees, as he received four hundred aurei, about two thousand, for a fortnight's attendance upon the wife of Boethus. He left Rome for a time in 168 AD and returned to Pergamon, but was recalled to Rome by the emperor, whom he accompanied on an expedition to Germany. There are records in his writings of many journeys, and busy with his practice in dissections and experiments, he passed a long and energetic life, 
dying, according to most authorities, in the year 200 AD. A sketch of the state of medicine in Rome is given by Celsus in the first of his eight books, and he mentions the names of many of the leading practitioners, particularly Asclepiades the Bithynian, a man of great ability and a follower of the Alexandrians, who regarded all disease as due to a disturbed movement of the atoms. Diet, exercise, massage, and bathing were his great remedies, and his motto, Tuto, Quito, et Yucunde, has been the emulation of all physicians. How important a role he and his successors played until the time of Galen may be gathered from the learned lectures of Sir Clifford Albert on Greek medicine in Rome, and from Meyer Steinegg's Theodorus Priscianus und die Römische Medizin. From certain lay writers we learn that it was the custom for popular physicians to be followed on their rounds by crowds of students. Marshall's epigram, 5-9, is often referred to. Languebam, sed tu comitatus protinus ad me venisti centum sumache discipulis, centum me tetigere manus aculone gelatae, non habui febrem sumache, nunc habeo. And in the Apollonius of Tiana by Philostratus, when Apollonius wishes to prove an alibi, he calls to witness the physicians of his sick friend, Seleucus and Strelactes, who were accompanied by their clinical class to the number of about thirty students. But for a first-hand sketch of the condition of the profession, we must go to Pliny, whose account in the twenty-ninth book of the Natural History is one of the most interesting and amusing chapters in that delightful work. He quotes Cato's tirade against Greek physicians, corruptors of the race whom he would have banished from the city, then he sketches the career of some of the more famous of the physicians under the empire, some of whom must have had incomes never approached at any other period in the history of medicine. The chapter gives a good picture of the stage on which Galen, practically a contemporary of Pliny, was to play so important a role. Pliny seems himself to have been rather disgusted with the devious paths of the doctors of his day, and there is no one who is touched with stronger language upon the weak points of the art of physic. In one place he says that it alone has this peculiar art and privilege, that whosoever professeth himself a physician is straightways believed, say what he will, and yet to speak a truth there are no lies dearer sold or more dangerous than those which proceed out of a physician's mouth. Howbeit we never once regard or look to that, so blind we are in our deep persuasion of them, and feed ourselves each one in a sweet hope and plausible conceit of our health by them. Moreover, this mischief there is besides, that there is no law or statute to punish the ignorance of blind physicians, though a man lost his life by them. Neither was there ever any man known who had revenge of recompense for the evil entreating or misusage under their hands. They learn their skill by endangering our lives, and to make proof and experiments of their medicines they care not to kill us. He says it is hard that, while the judges are carefully chosen and selected, Physicians are practically their own judges, and that of the men who may give us a quick dispatch and send us to heaven or hell, no enquiry or examination is made of their quality and worthiness. It is interesting to read so early a bitter criticism of the famous Theriaca, a great compound medicine invented by Antiochus III, which had a vogue for fifteen hundred years. But we must return to Galen and his works, which comprise the most voluminous body of writings left by any of the ancients. The great addition is that in 22 volumes by Kuhn, 1821 to 1833. The most useful editions are the Juntines of Venice, which were issued in 13 editions. In the fourth and subsequent editions, a very useful index by Brasovola is included. A critical study of the writings is at present being made by German scholars for the Prussian Academy, which will issue a definitive edition of his works. Galen had an eclectic mind, and could not identify himself with any of the prevailing schools, but regarded himself as a disciple of Hippocrates. For our purpose, both his philosophy and his practice are of minor interest in comparison with his great labors in anatomy and physiology. In anatomy, he was a pupil of the Alexandrians, to whom he constantly refers. Times must have changed since the days of Herophilus, as Galen does not seem ever to have had an opportunity of dissecting the human body, and he laments the prejudice which prevents it. In the study of osteology, he urges the student to be on the lookout for an occasional human bone exposed in a graveyard, and on one occasion he tells of finding the carcass of a robber with the bones picked bare by birds and beasts. Failing this source, he advises the student to go to Alexandria, where there were still two skeletons. He himself dissected chiefly apes and pigs. 
His osteology was admirable, and his little tractate De Ossibus could, with very few changes, be used today by a hygiene class as a manual. His description of the muscles and of the organs is very full, covering, of course, many sins of omission and of commission, but it was the culmination of the study of the subject by Greek physicians. His work as a physiologist was even more important, for so far as we know, he was the first to carry out experiments on a large scale. In the first place, he was within an ace of discovering the circulation of the blood. You may remember that through the errors of Praxagoras and Erisistratus, the arteries were believed to contain air and got their name on that account. Galen showed by experiment that the arteries contain blood and not air. He studied particularly the movements of the heart, the action of the valves, and the pulsatile forces in the arteries. Of the two kinds of blood, the one, contained in the venous system, was dark and thick and rich in grosser elements, and served for the general nutrition of the body. This system took its origin, as is clearly shown in the figure, in the liver, the central organ of nutrition and of sanguification. From the portal system were absorbed, through the stomach and intestines, the products of digestion. From the liver extend the vena cavae, one to supply the head and arms, the other the lower extremities. Extending from the right heart was a branch, corresponding to the pulmonary artery, the arterial vein which distributed blood to the lungs. This was the closed venous system. The arterial system, shown as you see quite separate in figure 31, was full of a thinner, brighter, warmer blood, characterized by the presence of an abundance of the vital spirits. Warmed in the ventricle, it distributed vital heat to all parts of the body. The two systems were closed and communicated with each other only through certain pores or perforations in the septum separating the ventricles. At the periphery, however, Galen recognized as had been done already by the Alexandrians, that the arteries anastomose with the veins, and they mutually receive from each other blood and spirits through certain invisible and extremely small vessels. It is difficult to understand how Galen missed the circulation of the blood. He knew that the valves of the heart determined the direction of the blood that entered and left the organ, but he did not appreciate that it was a pump for distributing the blood, regarding it rather as a fireplace from which the innate heat of the body was derived. He knew that the pulsatile force was resident in the walls of the heart and in the arteries, and he knew that the expansion, or diastole, drew blood into its cavities, and that the systole forced blood out. Apparently, his view was that there was a sort of ebb and flow in both systems, and yet he uses language just such as we would, speaking of the venous system as a conduit full of blood with a multitude of canals large and small running out from it and distributing blood to all parts of the body. He compares the mode of nutrition to irrigating canals and gardens, with a wonderful dispensation by nature that they should neither lack a sufficient quantity of blood for absorption, nor be overloaded at any time with excessive supply. The function of respiration was the introduction of the pneuma, the spirits which pass from the lungs to the heart through the pulmonary vessels. Galen went a good deal beyond the idea of Aristotle, reaching our modern conception that the function is to maintain the animal heat, and that the smoky matters derived from combustion of the blood are discharged by expiration. I have dwelt on these points in Galen's physiology, as they are fundamental in the history of the circulation, and they are sufficient to illustrate his position. Among his other brilliant experiments were the demonstration of the function of the laryngeal nerves, of the motor and sensory functions of the spinal nerve roots, of the effect of transverse incision of the spinal cord, and of the effect of hemisection. Altogether, there is no ancient physician in whose writings are contained so many indications of modern methods of research. Galen's views of disease in general are those of Hippocrates, but he introduces many refinements and subdivisions according to the predominance of the four humors, the harmonious combination of which means health or eucrasia, while their perversion or improper combination leads to dyscrasia or ill health. In treatment, he had not the simplicity of Hippocrates. He had great faith in drugs and collected plants from all parts of the known world, for the sale of which he is said to have had a shop in the neighborhood of the Forum. As I mentioned, he was an eclectic, held himself aloof from the various schools of the day, calling no man master save Hippocrates. He might be called a rational empiricist. He made war on the theoretical practitioners of the day, particularly the Methodists, who, like some of their modern followers, held that their business was with the disease, and not with the conditions out of which it arose. No other physician has ever occupied the commanding position of Clarissimus Galenus. For fifteen centuries he dominated medical thought as powerfully as did Aristotle in the schools. 
Not until the Renaissance did daring spirits begin to question the infallibility of this medical pope. But here we must part with the last, and in many ways the greatest, of the Greeks. A man very much of our own type, who, could he visit this country today, might teach us many lessons. He would smile in scorn at the water supply of many of our cities, thinking of the magnificent aqueducts of Rome and of many of the colonial towns, some still in use, which in lightness of structure and in durability testify to the astonishing skill of their engineers. There are country districts in which he would find imperfect drainage and could tell of the wonderful system by which Rome was kept sweet and clean. Nothing would delight him more than a visit to Panama to see what the organization of knowledge has been able to accomplish. Everywhere he could tour the country as a sanitary expert, preaching the gospel of good water supply and good drainage, two of the great elements in civilization, in which in many places we have not yet reached the Roman standard. End of section 11. Recording by Amy Koenig. Section 12 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler, Section 12. Chapter 3. Medieval Medicine There are waste places on the earth which fill one with terror. Not simply because they are waste. One has not such feelings in the desert, nor in the vast solitude of the ocean. Very different is it where the desolation has overtaken a brilliant and flourishing product of man's head and hand. To know that the lion and the lizard keep the courts where Jamshide gloried and drank deep, sends a chill to the heart, and one trembles with a sense of human instability. With this feeling we enter the Middle Ages. Following the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome, a desolation came upon the civilized world, in which the light of the learning burned low, flickering almost to extinction. How came it possible that the gifts of Athens and Alexandria were deliberately thrown away? For three causes. The barbarians shattered the Roman Empire to its foundation. When Alaric entered Rome in 410 A.D., ghastly was the impression made on the contemporaries. The Roman world shuddered in a titanic spasm, Lindner. The land was a garden of Eden before them behind a howling wilderness, as is so graphically told in Gibbon's Great History. Many of the most important centers of learning were destroyed, and for centuries Minerva and Apollo forsook the haunts of men. The other equally important cause was the change wrought by Christianity, the brotherhood of man, the care of the body, the gospel of practical virtues formed the essence of the teaching of the Founder. In these the kingdom of heaven was to be sought, in these lay salvation. But the world was very evil. All thought that the times were waxing late, and into men's minds entered as never before a conviction of the importance of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. One obstacle alone stood between man and his redemption, the vile body, this muddy vesture of decay that so grossly wrapped his soul. To find methods of bringing it into subjection was the task of the Christian Church for centuries. In the Vatican Gallery of Inscriptions is a stone slab with the single word Stercheri, and below the Christian symbol. It might serve as a motto for the Middle Ages, during which, to quote St. Paul, all things were counted dung but to win Christ. In this attitude of mind, the wisdom of the Greeks was not simply foolishness, but a stumbling block in the path. Knowledge other than that which made a man wise unto salvation was useless. All that was necessary was contained in the Bible or taught by the church. This simple creed brought consolation to thousands and illumined the lives of some of the noblest of men. But in seeking a heavenly home, man lost his bearings upon earth. 
let me commend for your reading Taylor's Medieval Mind. I cannot judge of its scholarship, which I am told by scholars is ripe and good, but I can judge of its usefulness for anyone who wishes to know the story of the mind of man in Europe at this period. Into the content of medieval thought only a mystic can enter with full sympathy. It was a needful change in the evolution of the race. Christianity brought new ideals and new motives into the lives of men. The world's desire was changed, a desire for the kingdom of heaven, in the search for which the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life were as dross. A master motive swayed the minds of sinful men, and a zeal to save other souls occupied the moments not devoted to the perfection of their own. The new dispensation made any other superfluous. As Tertullian said, investigation since the gospel is no longer necessary. Daneman, the attitude of the early fathers toward the body, is well expressed by Jerome. Does your skin roughen without baths? Who is once washed in the blood of Christ needs not wash again. In this unfavorable medium for its growth, science was simply disregarded, not in any hostile spirit, but as unnecessary. And a third contributing factor was the plague of the sixth century, which desolated the whole Roman world. On top of the grand mausoleum of Hadrian, Visitors at Rome see the figure of a gilded angel with a drawn sword, from which the present name of Castle of St. Angelo takes its origin. On the 25th of April, 590, there set out from the church of S.S. Cosmos and Damian, already the Roman patron saints of medicine, a vast procession led by St. Gregory the Great, chanting a sevenfold litany of intercession against the plague. The legend relates that Gregory saw on the top of Hadrian's tomb an angel with a drawn sword, which he sheathed as the plague abated. Galen died about 200 A.D. The high watermark of the Renaissance, so far as medicine is concerned, was reached in the year 1542. In order to traverse this long interval intelligently, I will sketch certain great movements, tracing the currents of Greek thought setting forth in their works the lives of certain great leaders, until we greet the dawn of our own day. After flowing for more than a thousand years through the broad plain of Greek civilization, the stream of scientific medicine which we have been following is apparently lost in the morass of the Middle Ages, but checked and blocked like the White Nile in the Sudan, Three channels may be followed through the weeds of theological and philosophical speculation. End of section 12 Section 13 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Section 13 Medieval Medicine, South Italian School A wide stream is in Italy, where the antique education never stopped, antique reminiscence and tradition never passed away, and the literary matter of the pagan past never faded from the consciousness of the more educated among the laity and clergy. Greek was the language of South Italy, and was spoken in some of its eastern towns until the 13th century. The cathedral and monastic schools served to keep alive the ancient learning. Monte Cassino stands preeminent as a great hive of students, and to the famous Regula of St. Benedict we are indebted for the preservation of many precious manuscripts. The Norman kingdom of South Italy and Sicily was a meeting ground of Saracens, Greeks, and Lombards. Greek, Arabic, and Latin were in constant use among the people of the capital, and Sicilian scholars of the 12th century translated directly from the Greek. The famous Almagest of Ptolemy, the most important work of ancient astronomy, was translated from a Greek manuscript as early as 1160 by a medical student of Salerno. 
about thirty miles southeast of Naples, lay Salernum, which for centuries kept alight the lamp of the old learning, and became the center of medical studies in the Middle Ages. Well deserving its name of Civitas Hippocratica, the date of foundation is uncertain, but Salernitan physicians are mentioned as early as the middle of the ninth century, and from this date until the rise of the universities, it was not only a great medical school, but a popular resort for the sick and wounded. As the scholar says in Longfellow's Golden Legend, Then at every season of the year there are crowds of guests and travelers here, pilgrims and mendicant friars and traders, from the Levant with figs and wine, and bands of wounded and sick crusaders, coming back from Palestine. There were medical and surgical clinics, foundling hospitals, sisters of charity, men and women professors, among the latter the famous Trotula, and apothecaries. Dissections were carried out, chiefly upon animals, and human subjects were occasionally used. In the eleventh and twelfth centuries the school reached its height, and that remarkable genius, Frederick II, laid down regulations for a preliminary study extending over three years, and a course in medicine for five years, including surgery. Fee tables and strict regulations as to practice were made, and it is specifically stated that the masters were to teach in the schools, theoretically and practically, under the authority of Hippocrates and Galen. The literature from the school had a far-reaching influence. One book on the anatomy of the pig illustrates the popular subject for dissection at the time. The writings, which are numerous, have been collected by Derenzi. The Antidotarium of Nicholas Salernitanus, about 1100, became the popular pharmacopoeia of the Middle Ages, and many modern preparations may be traced to it. The most prominent man of the school is Constantinus Africanus, a native of Carthage, who, after numerous journeys, reached Salernum about the middle of the eleventh century. He was familiar with the works both of the Greeks and of the Arabs, and it was largely through his translations that the works of Razes and Avicenna became known in the West. One work above all others spread the fame of the school, the Regimen Sanitatis, or Flos Medicinae, as it is sometimes called, a poem on popular medicine. It is dedicated to Robert of Normandy, who had been treated at Salernum, and the lines begin, Anglorm Regi Scripsit Scola Tota Salerni. It is a handbook of diet and household medicine, with many shrewd and taking sayings which have passed into popular use, such as joy, temperance, and repose, slam the door on the doctor's nose. A full account of the work and the various editions of it is given by Sir Alexander Crook, and the Finlayson Lecture, Glasgow Medical Journal, 1908, by Dr. Norman Moore, gives an account of its introduction into the British Isles. Medieval Medicine, Byzantine Medicine the second great stream which carried Greek medicine to modern days runs through the Eastern Empire. Between the 3rd century and the fall of Constantinople, there was a continuous series of Byzantine physicians whose inspiration was largely derived from the old Greek sources. The most distinguished of these was Oribatius, a voluminous compiler a native of Pergamon, and so close a follower of his great townsman that he has been called Galen's ape. He left many works, in addition of which was edited by Busemaker and Derenberg. Many facts relating to the older writers are recorded in his writings. He was a contemporary, friend as well as the physician of the Emperor Julian, for whom he prepared an encyclopedia of the medical sciences. Other important Byzantine writers were Aetius and Alexander of Tralles, both of whom were strongly under the influence of Galen and Hippocrates. Their Materia Medica was based largely upon Dioscorides. From Byzantium we have the earliest known complete medical manuscript, dating from the 5th century, a work of Dioscorides, one of the most beautiful in existence. It was prepared for Anicia Juliana, daughter of the Emperor of the East, and is now one of the great treasures of the Imperial Library at Vienna. 
From those early centuries till the fall of Constantinople, there is very little of interest medically. A few names stand out prominently, but it is mainly a blank period in our records. Perhaps one man may be mentioned, as he had a great influence on later ages, Actuarius, who lived about 1300, and whose book on the urine laid the foundation of much of the popular uroscopy and water casting that had such a vogue in the 16th and 17th centuries. His work on the subject passed through a dozen Latin editions, but is best studied in Eidler's Physici et Medici Greci Minoris, Berlin, 1841. The Byzantine stream of Greek medicine had dwindled to a very tiny rill when the fall of Constantinople, 1453, dispersed to the West many Greek scholars and many precious manuscripts. End of section 13《Section Thirteen》。《Section Fourteen》of《The Evolution of Modern Medicine》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in April 2020.《The Evolution of Modern Medicine》by Sir William Osler. Section 14. Chapter 3. Medieval Medicine. Arabian Medicine. The third and by far the strongest branch of the Greek river reached the west after a remarkable and meandering course. The map before you shows the distribution of the Greco-Roman Christian world at the beginning of the seventh century. You will notice that Christianity had extended far eastwards, almost to China. Most of those Eastern Christians were Nestorians, and one of their important centers was Edessa, whose school of learning became so celebrated. Here, in the 5th century, was built one of the most celebrated hospitals of antiquity. Now look at another map showing the same countries about a century later. No such phenomenal change ever was made within so short space of time as that which thus altered the map of Asia and Europe at this period. Within a century, the crescent had swept from Arabia through the Eastern Empire, over Egypt, North Africa, and over Spain in the West, and the fate of Western Europe hung in the balance before the gates of Tours in 732. This time the barbaric horde that laid waste the large part of Christendom were a people that became deeply appreciative of all that was best in Greco-Roman civilization and of nothing more than of its sciences. The cultivation of medicine was encouraged by the Arabs in a very special way. Anyone wishing to follow the history of the medical profession among this remarkable people will find it admirably presented in Lucien Leclerc's Histoire de la médecine arabe. An excellent account is also given in Freyne's well-known History of Medicine. Here I can only indicate very briefly the course of the stream and its freightage. With the rise of Christianity, Alexandria became a center of bitter theological and political factions, the story of which haunts the memory of anyone who was so fortunate as to read in his youth Kingsley's Hypatia. These centuries, with their potent influence of Neoplatonism on Christianity, appear to have been sterile enough in medicine. I have already referred to the late Greeks, Aetius and Alexander of Tralles. The last of the Alexandrians was a remarkable man, Paul of Aegina, a great name in medicine and in surgery, who lived in the early part of the 7th century. He also, like Oribasius, was a great compiler. In the year 1640, the Arabs took Alexandria, and for the third time a great library was destroyed in the first city of the West. Shortly after the conquest of Egypt, Greek works were translated into Arabic, often through the medium of Syriac, particularly certain of Galen's books on medicine and chemical writings, which appear to have laid the foundation of Arabian knowledge on this subject. Through Alexandria, then, was one source, but the special development of the Greek science and of medicine took place in the ninth century under the Eastern Caliphates. 
Let me quote here a couple of sentences from Leclerc. The world has but once witnessed so marvellous a spectacle as that presented by the Arabs in the ninth century. This pastoral people, whose fanaticism had suddenly made them masters of half of the world, having once founded their empire, immediately set themselves to acquire that knowledge of the sciences which alone was lacking to their greatness. Of all the invaders who competed for the last remains of the Roman Empire, they alone pursued such studies, while the Germanic hordes, glorying in their brutality and ignorance, took a thousand years to reunite the broken chain of tradition, the Arabs accomplished this in less than a century. They provoked the competition of the conquered Christians, a healthy competition which secured the harmony of the races. At the end of the eighth century, their whole scientific positions consisted of a translation of one medical treatise and some books on alchemy. Before the ninth century had run to its close, the Arabs were in possession of all the science of the Greeks, they had produced from their own ranks students of the first order, and had raised among their initiators men who, without them, would have been groping in the dark, and they showed from this time an aptitude for the exact sciences, which was lacking in their instructors, whom they henceforward surpassed. It was chiefly through the Nestorians that the Arabs became acquainted with Greek medicine, and there were two famous families of translators, the Bactishwas and the Mesues, both Syrians, and probably not very thoroughly versed in either Greek or Arabic. But the prince of translators, one of the finest figures of the century, was Honine, a Christian Arab born in 809, whose name was Latinized as Ioannitus. The marvellous extent of his works, their excellence, their importance, the trials he bore nobly at the beginning of his career, everything about him arouses our interest and sympathy. If he did not actually create the Oriental Renaissance movement, certainly no one played in it a more active, decided and fruitful part. His industry was colossal. He translated most of the works of Hippocrates and Galen, Aristotle and many others. His famous introduction, or Isagoge, a very popular book in the Middle Ages, is a translation of the Microtegni of Galen, a small handbook of which a translation is appended to Cholmele's John of Gaddesden. The first printed edition of it appeared in 1475, see Chapter 4, at Padua. Leclerc gives the names of more than one hundred known translators who not only dealt with the physicians, but with the Greek philosophers, mathematicians, and astronomers. The writings of the physicians of India and of Persia were also translated into Arabic. But close upon the crowd of translators who introduced the learning of Greece to the Arabians came original observers of the first rank, to a few only of whom time will allow me to refer. Razes, so called from the name of the town, Rai, in which he was born, was educated at the great hospital at Baghdad in the second half of the ninth century. With a true Hippocratic spirit, he made many careful observations on disease, and to him we owe the first accurate account of smallpox, which he differentiated from measles. This work was translated for the old Sydenham Society by W. A. Greenhill, and the description given of the disease is well worth reading. He was a man of strong powers of observation, good sense and excellent judgment. His works were very popular, particularly the gigantic Continents, one of the bulkiest of Incunabula. The Brescia edition, 1486, a magnificent volume, extends over 588 pages, and it must weigh more than 17 pounds. It is an encyclopedia filled with extracts from the Greek and other writers, interspersed with memoranda of his own experiences. His Almansor was a very popular textbook, and one of the first to be printed. Book 9 of Almansor, the name of the prince to whom it was addressed, with the title De Acritudinibus a Capite Usque ad Pedes, was a very favorite medieval textbook. 
on account of his zeal for study, Rases was known as the experimentator. The first of the Arabians, known throughout the Middle Ages as the prince, the rival indeed of Galen, was the Persian Ibn Sita, better known as Avicenna, one of the greatest names in the history of medicine. Born about 980 AD in the province of Khorasan, near Bokhara, he has left a brief autobiography from which we learn something of his early years. He could repeat the Quran by heart when ten years old, and at twelve he had disputed in law and in logic. So that he found medicine was an easy subject, not hard and thorny like mathematics and metaphysics. He worked night and day and could solve problems in his dreams. When I found a difficulty, he says, I referred to my notes and prayed to the Creator. At night, when weak or sleepy, I strengthened myself with a glass of wine. He was a voluminous writer, to whom scores of books are attributed, and he is the author of the most famous medical textbook ever written. It is safe to say that the canon was a medical Bible for a longer period than any other work. It stands for the epitome of all precedent development, the final codification of all Greco-Arabian medicine. It is a hierarchy of laws liberally illustrated by facts which so ingenuously rule and are subject to one another, stay and uphold one another, that admiration is compelled for the sagacity of the great organizer, who, with unparalleled power of systematization, collecting his material from old sources, constructed so imposing an edifice of fallacy. Avicenna, according to his lights, imparted to contemporary medical science the appearance of almost mathematical accuracy, whilst the art of therapeutics, although empiricism did not wholly lack recognition, was deduced as a logical sequence from theoretical, Galenic and Aristotelian, premises. It is, therefore, matter for surprise that a majority of investigators and practitioners should have fallen under the spell of this consummation of formalism and should have regarded the canon as an infallible oracle, the more so in that the logical construction was impeccable and the premises, in the light of contemporary conceptions, passed for incontrovertible axioms. Innumerable manuscripts of it exist. Of one of the most beautiful, a Hebrew version, I gave an illustration. A Latin version was printed in 1472, and there are many later editions, the last in 1663. Avicenna was not only a successful writer, but the prototype of the successful physician, who was at the same time statesman, teacher, philosopher, and literary man. Rumor has it that he became dissipated, and a contemporary saying was that all his philosophy could not make him moral, nor all his physic teach him to preserve his health. He enjoyed a great reputation as a poet. I reproduce a page of a manuscript of one of his poems, which we have in the Bodleian Library. Professor A. V. W. Jackson says that some of his verse is particularly Kayamesque, though he antedated Omar by a century. That large infidel might well have written such a stanza as, From Earth's dark center unto Saturn's gate, I've solved all problems of this world's estate. From every snare of plot and guile set free, each bond resolved, saving alone death's fate. His hymn to the deity may have been written by Plato and rivals the famous one of Cleanthes. A casual reader gets a very favorable impression of Avicenna. The story of his dominion over the schools in the Middle Ages is one of the most striking in our history. Perhaps we feel that Leclerc exaggerates when he says, Avicenna is an intellectual phenomenon. Never, perhaps, has an example been seen of so precocious, quick, and wide an intellect extending and asserting itself with so strange and indefatigable an activity. The touch of the man never reached me until I read some of his mystical and philosophical writings translated by Meeren. It is Plato over again. 
the beautiful allegory in which men are likened to birds snared and caged until set free by the angel of death might be met with anywhere in the immortal dialogues the tractate on love is a commentary on the symposium and the essay on destiny is greek in spirit without a trace of oriental fatalism as you may judge from the concluding sentence which i leave you as his special message take heed to the limits of your capacity and you will arrive at a knowledge of the truth how true is the saying work ever and to each will come that measure of success for which nature has designed him avicenna died in his fifty-eighth year when he saw that physic was of no avail resigning himself to the inevitable he sold his goods distributed the money to the poor read the koran through once every three days and died in the holy month of ramadan his tomb at hamadan the ancient ekpatana still exists a simple brickwork building rectangular in shape and surrounded by an unpretentious court it was restored in eighteen seventy seven but is again in need of repair the illustration here shown is from a photograph sent by dr nelligan of teheran though dead the great persian has still a large practice as his tomb is much visited by pilgrims among whom cures are said to be not uncommon the western caliphate produced physicians and philosophers almost as brilliant as those of the east remarkable schools of medicine were founded at seville toledo and cordova the most famous of the professors were Averroes, albucasis and abenzoar albucasis was the arabian restorer of surgery Averroes, called in the middle ages the soul of aristotle or the commentator is better known today among philosophers than physicians on the revival of moslem orthodoxy he fell upon evil days was persecuted as a freethinker and the saying is attributed to him sit anima mea cum philosophic arabian medicine had certain very definite characteristics the basis was greek derived from translations of the work of hippocrates and galen no contributions were made to anatomy as dissections were prohibited nor to physiology and the pathology was practically that of galen certain new and important diseases were described a number of new and active remedies were introduced chiefly from the vegetable kingdom the arabian hospitals were well organized and were deservedly famous no such hospital exists today in cairo as that which was built by al-mansur gilafun in twelve eighty three the description of it by makrisi quoted by neuburger reads like that of a twentieth-century institution with hospital units i have founded this institution for my equals and for those beneath me it is intended for rulers and subjects for soldiers and for the emir for great and small freemen and slaves men and women he ordered medicaments physicians and everything else that could be required by any one in any form of sickness placed male and female attendants at the disposal of the patients determined their pay provided beds for patients and supplied them with every kind of covering that could be required in any complaint every class of patient was accorded separate accommodation the four halls of the hospital were set apart for those with fever and similar complaints one part of the building was reserved for eye patients one for the wounded one for those suffering from diarrhoea one for women a room for convalescents was divided into two parts one for men and one for women water was laid on to all these departments one room was set apart for cooking food preparing medicine and cooking syrups another for the compounding of confections balsams eye salves etc the head physician had an apartment to himself wherein he delivered medical lectures the number of patients was unlimited every sick or poor person who came found admittance nor was the duration of his stay restricted and even those who were sick at home were supplied with every necessity Macrisi. in later times this hospital was much extended and improved 
The nursing was admirable, and no stint was made of drugs and appliances. Each patient was provided with means upon leaving, so that he should not require immediately to undertake heavy work. Neuburger, History of Medicine, Volume 1, page 378. It was in the domain of chemistry that the Arabs made the greatest advances. You may remember that, in Egypt, chemistry had already made considerable strides, and I alluded to Professor Elliot Smith's view that one of the great leaps in civilization was the discovery in the Nile Valley of the metallurgy of copper. In the brilliant period of the Ptolemies, both chemistry and pharmacology were studied, and it seems not improbable that, when the Arabs took Alexandria in the year 640, there were still many workers in these subjects. The most famous of those early Arabic writers is the somewhat mythical Geber, who lived in the first half of the 8th century, and whose writings had an extraordinary influence throughout the Middle Ages. The whole story of Geber is discussed by Berthelot in his La Chimie au Moyen Age. The transmission of Arabian science to the Occident began with the Crusaders, though earlier a filtering of important knowledge in mathematics and astronomy had reached southern and middle Europe through Spain. Among the translators, several names stand out prominently. Gerbert, who later became Pope Sylvester II, is said to have given us our present Arabic figures. You may read the story of his remarkable life in Taylor, who says he was the first mind of his time, its greatest teacher, its most eager learner, and most universal scholar. But he does not seem to have done much directly for medicine. The Greco-Arabic learning passed into Europe through two sources. As I have already mentioned, Constantinus Africanus, a North African Christian monk, widely travelled and learned in languages, came to Salernum and translated many works from Arabic into Latin, particularly those of Hippocrates and Galen. The Pantegni of the latter became one of the most popular textbooks of the Middle Ages. A long list of other works which he translated is given by Steinschneider. It is not unlikely that Arabic medicine had already found its way to Salernum before the time of Constantine, but the influence of his translations upon the later Middle Ages was very great. The second was a more important source through the Latin translators in Spain, particularly in Toledo, where, from the middle of the 12th till the middle of the 13th century, an extraordinary number of Arabic works in philosophy, mathematics, and astronomy were translated. Among the translators, Gerard of Cremona is prominent, and has been called the father of translators. He was one of the brightest intelligences of the Middle Ages, and did a work of the first importance to science, through the extraordinary variety of material he put in circulation. Translations, not only of the medical writers, but of an indiscriminate crowd of authors in philosophy and general literature, came from his pen. He furnished one of the first translations of the famous Almagest of Ptolemy, which opened the eyes of his contemporaries to the value of the Alexandrian astronomy. Leclerc gives a list of seventy-one works from his hand. Many of the translators of the period were Jews, and many of the works were translated from Hebrew into Latin. For years Arabic had been the learned language of the Jews, and in a large measure it was through them that the Arabic knowledge and the translations passed into South and Central Europe. The Arab writer whose influence on medieval thought was the most profound was Averroes, the great commentator on Aristotle. End of section 14 Section 15 of the Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in January 2020. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 15. Chapter 3. Medieval Medicine. 
the rise of the universities. The most striking intellectual phenomenon of the 13th century is the rise of the universities. The story of their foundation is fully stated in Rashdall's great work, Universities of Europe in the Middle Ages, Oxford, 1895. Monastic and collegiate schools, seats of learning like Salernum, student guilds as at Bologna, had tried to meet the educational needs of the age. The word university literally means an association and was not at first restricted to learned bodies. The origin appears to have been in certain guilds of students formed for mutual protection associated at some place specially favorable for study, the attraction generally being a famous teacher. The University of Bologna grew up about guilds formed by students of law, and at Paris, early in the 12th century, there were communities of teachers, chiefly in philosophy and theology. In this way arose two different types of medieval university. The universities of northern Italy were largely controlled by students who were grouped in different nations. They arranged the lectures and had control of the appointment of teachers. On the other hand, in the universities founded on the Paris model, the masters had control of the studies, though the students, also in nations, managed their own affairs. Two universities have a special interest at this period in connection with the development of medical studies, Bologna and Montpellier. At the former, the study of anatomy was revived. In the knowledge of the structure of the human body, no advance had been made for more than a thousand years, since Galen's day. In the process of translation from Greek to Syriac, from Syriac to Arabic, from Arabic to Hebrew, and from Hebrew or Arabic to Latin, both the form and thought of the old Greek writers were not infrequently confused and often even perverted, and Galen's anatomy had suffered severely in the transmission. Our earliest knowledge of the teaching of medicine at Bologna is connected with a contemporary of Dante, Taddeo Alderotti, who combined Arabian erudition with the Greek spirit. He occupied a position of extraordinary prominence, was regarded as the first citizen of Bologna and a public benefactor exempt from the payment of taxes. That he should have acquired wealth is not surprising, if his usual fees were at the rate at which he charged Pope Honorius IV, i.e. 200 florins a day, besides a gratification of 6,000 florins. The man who most powerfully influenced the study of medicine in Bologna was Mundinus, the first modern student of anatomy. We have seen that at the school of Salernum it was decreed that the human body should be dissected at least once every five years, but it was with the greatest difficulty that permission was obtained for this purpose. It seems probable that under the strong influence of Taddeo there was an occasional dissection at Bologna, but it was not until Mundinus, professor from 1306 to 1326, took the chair that the study of anatomy became popular. The bodies were usually those of condemned criminals, but in the year 1319 there is a record of a legal procedure against four medical students for body snatching, the first record as far as I know of this gruesome practice. In 1316, Mundinus issued his work on anatomy, which served as a textbook for more than 200 years. He quotes from Galen the amusing reasons why a man should write a book. Firstly, to satisfy his own friends. Secondly, to exercise his best mental powers. And thirdly, to be saved from the oblivion incident to old age. Scores of manuscripts of his work must have existed, but they are now excessively rare in Italy. The book was first printed at Pavia in 1478, in a small folio without figures. It was very often reprinted in the 15th and 16th centuries. The quaint illustration shows us the medieval method of teaching anatomy, the lecturer sitting on a chair reading from Galen, while a barber surgeon or an ostenser opens the cavities of the body. 
I have already referred to the study of medicine by women at Salernum. Their names are also early met with in the school of Bologna. Mundinus is said to have had a valuable assistant, a young girl, Alessandra Gigliani, an enthusiastic dissector who was the first to practice the injection of the blood vessels with colored liquids. She died, consumed by her labors, at the early age of nineteen, and her monument is still to be seen. Bologna honored its distinguished professors with magnificent tombs, sixteen or seventeen of which, in a wonderful state of preservation, may still be seen in the Civic Museum. That of Mundinus also exists, a sepulchral bas-relief on the wall of the church of San Vitale at Bologna. The other early medieval university of special interest in medicine is that of Montpellier. With it are connected three teachers who have left great names in our story, Arnold of Villanova, Henri de Montville, and Guy de Choliac. The city was very favorably situated, not far from the Spanish border, and the receding tide of the Arab invasion in the 8th century had left a strong Arabic influence in that province. The date of the origin of the university is uncertain, but there were teachers of medicine there in the 12th century, though it was not until 1289 that it was formally founded by a papal bull. Arnold of Villanova was one of the most prolific writers of the Middle Ages. He had traveled much, was deeply read in Arabic medicine, and was also a student of law and of philosophy. He was an early editor of the Regimen Sanitatis and a strong advocate of diet and hygiene. His views on disease were largely those of the Arabian physicians, and we cannot see that he himself made any very important contribution to our knowledge, but he was a man of strong individuality and left an enduring mark on medieval medicine, as one may judge from the fact that among the first hundred medical books printed, there were many associated with his name. He was constantly in trouble with the church, though befriended by the popes on account of his medical knowledge. There is a bull of Clement V asking the bishops to search for a medical book by Arnold dedicated to himself, but not many years later his writing were condemned as heretical. In Henri de Mondeville we have the typical medieval surgeon, and we know his work now very thoroughly from the editions of his Anatomy and Surgery, edited by Pagel, Berlin, 1889 to 1892, and in the fine French edition by Nices, Paris, 1893. The dominant Arabic influence is seen in that he quotes so large a proportion of these authors, but he was an independent observer and a practical surgeon of the first rank. He had a sharp wit and employed a bitter tongue against the medical abuses of his day. How the Hippocratic humours dominated practice at this time you may see at a glance from the table prepared by Nices from the works of the Mondeville. We have here the whole pathology of the period. A still greater name in the history of this school is Guy de Choliac, whose works have also been edited by Nices, Paris, 1890. His surgery was one of the most important textbooks of the late Middle Ages. There are many manuscripts of it, some fourteen editions in the fifteenth century and thirty-eight in the sixteenth, and it continued to be reprinted far into the seventeenth century. He, too, was dominated by the surgery of the Arabs, and on nearly every page one reads of the sages Avicenna, Albucazis, or Rases. He lays down four conditions necessary for the making of a surgeon. The first is that he must be learned, the second, expert, the third, that he should be clever, and the fourth, that he should be well disciplined. You will find a very discerning sketch of the relation of these two men to the history of surgery in the address given at the St. Louis Congress in 1904 by Sir Clifford Albert. They were strong men with practical minds and good hands, whose experience taught them wisdom. In both there was the blunt honesty that so often characterizes a good surgeon, 
and I commend to modern surgeons de Montville's saying, If you have operated conscientiously on the rich for a proper fee, and on the poor for charity, you need not play the monk, nor make pilgrimages for your soul. One other great medieval physician may be mentioned, Peter of Abano, a small town near Padua, famous for its baths. He is the first in a long line of distinguished physicians connected with the great school of Padua. Known as the Conciliator, from his attempt to reconcile the diverse views on philosophy and medicine, he had an extraordinary reputation as a practitioner and author, the persistence of which is well illustrated by the fact that eight of the 182 medical books printed before 1481 were from his pen. He seems to have taught medicine in Paris, Bologna, and Padua. He was a devoted astrologer, had a reputation among the people as a magician, and, like his contemporary Arnold of Villanova, came into conflict with the church, and appears to have been several times before the Inquisition. Indeed, it is said that he escaped the stake only by a timely death. He was a prolific commentator on Aristotle, and his exposition of the problems had a great vogue. The early editions of his texts are among the most superb works ever printed. He outlived his reputation as a magician, and more than a century after his death, Frederick, Duke of Urbino, caused his effigies to be set up over the gate of the palace at Padua with this inscription. Petrus Aponus Patavinus, Philosophiae Medicinicae, Scientissimus, ob itque, conciliatores nomen adeptus, astrologiae vero adeo peritus, ut in magie suspicionem inciderit, falsoque de haerese postulatus, absolutus fuerit. It is said that Abano caused to be painted the astronomical figures in the great hall of the palace at Padua. One characteristic of medieval medicine is its union with theology, which is not remarkable, as the learning of the time was chiefly in the hands of the clergy. One of the most popular works, the Thesaurus Pauperum, was written by Petrus Hispanus, afterwards Pope John XXI. We may judge of the pontifical practice from the page here reproduced, which probably includes, under the term Iliac Passion, all varieties of appendicitis. For our purpose, two beacons illuminate the spirit of the 13th century in its outlook on man and nature. Better than Abelard or St. Thomas Aquinas, and much better than any physicians, Albertus Magnus and Roger Bacon represent the men who were awake to greet the rising of the sun of science. What a contrast in their lives and in their works! The great Dominican's long life was an uninterrupted triumph of fruitful accomplishment. The titanic task he set himself was not only completed, but was appreciated to the full by his own generation, a life not only of study and teaching, but of practical piety. As head of the order in Germany and Bishop of Regensburg, he had wide ecclesiastical influence, and in death he left a memory equalled only by one or two of his century, and excelled only by his great pupil, Thomas Aquinas. There are many Alberts in history, the good, the just, the faithful, but there is only one we call Magnus, and he richly deserved the name. What is his record? Why do we hold his name in reverence today? Albertus Magnus was an encyclopedic student and author who took all knowledge for his province. His great work and his great ambition was to interpret Aristotle to his generation. Before his day, the Stagirite was known only in part, but he put within the reach of his contemporaries the whole science of Aristotle and imbibed no small part of his spirit. He recognized the importance of the study of nature, even of testing it by way of experiment, and in the long years that had elapsed since Theophrastus, no one else, except Dioscorides, had made so thorough a study of botany. 
his paraphrases of the natural history books of Aristotle were immensely popular, and served as a basis for all subsequent studies. Some of his medical works had an extraordinary vogue, particularly the De Secretis Mulierum and the De Vertutibus Herbarum, but there is some doubt as to the authorship of the first named, although Jamie and Bournet included in the collected editions of his works. So fabulous was his learning that he was suspected of magic and comes in Nord's list of the wise men who have unjustly been reputed magicians. Ferguson tells that there is an actual circulation at the present time a chapbook containing charms, receipts, sympathetical and magical cures for man and animals, which passes under the name of Albertus. But perhaps the greatest claim of Albertus to immortality is that he was the teacher and inspirer of Thomas Aquinas, the man who undertook the colossal task of fusing Aristotelian philosophy with Christian theology, and with such success that the angelic doctor remains today the supreme human authority of the Roman Catholic Church. A man of much greater interest to us from the medical point of view is Roger Bacon, and for two reasons. More than any other medieval mind, he saw the need of the study of nature by a new method. The man who could write such a sentence as this, Experimental science has three great prerogatives over other sciences. It verifies conclusions by direct experiment. It discovers truth which they never otherwise would reach. It investigates the course of nature and opens to us a knowledge of the past and of the future. Is mentally of our day and generation. Bacon was born out of due time, and his contemporaries had little sympathy with his philosophy, and still less with his mechanical schemes and inventions. From the days of the Greeks, no one had had so keen an appreciation of what experiment meant in the development of human knowledge, and he was obsessed with the idea, so commonplace to us, that knowledge should have its utility and its practical bearing. His chief merit is that he was one of the first to point the way to original research, as opposed to the acceptance of an authority, though he himself still lacked the means of pursuing this path consistently. His inability to satisfy this impulse led to a sort of longing, which is expressed in the numerous passages in his works where he anticipates man's greater mastery over nature. Bacon wrote a number of medical treatises, most of which remain in manuscript. His treatise on the cure of old age and the preservation of youth was printed in English in 1683. His authorities were largely Arabian. One of his manuscripts is On the Bad Practices of Physicians. On June 10, 1914, the eve of his birth, the septum centenary of Roger Bacon will be celebrated by Oxford, the university of which he is the most distinguished ornament. His unpublished manuscripts in the Bodleian will be issued by the Clarendon Press, 1915-1920, and it is hoped that his unpublished medical writings will be included. What would have been its fate if the mind of Europe had been ready for Roger Bacon's ferment, and if men had turned to the profitable studies of physics, astronomy, and chemistry, instead of wasting centuries over the scholastic philosophy, and the subtleties of Duns Scotus, Abelard, and Thomas Aquinas. Who can say? Make no mistake about the quality of these men, giants in intellect who have had their place in the evolution of the race, but from the standpoint of man struggling for the mastery of this world, they are like the members of Swift's famous college, busy distilling sunshine from cucumbers. I speak, of course, from the position of the natural man who sees for his fellows more hope from the experiments of Roger Bacon than from the disputations of philosophy on the instants, familiarities, quiddities, and relations, which so roused the scorn of Erasmus. End of section 15
Section 16 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 16. Chapter 3. Medieval Medicine, Medieval Medical Studies, Medieval Practice The Greek doctrine of the four humors colored all the conceptions of disease. Upon their harmony alone it was thought that health depended. The four temperaments, sanguine, phlegmatic, bilious, and melancholic, corresponded with the prevalence of these humors. The body was composed of certain so-called naturals, seven in number, the elements, the temperaments, the humors, the members or parts, the virtues or faculties, the operations or functions, and the spirits. Certain non-naturals, nine in number, preserve the health of the body, viz. air, food, and drink, movement and repose, sleeping and waking, excretion and retention, and the passions. Disease was due usually to alterations in the composition of the humors, and the indications for treatment were in accordance with these doctrines. They were to be evacuated, tenuated, cooled, heated, purged, or strengthened. This humoral doctrine prevailed throughout the Middle Ages, and reached far into modern times. Indeed, echoes of it are still to be heard in popular conversations on the nature of disease. The Arabians were famous for their vigor and resource in matters of treatment. Bleeding was the first resource in a large majority of all diseases. In the practice of Ferrari, there is scarcely a malady for which it is not recommended. All remedies were directed to the regulation of the six non-naturals, and they either preserved health, cured the disease, or did the opposite. The most popular medicines were derived from the vegetable kingdom, and as they were chiefly those recommended by Galen, they were, and still are, called by his name. Many important mineral medicines were introduced by the Arabians, particularly mercury, antimony, iron, etc. There were, in addition, scores of substances. The parts were products of animals, some harmless, others salutary others again useless and disgusting. Minor surgery was in the hands of the barbers, who performed all the minor operations, such as bleeding. The more important operations, few in number, were performed by surgeons. End of section 16。section 17 of the evolution of modern medicine。this is a LibriVox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Section 17 Chapter 3 Medieval Medicine, Astrology and Divination At this period, astrology, which included astronomy, was everywhere taught in the governance of princes or private of privates, translated by James Young, 1422, there occurs a statement, as Galen the lull wise lech saith, and Isidore the Greek clerk, hit witnesses that a man may not perfectly can the sciences and craft of medicine, but yet he be an astronomer. We have seen how the practice of astrology spread from Babylonia and Greece throughout the Roman Empire. It was carried on into the Middle Ages as an active and aggressive cult, looked upon askance at times by the church, but countenanced by the courts, encouraged at the universities, and always by the public. In the curriculum of the medieval university, astronomy made up with music, arithmetic, and geometry the quadrivium. In the early faculties, astronomy and astrology were not separate and at Bologna in the early 14th century, we meet with a professorship of astrology. One of the duties of this salaried professor was to supply judgments gratis for the benefit of inquiring students, a treacherous and delicate assignment, 
as that most distinguished occupant of the chair at bologna seco de escoli found when he was burned at the stake in thirteen fifty seven a victim of the florentine inquisition roger bacon himself was a warm believer in judicial astrology and in the influence of the planets stars and comets on generation disease and death many of the stronger minds of the renaissance broke away from the fathers of the subject thus cornelius agrippa in reply to the request of a friar to consult the stars on his behalf says judicial astrology is nothing more than the fallacious guess of superstitious men who have founded a science on uncertain things and are deceived by it so think nearly all the wise as such it is ridiculed by some most noble philosophers christian theologians reject it and it is condemned by sacred councils of the church yet you whose office is to dissuade others from these vanities oppressed or rather blinded by i know not what distress of mind flee to this as a sacred augur and as if there were no god in israel that you send to inquire of the god of ekron in spite of the opposition of the church astrology held its own many of the universities at the end of the fifteenth century published almanacs usually known as pronosticons and the practice was continued far into the sixteenth century i show you here an illustration rabelais you may remember when physician to the hotel Deux and Lyon published almanacs for the year 1533, 1535, 1541, 1546. In the title page, he called himself Doctor of Medicine and Professor of Astrology, and they continued to be printed under his name until 1556. In the preparation of these, he must have had his tongue in cheek, as in the famous Pantagruelian pronostication, in which to satisfy the curiosity of all good companions he had turned over all the archives of the heavens calculated the quadratures of the moon hooked out all that has ever been thought of by the astrophils hypernephilus anemophilates uranopets and ambrophoria and felt on every point with impedocles even physicians of the most distinguished reputation practiced judicial astrology jerome cardin was not above earning money by casting horoscopes and on this subject he wrote one of his most popular books de supplemento almanac etc fifteen forty three which astronomy and astrology are mixed in the truly medieval fashion he gives in it some sixty-seven nativities remarkable for the events they foretell with an exposition one of the accusations brought against him was that he had attempted to subject to the stars the lord of the stars and cast our saviour's horoscope cardin professed to have abandoned a practice looked upon with disfavour both by the church and by the universities but he returned to it again and again i show here his own horoscope that remarkable character michael servetus the discovery of the lesser circulation when a fellow student with vesalius at paris gave lectures upon judicial astrology which brought him into conflict with the faculty and the rarest of the servetus works rarer even than the christianisme restitutio is the apologetica di septiato pro astrologia one copy of which is in the bibliotheque nationale nor could the new astronomy and the acceptance of the heliocentric views dislocate the popular belief the literature of the seventeenth century is rich in astrological treatises dealing with medicine no one has ever poured such satire upon the mantic arts as did rabelais in chapter twenty five of the third book of pantagruel panergie goes to consult her trippa the famous cornelius agrippa whose opinion of astrology has already been quoted but who nevertheless as court astrologer to louise of savoy had a great contemporary reputation after looking panorge in the face and making conclusions by metoposcopy and physiognomy he cast his horoscope segundum artum then taking a branch of tamarisk a favorite tree from which to get the divining rod he named some twenty-nine or thirty mantic arts from pyromancy to necromancy 
by which he offers to predict his future while full of rare humor this chapter throws an interesting light on the extraordinary number of modes of divination that have been employed small wonder that panorgay repented of his visit i show here the title page of a popular book by one of the most famous of the english astrological physicians nicholas culpepper never was the opinion of sensible men on this subject better expressed than by sir thomas brown nor do we hereby reject or condemn a sober and regulated astrology we hold there is more truth therein than in astrologers in some more than many allow yet in none so much as some pretend we deny not the influence of the stars but often suspect the due application thereof for though we should affirm that all things were in all things that heaven were but earth celestified and earth but heaven terrestified of that each part above had an influence upon its divided affinity below yet how to single out these relations and duly to apply their actions is a work oft times to be effected by some revelation and cabala from above rather than any philosophy or speculation here below as late as sixteen ninety nine a thesis was discussed at the paris faculty whether comets were harbingers of disease and in seventeen o seven the faculty negatived the question propounded in a thesis whether the moon had any sway on the human body the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries saw among intelligent men a progressive weakening of the belief in the subject but not even the satire of swift with his practical joke in predicting and announcing the death of the famous almanac maker nor contemptuous neglect of the subject of late years sufficed to dispel the belief from the minds of the public garth in the dispensary sixteen ninety nine satirizes the astrological practitioners of his day the sage in velvet chair here lolls at ease to promise future health for present fees then as from tripod solemn sham reveals and what the stars know nothing of foretell canto two the almanacs of moore and zadkiel continue to be published and remain popular in london sandwich men are to be met with carrying advertisements of chaldeans and egyptians who offer to tell your fortune by the stars even in this country astrology is still practised to a surprising extent if one may judge from advertisements in certain papers and from publications which must have a considerable sale many years ago i had as a patient an estimable astrologer whose lucrative income was derived from giving people astral information as to the rise and fall of stocks it is a chapter in the vagaries of the human mind that is worth careful study let me commend to your reading the sympathetic story called a doctor of medicine in the rewards and fairies of kipling the hero is nicholas culpepper gentleman whose picture is here given one stanza of the poem at the end of the story our fathers of old may be quoted wonderful tales had our fathers of old wonderful tales of the herbs and the stars the sun was lord of the marigold basil and rocket belonged to mars pat is a sum and division it goes every plant had a star bespoke who but venus should govern the rose who but jupiter own the oak simply and gravely the facts are told in the wonderful books of our fathers of old james j walsh of new york has written a book of extraordinary interest called the thirteenth greatest of centuries i have not the necessary knowledge to say whether he has made out his case or not for art and for literature there was certainly a great awakening and inspired by high ideals men turned with a true instinct to the belief that there was more in life than could be got out of barron's scholastic studies with many of the strong men of the period one feels the keenest mental sympathy grostes the great clerk of lincoln as a scholar a teacher and a reformer represents a type of mind that could grow only in fruitful soil roger bacon may be called the first of the moderns certainly the first to appreciate the extraordinary possibilities which lay in a free and untrammeled study of nature a century which could produce men capable of building the gothic cathedrals may well be called one of the great epochs in history 
and the age that produced dante is a golden one in literature humanity has been the richer for st francis and abelard albertus and aquinas form a trio not easy to match in their special departments either before or after but in science and particularly in medicine and in the advance of an outlook upon nature the thirteenth century did not help man very much roger bacon was a voice crying in the wilderness and not one of the men i have picked out as specially typical of the period instituted any new departure either in practice or in science they were servile followers when not of the greeks of the arabians this is attested by the barrenness of the century and a half that followed one would have thought that the stimulus given by mundinus to the study of anatomy would have borne fruit but little was done in science during the two and a half centuries that followed the delivery of his lectures and still less in the art while william of wickham was building winchester cathedral and chaucer was writing the canterbury tales john of gaddesdon in practice was blindly following blind leaders whose authority no one dared question the truth is from the modern standpoint the thirteenth was not the true dawn brightening more and more unto the perfect day but a glorious aurora which flickered down again into the arctic night of medievalism to sum up in medicine the middle ages represent a restatement from century to century of the facts and theories of the greeks modified here and there by arabian practice there was in francis bacon's phrase much iteration small addition the schools bowed in humble slavish submission to galen and hippocrates taking everything from them but their spirit and there was no advance in our knowledge of the structure or function of the body the arabians lit a brilliant torch from grecian lamps and from the eighth to the eleventh centuries the profession reached among them a position of dignity and importance to which it is hard to find a parallel in history end of section seventeen section eighteen of the evolution of modern medicine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the evolution of modern medicine by sir william osler section eighteen chapter four the renaissance and the rise of anatomy and physiology the reconquest of the classic world of thought was by far the most important achievement of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries it absorbed nearly the whole mental energy of the italians the revelation of what men were and what they wrought under the influence of other faiths and other impulses in distant ages with a different ideal for their aim not only widened the narrow horizon of the middle ages but it also restored self-confidence to the reason of humanity everywhere throughout the middle ages learning was the handmaid of theology even roger bacon with his strong appeal for a new method accepted the dominant medieval conviction that all the sciences did but minister to their queen theology a new spirit entered man's heart as he came to look upon learning as a guide to the conduct of life a revolution was slowly effected in the intellectual world it is a mistake to think of the renaissance as a brief period of sudden fruitfulness in the north italian cities so far as science is concerned the thirteenth century was an aurora followed by a long period of darkness but the fifteenth was a true dawn that brightened more and more unto the perfect day always a reflex of its period medicine joined heartily though slowly in the revolt against medievalism how slowly i did not appreciate until recently studying the earliest printed medical works to catch the point of view of the men who were in the thick of the movement up to fourteen eighty which may be taken to include the first quarter of a century of printing one gets a startling record the medieval mind still dominates of the sixty-seven authors of one hundred and eighty-two editions of early medical books twenty-three were men of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries thirty men of the fifteenth century eight wrote in arabic 
Several were of the school of Salernum, and only six were of classical antiquity, viz. Pliny, Hippocrates, Hain, Galen, Aristotle, Celsus, and Dioscorides. The medical profession gradually caught the new spirit. It has been well said that Greece arose from the dead with the New Testament in the one hand and Aristotle in the other. There was awakened a perfect passion for the old Greek writers, and with it a study of the original sources, which had now become available in many manuscripts. Gradually Hippocrates and Galen came to their own again. Almost every professor of medicine became a student of the manuscripts of Aristotle and of the Greek physicians, and before 1530 the presses had poured out a stream of editions. A wave of enthusiasm swept over the profession, and the best energies of its best minds were devoted to a study of the fathers. Galen became the idol of the schools. A strong revulsion of feeling arose against the Arabians, and Avicenna, the prince, who had been clothed with an authority only a little less than divine, became anathema. Under the leadership of the Montpellier school, the Arabians made a strong fight, but it was a losing battle all along the line. This group of medical humanists, men who were devoted to the study of the old humanities, as Latin and Greek were called, has had a great and beneficial influence upon the profession. They were, for the most part, cultivated gentlemen with a triple interest, literature, medicine, and natural history. How important is the part they played may be gathered from a glance at the lives given by Bale in his Biographic Medical, Paris, 1855, between the years 1500 and 1575. More than one half of them had translated or edited works of Hippocrates or Galen. Many of them had made important contributions to general literature, and a large proportion of them were naturalists. Leonicenus, Lineker, Champier, Farnell, Fracastorius, Gontier, Caius, J. Silvius, Brassavola, Fuxius, Matthiolus, Conrad Gessner, to mention only those I know best, form a great group. Lineker edited Greek works for Aldus, translated works of Galen, taught Greek at Oxford, wrote Latin grammars, and founded the Royal College of Physicians. Caius was a keen Greek scholar, an ardent student of natural history and his name is enshrined as co-founder of one of the most important of the Cambridge colleges. Gontier, Farnell, Fuchs, and Mattioli were great scholars and greater physicians. Champier, one of the most remarkable of the group, was the founder of the Hôtel Dieu at Lyon, and author of books of a characteristic Renaissance type and of singular bibliographical interest. In many ways, greatest of all was Conrad Gessner, whose Mors in Openata at 49, bravely fighting the plague, is so touchingly and tenderly mourned by his friend Caius. Physician, botanist, mineralogist, geologist, chemist, the first great modern bibliographer, he is the very embodiment of the spirit of the age. On the fly-leaf of my copy of the Bibliotheca Universalis, 1545, is written a fine tribute to his memory. I do not know by whom it is, but I do know from my reading that it is true. Conrad Gessner, who kept open house there for all learned men who came into his neighborhood. Gessner was not only the best naturalist among the scholars of his day, but of all men of that century he was the pattern man of letters. He was faultless in private life, assiduous in study, diligent in maintaining correspondence, and goodwill with learned men in all countries, hospitable, though his means were small, to every scholar that came into Zurich. Prompt to serve all, he was an editor of other men's volumes, a writer of prefaces for friends, a suggester to young writers of books on which they might engage themselves, and a great helper to them in the progress of their work. 
but still, while finding time for services to other men, he could produce as much out of his own study as though he had no part in the life beyond its walls. A large majority of these early naturalists and botanists were physicians. The Greek art of observation was revived in a study of the scientific writings of Aristotle, Theophrastus, and Dioscorides, and in medicine of Hippocrates and of Galen, all in the Greek originals. That progress was at first slow was due in part to the fact that the leaders were too busy scraping the Arabian tarnish from the pure gold of Greek medicine and correcting the anatomical mistakes of Galen to bother much about his physiology or pathology. Here and there, among the great anatomists of the period, we read of an experiment, but it was the art of observation, the art of Hippocrates, not the science of Galen, not the carefully devised experiment to determine function that characterized their work. There was indeed every reason why men should have been content with the physiology and pathology of that day, as, from a theoretical standpoint, it was excellent. The doctrine of the four humors and of the natural, animal, and vital spirits afforded a ready explanation for the symptoms of all diseases, and the practice of the day was admirably adapted to the theories. There was no thought of, no desire for, change. But the revival of learning awakened in men at first a suspicion, and at last a conviction, that the ancients had left something which could be reached by independent research and gradually the paralytic-like torpor passed away. The sixteenth and seventeenth centuries did three things in medicine, shattered authority, laid the foundation of an accurate knowledge of the structure of the human body, and demonstrated how its functions should be studied intelligently, with which advances, as illustrating this period, may be associated the names of Paracelsus, Vesalius, and Harvey. End of section 18. Section 19 of the Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Section 19 The Renaissance and the Rise of Anatomy and Physiology Paracelsus Paracelsus is der Geist der Stets vernent. He roused men against the dogmatism of the schools, and he stimulated enormously the practical study of chemistry. These are his great merits, against which must be placed a flood of hermetical and transcendental medicine, some his own, some foisted in his name, the influence of which is still with us. With what judgment ye judge it shall be judged to you again, is the verdict of three centuries on Paracelsus, in return for unmeasured abuse of his predecessors and contemporaries, he has been held up to obloquy as the arch charlatan of history. We have taken a cheap estimate of him from Fuller and Bacon, and from a host of scurrilous scribblers who debased or perverted his writings. Fuller picked him out as exemplifying the drunken quack, whose body was a sea wherein the tide of drunkenness was ever ebbing and flowing. He boasted that shortly he would order Luther and the Pope, as well as he had done Galen and Hippocrates. He was never seen to pray, and seldom came to church. He was not only skilled in natural magic, the utmost bounds whereof border on the suburbs of hell, but is charged to converse constantly with familiars. Guilty he was of all vices but wantonness. Francis Bacon, too, says many hard things of him. To the mystics, on the other hand, he is Paracelsus the Great, the Divine, the Most Supreme of the Christian Magi, whose writings are too precious for science, the monarch of secrets, who has discovered the universal medicine. This is illustrated in Browning's well-known poem, Paracelsus, 
published when he was only twenty-one, than which there is no more pleasant picture in literature of the man and of his aspirations. His was a searching and impetuous soul that sought to win from nature some startling secret, a tincture of force to flush old age with youth, or breed gold, or imprison moonbeams till they change to opal shafts. At the same time, with that capacity for self-deception, which characterizes the true mystic, he sought to cast light on a darkling race, save for that doubt. I stood at first, where all aspire at last to stand. The secret of the world was mine. I knew, I felt, perception unexpressed, uncomprehended by our narrow thought but somehow felt and known in every shift and change in the spirit, nay, in every pore of the body, even, what God is, what we are, what life is. Robert Browning, Paracelsus, Closing Speech Much has been done of late to clear up his story and his character. Professor Sudhoff of Leipzig has made an exhaustive bibliographical study of his writings. There have been recent monographs by Julius Hartmann and Professors Franz and Karl Strunz, and a sympathetic summary of his life and writings has been published by the late Miss Stoddart. Indeed, there is at present a cult of Paracelsus. The hermetic and alchemical writings are available in English in the edition of A. E. Waite, London, 1894. The main facts of his life you can find in all the biographies. Suffice it here to say that he was born at Einsiedeln, near Zurich, in 1493, the son of a physician, from whom he appears to have had his early training, both in medicine and in chemistry. Under the famous abbot and alchemist Trithemius of Wurzburg, he studied chemistry and occultism. After working in the mines at Schwatz, he began his wanderings, during which he professes to have visited nearly all the countries in Europe and to have reached India and China. Returning to Germany, he began a triumphal tour of practice through the German cities, always in opposition to the medical faculty and constantly in trouble. He undoubtedly performed many important cures and was thought to have found the supreme secret of alchemistry. In the pommel of his sword, he was believed to carry a familiar spirit. So dominant was his reputation that in 1527 he was called to the chair of physic in the University of Basel. Embroiled in quarrels after his first year, he was forced to leave secretly, and again began his wanderings through German cities, working, quarreling, curing, and dying prematurely at Salzburg in 1541, one of the most tragic figures in the history of medicine. Paracelsus is the Luther of medicine, the very incarnation of the spirit of revolt, at a period when authority was paramount, and men blindly followed old leaders, when to stray from the beaten track in any field of knowledge was a damnable heresy, he stood out boldly for independent study and the right of private judgment. After election to the chair at Basel, he at once introduced a startling novelty by lecturing in German. He had caught the new spirit and was ready to burst all bonds both in medicine and in theology. He must have startled the old teachers and practitioners by his novel methods. On June 5, 1527, he attached a program of his lectures to the blackboard of the university, inviting all to come to them. It began by greeting all students of the art of healing. He proclaimed its lofty and serious nature, a gift of God to man and the need of developing it to new importance and to new renown. This he undertook to do, not retrogressing to the teaching of the ancients, but progressing whither nature pointed, through research into nature, where he himself had discovered and had verified by prolonged experiment and experience. He was ready to oppose obedience to old lights, as if they were oracles from which one did not dare to differ. Illustrious doctors might be graduated from books, but books made not a single physician. 
neither graduation nor fluency, nor the knowledge of old languages, nor the reading of many books made a physician, but the knowledge of things themselves and their properties. The business of a doctor was to know the different kinds of sicknesses, their causes, their symptoms, and their right remedies. This he would teach, for he had won this knowledge through experience, the greatest teacher, and with much toil. He would teach it as he had learned it, and his lectures would be founded on works which he had composed concerning inward and external treatment, physic and surgery. Shortly afterwards, at the Feast of St. John, the students had a bonfire in front of the university. Paracelsus came out holding in his hands the Bible of Medicine, Avicenna's Canon, which he flung into the flames, saying, into St. John's fire, so that all misfortune may go into the air with the smoke. It was, as he explained afterwards, a symbolic act. What has perished must go to the fire. It is no longer fit for use. What is true and living, that the fire cannot burn. With abundant confidence in his own capacity, he proclaimed himself the legitimate monarch, the very Christ of medicine, you shall follow me, cried he, you, Avicenna, Galen, Rassus, Montagnana, Mesuis, you, gentlemen of Paris, Montpellier, Germany, Cologne, Vienna, and whomsoever the Rhine and Danube nourish, you who inhabit the isles of the sea, you, likewise, Dalmatians, Athenians, thou Arab, thou Greek, thou Jew, all shall follow me and the monarchy shall be mine. This first great revolt against the slavish authority of the schools had little immediate effect, largely on account of the personal vagaries of the reformer, but it made men think. Paracelsus stirred the pool as had not been done for fifteen centuries. Much more important is the relation of Paracelsus to the new chemical studies and their relation to practical medicine. Alchemy, he held, is to make neither gold nor silver. Its use is to make the supreme sciences and to direct them against disease. He recognized three basic substances, sulfur, mercury, and salt, which were the necessary ingredients of all bodies, organic or inorganic. They were the basis of the three principles out of which the archaeus, the spirit of nature, formed all bodies. He made important discoveries in chemistry, zinc, the various compounds of mercury, calomel, flowers of sulfur, among others, and he was a strong advocate of the use of preparations of iron and antimony. In practical pharmacy, he has perhaps had a greater reputation for the introduction of a tincture of opium, labdanum or laudanum with which he effected miraculous cures and the use of which he had probably learned in the east through paracelsus a great stimulus was given to the study of chemistry and pharmacy and he is the first of the modern iotrochemists in contradistinction to Galenic medicines, which were largely derived from the vegetable kingdom, from this time on we find in the literature references to spagoric medicines, and a spagorist was a Paracelsian who regarded chemistry as the basis of all medical knowledge. One cannot speak very warmly of the practical medical writings of Paracelsus, Gout, which may be taken as the disease upon which he had the greatest reputation, is very badly described, and yet he has one or two fruitful ideas singularly mixed with medieval astrology. But he has here and there very happy insights, as where he remarks, Nec praetor synovium loquum alium olum podagra occupat. In the tract on phlebotomy, I see nothing modern, and here again he is everywhere dominated by astrological ideas, sapiens dominatur astris. As a protagonist of occult philosophy, Paracelsus has had a more enduring reputation than as a physician. In estimating his position, there is the great difficulty referred to by Suthoff in determining which of the extant treatises are genuine. 
in the two volumes issued in English by Waite in 1894, there is much that is difficult to read and to appreciate from our modern standpoint. In the book Concerning Long Life, he confesses that his method and practice will not be intelligible to common persons, and that he writes only for those whose intelligence is above the average. To those fond of transcendental studies, they appeal and are perhaps intelligible. Everywhere one comes across shrewd remarks which prove that Paracelsus had a keen belief in the all-controlling powers of nature, and of man's capacity to make those powers operate for his own good. The wise man rules nature, not nature the wise man. The difference between the saint and the magus is that the one operates by means of God, and the other by means of nature. He had great faith in nature, and the light of nature, holding that man obtains from nature according as he believes. His theory of the three principles appears to have controlled his conception of everything relating to man, spiritually, mentally, and bodily, and his threefold genera of disease corresponded in some mysterious way with the three primary substances, salt, sulfur, and mercury. How far he was a believer in astrology, charms, and divination, it is not easy to say. From many of the writings in his collected works, one would gather, as I have already quoted, that he was a strong believer. On the other hand, in the Paramirum, he says, Stars control nothing in us, suggest nothing, incline to nothing, own nothing. They are free from us, and we are free from them. Stoddart, page 185. The Archaeus, not the stars, controls man's destiny. Good fortune comes from ability, and ability comes from the spirit. Archaeus. No one has held more firmly the dualistic conception of the healing art. There are two kinds of doctors, those who heal miraculously and those who heal through medicine. Only he who believes can work miracles. The physician has to accomplish that which God would have done miraculously, had there been faith enough in the sick man. Stoddart, page 194. He had the Hippocratic conception of the vis medicatrix naturae. No one keener since the days of the Greeks. Man is his own doctor and finds proper healing herbs in his own garden. The physician is in ourselves, in our own nature, are all things that we need. And speaking of wounds, with singular prescience, he says that the treatment should be defensive so that no contingency from without could hinder nature in her work. Stoddart, page 213. Paracelsus expresses the healing powers of nature by the word mumia, which he regarded as a sort of magnetic influence or force, and he believed that anyone possessing this could arrest or heal disease in others. As the lily breaks forth in invisible perfume, so healing influences may pass from an invisible body. Upon these views of Paracelsus was based the theory of the sympathetic cure of disease, which had an extraordinary vogue in the late 16th and 17th centuries, and which is not without its modern counterpart. In the next century, in Van Helmont, we meet with the Archaeus everywhere presiding, controlling and regulating the animate and inanimate bodies, working this time through agents, local ferments. The Rosicrucians had their direct inspiration from his writings, and such mystics as the English Rosicrucian flood were strong Paracelsians. The doctrine of contraries drawn from the old Greek philosophy, upon which a good deal of the treatment of Hippocrates and Galen was based, dryness expelled by moisture, cold by heat, etc., was opposed by Paracelsus in favor of a theory of similars, upon which the practice of homeopathy is based. This really arose from the primitive beliefs, to which I have already referred as leading to the use of eyebright in diseases of the eye, and cyclamen in diseases of the ear, because of its resemblance to that part. And the Egyptian organotherapy had the same basis, spleen would cure spleen, heart, heart, etc., 
In the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, these doctrines of sympathies and antipathies were much in vogue. A Scotchman, Sylvester Rattray, edited in the Theatrum Sympatheticum all the writings upon the sympathies and antipathies of man, with animal, vegetable, and mineral substances, and the whole art of physics was based on this principle. Upon this theory of mumia, or magnetic force, the sympathetic cure of disease was based. The weapon salve, the sympathetic ointment, and the famous powder of sympathy were the instruments through which it acted. The magnetic cure of wounds became the vogue. Van Helmont adopted these views in his famous treatise, De Magnetica Vulnerum Curatione, in which he asserted that cures were wrought through magnetic influence. How close they came to modern views of wound infection may be judged from the following. Upon the solution of unity in any part, the ambient air, repleted with various evaporations or aporeas of mixed bodies, especially such as are then suffering the act of putrefaction, violently invadeth the part, and thereupon impresseth an exotic miasm, or noxious diathesis, which disposeth the blood successively arriving at the wound to putrefaction by the intervention of fermentation. With his magnetic sympathy, Van Helmont expressed clearly the doctrine of immunity and the cure of disease by immune sera. For he who has once recovered from that disease hath not only obtained a pure balsamical blood, whereby for the future he is rendered free from any recidivation of the same evil, but also infallibly cures the same affection in his neighbor and by the mysterious power of magnetism transplants that balsam and conserving quality into the blood of another. He was rash enough to go further and say that the cures effected by the relics of the saints were also due to the same cause, a statement which led to a great discussion with the theologians and to Van Helmont's arrest for heresy, and small wonder when he makes such bold statements as let the divine inquire only concerning God, the naturalist concerning nature, and God in the production of miracles does for the most part walk hand in hand with nature. That wandering genius, Sir Kenelm Digby, did much to popularize this method of treatment by his lecture on the powder of sympathy. His powder was composed of copperas alone, or mixed with gum tragacanth, he regarded the cure as effected through the subtle influence of the sympathetic spirits, or, as Highmore says, by atomical energy wrought at a distance, and the remedy could be applied to the wound itself, or to a cloth soaked in the blood or secretions, or to the weapon that caused the wound. One factor leading to success may have been that in the directions which Digby gave for treating the wound. In the celebrated case of James Howell, for instance, it was to be let alone and kept clean. The practice is alluded to very frequently by the poets. In the Lay of the Last Minstrel, we find the following. But she has ta'en the broken lance, and washed it from the clotted gore, and salved the splinter o'er and o'er, William of Deloraine, in trance, whene'er she turned it round and round, twisted as if she'd galled his wound, then to her maidens she did say, that he should be whole, man and sound. And in Dryden's Tempest, Ariel says, Anoint the sword which pierced him with the weapon salve, and wrap it close from air till I have time to visit him again. From Van Helmont comes the famous story of the new nose that dropped off in sympathy with the dead arm from which it was taken, and the source of the famous lines of Hudibras. As I have not seen the original story quoted of late years, it may be worth while to give it. A certain inhabitant of Bruxelles, in a combat, had his nose mowed off, addressed himself to Tagliacozzus, a famous chirurgian, living in Bononia, that he might procure a new one, 
and when he feared the incision of his own arm, he hired a porter to admit it, out of whose arm, having first given the reward agreed upon, at length he digged a new nose. About thirteen months after his return to his own country, on a sudden the engrafted nose grew cold, putrefied, and within few days drops off. To those of his friends that were curious in the exploration of the cause of this unexpected misfortune, it was discovered that the porter expired near about the same punctilio of time, wherein the nose grew frigid and cadaverous. There are at Bruxelles yet surviving some of good repute that were eyewitnesses of these occurrences. Equally, in the history of science and of medicine, 1542 is a starred year, marked by a revolution in our knowledge alike of macrocosm and microcosm. In Frauenburg, the town physician and a canon, now nearing the palmist limit and his end, had sent to the press the studies of a lifetime, De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium. It was no new thought, no new demonstration, that Copernicus thus gave to his generation. Centuries before, men of the keenest scientific minds from Pythagoras on had worked out a heliocentric theory, fully promulgated by Aristarchus, and very generally accepted by the brilliant investigators of the Alexandrian school. But in the long interval lapped in Oriental lethargy, Man had been content to acknowledge that the heavens declare the glory of God, and that the firmament sheweth his handiwork. There had been great astronomers before Copernicus. In the fifteenth century Nicholas of Cusa and Regio Montanus had hinted at the heliocentric theory. But 1512 marks an epoch in the history of science, since for all time Copernicus put the problem in a way that compelled acquiescence. Nor did Copernicus announce a truth perfect and complete, not to be modified, but there were many contradictions and lacunae which the work of subsequent observers had to reconcile and fill up. For long years Copernicus had brooded over the great thoughts which his careful observation had compelled. We can imagine the touching scene in the little town when his friend Osiander brought the first copy of the precious volume hot from the press, a well enough printed book. Already on his deathbed, stricken with a long illness, the old man must have had doubts how his work would be received though years before Pope Clement the Seventh had sent him encouraging words. Fortunately, death saved him from the rending, which is the portion of so many innovators and discoverers. His great contemporary reformer, Luther, expressed the view of the day when he said the fool will turn topsy-turvy the whole art of astronomy, but the Bible says that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, not the earth. The scholarly Melanchthon, himself an astronomer, thought the book so godless that he recommended its suppression, Daneman, Grundris. The church was too much involved in the Ptolemaic system to accept any change, and it was not until 1822 that the works of Copernicus were removed from the index. End of section 19 Section 20 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 20. Chapter 4. The Renaissance and the Rise of Anatomy and Physiology. Vesalius. The same year, 1542, saw a very different picture in the far-famed city of Padua, nursery of the arts. The central figure was a man not yet in the prime of life, and justly full of its pride, as you may see from his portrait. Like Aristotle and Hippocrates, 
cradled and nurtured in an Esculapian family, Vesalius was from his childhood a student of nature, and was now a wandering scholar, far from his Belgian home but in Italy he had found what neither Louvain nor Paris could give, freedom in his studies and golden opportunities for research in anatomy. What an impression he must have made on the student body at Padua may be judged from the fact that shortly after his graduation in December 1537, at the age of 24, he was elected to the chair of anatomy and surgery. Two things favored him, an insatiate desire to see and handle for himself the parts of the human frame, and an opportunity, such as had never before been offered to the teacher, to obtain material for the study of human anatomy. Learned with all the learning of the Grecians and of the Arabians, Vesalius grasped, as no modern before him had done, the cardinal fact that to know the human machine and its working, it is necessary first to know its parts, its fabric. To appreciate the work of this great man, we must go back in a brief review of the growth of the study of anatomy. Among the Greeks, only the Alexandrians knew human anatomy. What their knowledge was, we know at second hand, but the evidence is plain that they knew a great deal. Galen's anatomy was first class and was based on the Alexandrians and on his study of the ape and the pig. We have already noted how much superior was his osteology to that of Mundinus. Between the Alexandrians and the early days of the school of Salernum, we have no record of systematic dissections of the human body. It is even doubtful if these were permitted at Salernum. Neuberger states that the instructions of Frederick II as to dissections were merely nominal. How atrocious was the anatomy of the early Middle Ages may be gathered from the cuts in the works of Henri de Monville. In the Bodleian Library is a remarkable Latin anatomical treatise of the late 13th century of English provenance, one illustration from which will suffice to show the ignorance of the author. Mundinus of Bologna, one of the first men in the Middle Ages to study anatomy from the subject, was under the strong domination of the Arabians, from whom he appeared to have received a very imperfect Galenic anatomy. From this date we meet with occasional dissections at various schools, but we have seen that in the elaborate curriculum of the University of Padua, in the middle of the 15th century, there was no provision for the study of the subject. Even well into the 16th century, dissections were not common, and the old practice was followed of holding a professorial discourse while the butcher or barber surgeon opened the cavities of the body. A member of the famous Basil family of physicians, Felix Plater, has left us in his autobiography details of the dissections he witnessed at Montpellier between November 14, 1552 and January 10, 1557, only eleven in number. How difficult it was at that time to get subjects is shown by the risks they ran in body-snatching expeditions, of which he records three. And now came the real maker of modern anatomy. Andreas Vesalius had a good start in life. Of a family long associated with the profession, his father occupied the position of apothecary to Charles V, whom he accompanied on his journeys and campaigns. Trained at Louvain, he had, from his earliest youth, an ardent desire to dissect and cut up mice and rats, and even cats and dogs. To Paris, the strong school of the period, he went in 1533 and studied under two men of great renown, Jacob Silvius and Ginterius. Both were strong Galenists and regarded the master as an infallible authority. 
he had as a fellow pro sector under the latter the unfortunate servetus the story of his troubles and trials in getting bones and subjects you may read in roth's life many interesting biographical details are also to be found in his own writings he returned for a time to louvain and here he published his first book a commentary on the almanzar of raises in 1537. Finding it difficult, either in Paris or Louvain, to pursue his anatomical studies, he decided to go to Italy, where, at Venice and Padua, the opportunities were greater. At Venice, he attended the practice of a hospital, now a barracks, which was in charge of the Theatiner Order. I show you a photograph of the building taken last year and here a strange destiny brought two men together. In 1537, another pilgrim was working in Venice, waiting to be joined by his six disciples. After long years of probation, Ignatius Loyola was ready to start on the conquest of a very different world. Devoted to the sick and to the poor, he attached himself to the Theatiner Order, and in the wards of the hospital and the quadrangle, the fiery dark-eyed little Basque must frequently have come into contact with the sturdy young Belgian, busy with his clinical studies and his anatomy. Both were to achieve phenomenal success, the one in a few years to revolutionize anatomy, the other within twenty years to be the controller of universities, the counselor of kings, and the founder of the most famous order in the Roman Catholic Church. It was in this hospital that Vesalius made observations on the China route, on which he published a monograph in 1547. The Paduan school was close to Venice and associated with it, so that the young student had probably many opportunities of going to and fro. On the 6th of December, 1537, before he had reached his 24th year, and shortly after taking his degree, he was elected to the chair of surgery and anatomy at Padua. The task Vesalius set himself to accomplish was to give an accurate description of all the parts of the human body with proper illustrations. He must have had abundant material, more probably than any teacher before him had ever had at his disposal. We do not know where he conducted his dissections, as the old amphitheater has disappeared, but it must have been very different from the tiny one put up by his successor, Fabricius, in 1594. Possibly it was only a temporary building, for he says in the second edition of the Fabrica, that he had a splendid lecture theatre, which accommodated more than five hundred spectators. With Vesalius disappeared the old didactic method of teaching anatomy. He did his own dissections, made his own preparations, and, when human subjects were scarce, employed dogs, pigs, or cats, and occasionally a monkey. For five years he taught and worked at Padua. He is known to have given public demonstrations in Bologna and elsewhere. In the China route, he remarks that he once taught in three universities in one year. The first fruit of his work is of great importance in connection with the evolution of his knowledge. In 1538, he published six anatomical tables issued apparently in single leaves. Of the famous Tabulae Anatomicae, only two copies are known, one in the San Marco Library, Venice, and the other in the possession of Sir John Sterling Maxwell, whose father had it reproduced in facsimile, thirty copies only, in 1874. Some of the figures were drawn by Vesalius himself, and some are from the pencil of his friend and countryman, Stefan van Calsar. Those plates were extensively pirated, about this time he also edited, for the Gianti, some of the anatomical works of Galen. We know very little of his private life at Padua. His most important colleague in the faculty was the famous Montanus, professor of medicine. 
Among his students and associates was the Englishman Caius, who lived in the same house with him. When the output is considered, he cannot have had much spare time at Padua. He did not create human anatomy. That had been done by the Alexandrians. But he studied it in so orderly and thorough a manner that for the first time in history it could be presented in a way that explained the entire structure of the human body. Early in 1542 the manuscript was ready. The drawings had been made with infinite care. The blocks for the figures had been cut and in September he wrote to Oporinus, urging that the greatest pains should be taken with the book, that the paper should be strong and of equal thickness, the workmen chosen for their skill, and that every detail of the pictures must be distinctly visible. He writes with the confidence of a man who realized the significance of the work he had done. It is difficult to speak in terms of moderation of the fabrica, to appreciate its relative value, one must compare it with the other anatomical works of the period. And for this purpose I put before you two figures from a textbook on the subject that was available for students during the first half of the 16th century. In the figures and text of the Fabrica, we have anatomy as we know it, and let us be honest and say, too, largely as Galen knew it. Time will not allow me to go into the question of the relations of these two great anatomists, but we must remember that at this period Galen ruled supreme and was regarded in the schools as infallible. And now, after five years of incessant labor, Vesalius was prepared to leave his much-loved Padua and his devoted students. He had accomplished an extraordinary work, he knew, I feel sure, what he had done. He knew that the manuscript contained something that the world had not seen since the great Pergamenian sent the rolls of his Manual of Anatomy among his friends, too precious to entrust to any printer but the best, and the best in the middle of the 16th century was Transalpine. He was preparing to go north with a precious burden. We can picture the youthful teacher. He was but twenty-eight, among students in a university which they themselves controlled, some of them perhaps the very men who five years before had elected him, at the last meeting with his class, perhaps giving a final demonstration of the woodcuts, which were of an accuracy and beauty never seen before by students' eyes, and reading his introduction. There would be sad hearts at the parting, for never had anyone taught anatomy as he had taught it. No one had ever known anatomy as he knew it. But the strong, confident look was on his face, and with the courage of youth and sure of the future, he would picture a happy return to attack new and untried problems. Little did he dream that his happy days as student and teacher were finished, that his work as an anatomist was over, that the most brilliant and epoch-making part of his career as a professor was a thing of the past. A year or more was spent at Basel with his friend Oporinus, supervising the printing of the great work, which appeared in 1543 with the title De Humani Corporis Fabrica. The worth of a book, as of a man, must be judged by results, and so judged, the Fabrica is one of the great books of the world, and would come in any century of volumes which embraced the richest harvest of the human mind. In medicine, it represents the full flower of the Renaissance. As a book, it is a sumptuous tome, a worthy setting of his jewel, paper, type, and illustration to match, as you may see for yourselves in this folio the chef d'oeuvre of any medical library. In every section, Vesalius enlarged and corrected the work of Galen. Into the details we need not enter. They are all given in Roth's monograph, and it is a chapter of ancient history not specially illuminating. Never did a great piece of literary work have a better setting. Vesalius must have had a keen appreciation of the artistic side of the art of printing. 
and he must also have realized the fact that the masters of the art had by this time moved north of the Alps. While superintending the printing of the precious work in the winter of 1542-43 to 43 in Basel, Vesalius prepared for the medical school a skeleton from the body of an executed man, which is probably the earliest preparation of the kind in Europe. How little anatomy had been studied at the period may be judged from that fact that there had been no dissection at Basel since 1531. The specimen is now in the Vesalianum, Basel, of which I show you a picture taken by Dr. Harvey Cushing. From the typographical standpoint, no more superb volume on anatomy has been issued from any press except indeed the second edition, issued in 1555. The paper is, as Vesalius directed, strong and good, but it is not, as he asked, always of equal thickness. As a rule, it is thick and heavy, but there are copies on a good paper of a much lighter quality. The illustrations drawn by his friend and fellow countryman Van Kalsar are very much in advance of anything previously seen except those of Leonardo. The title page, one of the most celebrated pictures in the history of medicine, shows Vesalius in a large amphitheater, an imaginary one of the artist, I am afraid, dissecting a female subject. He is demonstrating the abdomen to a group of students about the table, but standing in the auditorium are elderly citizens and even women. One student is reading from an open book. There is a monkey on one side of the picture and a dog on the other. Above the picture on a shield are the three weasels, the arms of Vesal. The reproduction which I show you here is from the epitome, a smaller work issued before the fabrica, with rather larger plates, two of which represent nude human bodies and are not reproduced in the great work. The freshest and most beautiful copy is the one on vellum, which formerly belonged to Dr. Mead, now in the British Museum, and from it this picture was taken. One of the most interesting features of the book are the full-page illustrations of the anatomy of the arteries, veins, and nerves. They had not in those days the art of making corrosion preparations, but they could in some way dissect to their finest ramifications the arteries, veins, and nerves, which were then spread on boards and dried. Several such preparations are now at the College of Physicians in London, brought from Padua by Harvey. The plates of the muscles are remarkably good, more correct, though not better perhaps on the whole, than some of Leonardo's. Vesalius had no idea of a general circulation, though he had escaped from the domination of the great Pergamenian in anatomy, he was still his follower in physiology. The two figures annexed, taking from one of the two existing copies of the Tabulae Anatomica, are unique in anatomical illustration and are of special value as illustrating the notion of the vascular system that prevailed until Harvey's day. I have already called your attention to Galen's view of the two separate systems, one containing the coarse venous blood for the general nutrition of the body, the other, the arterial, full of a thinner, warmer blood, with which were distributed the vital spirits and the vital heat. The veins had their origin in the liver. The superior vena cava communicated with the right heart, and, as Galen taught, some blood was distributed to the lungs. But the two systems were closed, though Galen believed there was a communication at the periphery between the arteries and veins. Vesalius accepted Galen's view that there is some communication between the venous and arterial systems through pores in the septum of the ventricles, though he had his doubts, and in the second edition of his book, 1555, says that in spite of the authority of the Prince of Physicians, he cannot see how the smallest quantity of blood could be transmitted through so dense a muscular septum. Two years before this, 1553, 
his old fellow student Michael Servetus had in his Christianisme Restitutio anatomical touch with one another. The publication of the Fabrica shook the medical world to its foundations. Galen ruled supreme in the schools. To doubt him in the least particular roused the same kind of feeling as did doubts on the verbal inspiration of the scriptures fifty years ago. His old teachers in Paris were up in arms. Silvius Nostre Aetatus Medicorum Decus, as Vesalius calls him, wrote furious letters, and later spoke of him as a madman, Vesenas. The younger men were with him, and he had many friends, but he had aroused a roaring tide of detraction, against which he protested a few years later in his work on the China route, which is full of details about the fabrica. In a fit of temper he threw his notes on Galen and other manuscripts in the fire. No sadder page exists in medical writings than the one in which Vesalius tells of the burning of his books and manuscripts. It is here reproduced and translated. His life for a couple of years is not easy to follow, but we know that in 1546 he took service with Charles V as his body physician, and the greatest anatomist of his age was lost in the wanderings of court and campaigns. He became an active practitioner, a distinguished surgeon, much consulted by his colleagues, and there are references to many of his cases, the most important of which are to internal aneurysms, which he was one of the first to recognize. In 1555 he brought out the second edition of the Fabrica, an even more sumptuous volume than the first. All these impediments I made light of, for I was too young to seek gain by my art, and I was sustained by my eager desire to learn, and to promote the studies in which I shared. I say nothing of my diligence in anatomizing. Those who attended my lectures in Italy know how I spent three whole weeks over a single public dissection. But consider that in one year I once taught in three different universities. If I had put off the task of writing till this time, if I were now just beginning to digest my materials, students would not have had the use of my anatomical labors, which posterity may or may not judge superior to the rechauffs formerly in use, whether of Messua, of Gatinaria, of some Stephanus or other on the differences, causes, and symptoms of diseases, or, lastly, of a part of servitors pharmacopoeia. As to my notes, which had grown into a huge volume, they were all destroyed by me, and on the same day there similarly perished the whole of my paraphrase on the ten books of Razes to King Almansor, which had been composed by me with far more care than the one which is prefaced to the ninth book. With these also went the books of some author or other on the formulae and preparation of medicines, to which I had added much matter of my own, which I judged to be not without utility. And the same fate overtook all the books of Galen, which I had used in learning anatomy, and which I had liberally disfigured in the usual fashion. I was on the point of leaving Italy and going to court, those physicians you know of had made to the emperor and to the nobles a most unfavorable report of my books and of all that is published nowadays for the promotion of study. I therefore burnt all these works that I have mentioned, thinking at the same time that it would be an easy matter to abstain from writing for the future. I must show that I have since repented more than once of my impatience, and regretted that I did not take the advice of the friends who were then with me. There is no such pathetic tragedy in the history of our profession. Before the age of thirty, Vesalius had effected a revolution in anatomy. He became the valued physician of the greatest court of Europe. But call no man happy till he is dead. A mystery surrounds his last days. 
The story is that he had obtained permission to perform a post-mortem examination on the body of a young Spanish nobleman whom he had attended. When the body was opened, the spectators, to their horror, saw the heart beating, and there were signs of life. Accused, so it is said, by the Inquisition of murder, and also of general impiety, he only escaped through the intervention of the king, with the condition that he make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. In carrying this out, in 1564, he was wrecked on the island of Zante, where he died of a fever or of exhaustion in the fiftieth year of his age. To the North American Review, November 1902, Edith Wharton contributed a poem on Vesalius in Zante, in which she pictures his life so full of accomplishment, so full of regrets, regrets accentuated by the receipt of an anatomical treatise by Fallopius, the successor to the chair in Padua. She makes him say, There are two ways of spreading light to be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. I let my wick burn out. There yet remains to spread an answering surface to the flame that others kindle. But between Mundinus and Vesalius, anatomy had been studied by a group of men to whom I must, in passing, pay a tribute. The great artists Raphael, Michelangelo, and Albrecht Dürer were keen students of the human form. There is an anatomical sketch by Michelangelo in the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, which I here reproduce. Durer's famous work on human proportion, published in 1528, contains excellent figures, but no sketches of dissections. But greater than any of these, and antedating them, is Leonardo da Vinci, the one universal genius in whom the new spirit was incarnate the Moses who alone among his contemporaries saw the promised land. How far Leonardo was indebted to his friend and fellow student Della Torre at Pavia we do not know, nor does it matter in face of the indubitable fact that in the many anatomical sketches from his hand we have the first accurate representation of the structure of the body. Glance at the three figures of the spine which I have had photographed side by side, one from Leonardo, one from Vesalius, and the other from Van Dyck Carter, who did the drawings in Gray's Anatomy, 1st edition, 1856. They are all of the same type, scientific, anatomical drawings, and that of Leonardo was done fifty years before Vesalius. Compare, too, this figure of the bones of the foot with a similar one from Vesalius. Insatiate in experiment, intellectually as greedy as Aristotle, painter, poet, sculptor, engineer, architect, mathematician, chemist, botanist, aeronaut, musician, and withal a dreamer and mystic. Full accomplishment in any one department was not for him. A passionate desire for a mastery of nature's secrets made him a fierce thing, replete with too much rage. But for us a record remains. Leonardo was the first of modern anatomists, and fifty years later, into the breach he made, Vesalius entered. End of Section 20 Section 21 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 21. Chapter 4. Renaissance and Rise of Anatomy and Physiology, Harvey Let us return to Padua about the year 1600. Vesalius, who made the school the most famous anatomical center in Europe, was succeeded by Fallopius, one of the best-known names in anatomy, at whose death an unsuccessful attempt was made to get Vesalius back. 
He was succeeded in 1565 by a remarkable man, Fabricius, who usually bears the added name of Aqua Pendente, from the town of his birth. A worthy follower of Vesalius. In 1594, in the thirtieth year of his professorate, he built at his own expense a new anatomical amphitheater, which still exists in the university buildings. It is a small, high-pitched room with six standing rows for auditors rising abruptly one above the other. The arena is not much more than large enough for the dissecting table, which, by a lift, could be brought up from a preparing room below. The study of anatomy at Padua must have declined since the days of Vesalius, if this tiny amphitheater held all its students. Nonetheless, it is probably the oldest existing anatomical lecture room, and for us it has a very special significance. Early in his anatomical studies, Fabricius had demonstrated the valves in the veins. I show you here two figures, the first as far as I know in which these structures are depicted. It does not concern us who first discovered them. They had doubtless been seen before, but Fabricius first recognized them as general structures in the venous system, and he called them little doors, osteola. The quadrangle of the university building at Padua is surrounded by beautiful arcades, the walls and ceilings of which are everywhere covered with the stemata, or shields, of former students, many of them brilliantly painted. Standing in the arcade on the side of the quad, opposite the entrance, if one looks on the ceiling immediately above the capital of the second column, to the left, there is seen the stemma which appears as a tailpiece to this chapter, put up by a young Englishman, William Harvey, who had been a student at Padua for four years. He belonged to the Natio Anglica, of which he was conciliarius, and took his degree in 1602. Doubtless he had repeatedly seen Fabricius demonstrate the valves of the veins, and he may indeed, as a senior student, have helped in making the very dissections from which the drawings were taken for Fabricius' work, De Venerem Osteolus, 1603. If one may judge from the character of the teacher's work, the sort of instruction the student receives, Harvey must have had splendid training in anatomy. While he was at Padua, the great work of Fabricius, Division Vosse et Auditu, 1600, was published. Then the Tractatus de Oculo Visuscu Organo, 1601. And in the last year of his residence, Fabricius must have been busy with his studies on the valves of the veins and with his embryology, which appeared in 1604. Late in life, Harvey told Boyle that it was the position of the valves of the veins that induced him to think of a circulation. Harvey returned to England trained by the best anatomist of his day. In London he became attached to the College of Physicians, and taking his degree at Cambridge, he began the practice of medicine. He was elected a fellow of the college in 1607, and physician to St. Bartholomew's Hospital in 1609. In 1615 he was appointed Lumleian Lecturer to the College of Physicians, and his duties were to hold certain public anatomies, as they were called, or lectures. We know little or nothing of what Harvey had been doing other than his routine work in the care of the patients at St. Bartholomew's. It was not until April 1616 that his lectures began. Chance has preserved us the notes of this first course, the M.S., is now in the British Museum and was published in facsimile by the college in 1886. The second day lecture, April 17, was concerned with a description of the organs of the thorax, and after a discussion on the structure and action of the heart come the lines, W.H. Constat per fabricum cordis sanguinem, per pulmonis in aortum perpetuo transferi, as by two clacks of a water bellows to raise water, Constat per legatorium transitum sanguinis, ab arterius ad venus, Undo perpetuum sanguinis motum, in circulo fiere posicordis. The illustration will give one an idea of the extraordinarily crabbed hand in which the notes are written, but it is worth to see the original, 
for here is the first occasion upon which is laid down in clear and unequivocal words that the blood circulates. The lecture gave evidence of a skilled anatomist, well versed in the literature from Aristotle to Fabricius. In the MS of the thorax, or as he calls it, the parlor lecture, there are about a hundred references to some twenty authors. The remarkable thing is that although those lectures were repeated year by year, we have no evidence that they made any impression upon Harvey's contemporaries, so far at least as to excite discussions that led to publication. It was not until twelve years later, 1628, that Harvey published in Frankfurt a small quarto volume of seventy-four pages, De Motu Cordis, in comparison with the sumptuous fabrica of Vesalius, this is a trifling booklet, but if not its equal in bulk or typographical beauty, it is in fact very poorly printed, it is its counterpart in physiology, and did for that science what Vesalius had done for anatomy, though not in the same way. The experimental spirit was abroad in the land, and as a student at Padua, Harvey must have had many opportunities of learning the technique of vivisection. But no one before his day had attempted an elaborate piece of experimental work, deliberately planned to solve a problem relating to the most important single function of the body. Herein lies the special merit of his work, from every page of which there breathes the modern spirit. To him, as Vesalius before him, the current views of the movements of the blood were unsatisfactory, more particularly the movements of the heart and arteries, which were regarded as an active expansion by which they were filled with blood, like bellows with air. The question of the transmission of blood through the thick septum, and the transference of air and blood from the lungs to the heart, were secrets which he was desirous of searching out by means of experiment. One or two special points in the work may be referred to as illustrating his method. He undertook the first movements of the heart, a task so truly arduous and so full of difficulties that he was almost to think with Fractistorius that the movement of the heart was only to be comprehended by God. But after many difficulties he made the following statements. First, that the heart is erected and raises itself up into an apex, and at this time strikes against the breast and the pulse is felt externally. Secondly, that it is contracted every way, but more so at the sides and thirdly, that grasped in the hand it was felt to become harder at the time of its motion, from all of which actions Harvey drew the very natural conclusion that the activity of the heart consisted in a contraction of its fibers, by which it expelled blood from the ventricles. These were the first four fundamental facts, which really opened the way for the discovery of the circulation, as it did away with the belief that the heart, in its motion, attracts blood into the ventricles, stating on the contrary that by its contraction it expelled the blood and only received it during its period of repose or relaxation. Then he proceeded to study the action of the arteries and showed that their period of diastole or expansion corresponded with the systole or contraction of the heart and that the arterial pulse follows the force, frequency, and rhythm of the ventricle and is in fact dependent on it. Here was a new fact, that the pulsation in the arteries was nothing else than the impulse of the blood within them. Chapter 4, in which he describes the movements of the auricles and ventricles, is a model of accurate description, to which little has since been added. It is interesting to note that he mentions what is probably auricular fibrillation. He says, after the heart had ceased pulsating, an undulation or palpitation remained in the blood itself, which was contained in the right oracle, this being observed so long as it was imbued with heat and spirit. He recognized, too, the importance of the oracles as the first to move and the last to die. The accuracy and vividness of Harvey's description of the motion of the heart have been appreciated by generations of physiologists. Having grasped this first essential fact that the heart was an organ for the propulsion of blood, he takes up in chapters 6 and 7 the question of the conveyance of the blood from the right side of the heart to the left, 
Galen had already insisted that some blood passed from the right ventricle to the lungs, enough for their nutrition. But Harvey points out, with Columbo, that from the arrangement of the valves there could be no other view other than that with each impulse of the heart, blood passes from the right ventricle to the lungs, and so to the left side of the heart. How it passed through the lungs was a problem, probably by a continuous transudation. In chapters 8 and 9 he deals with the amount of blood passing through the heart from the veins to the arteries. Let me quote here what he says, as it is of cardinal import. But what remains to be said upon the quantity and source of the blood which thus passes is of a character so novel and unheard of that I not only fear injury to myself from the envy of a few, but I tremble lest I have mankind at large for my enemies. So much doth want and custom become a second nature. Doctrine once sown strikes deeply its root, and respect for antiquity influences all men. Still the die is cast, and my trust is in my love of truth, and the candor of cultivated minds. Then he goes on to say, I began to think whether there might not be a movement, as it were, in a circle. Now this I afterwards found to be true, and I finally saw that the blood, forced by the action of the left ventricle into the arteries, was distributed to the body at large, and its several parts in the same manner as it is sent through the lungs, impelled by the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, and that it then passed through the veins and along the vena cava, and so round to the left ventricle, in the manner already indicated. The experiments dealing with the transmission of blood in the veins are very accurate, and he uses the old experiment that Fabricius had employed to show the valves, to demonstrate that the blood in the veins flows towards the heart. For the first time a proper explanation of the action of the valves is given. Harvey had no appreciation of how the arteries and veins communicated with each other. Galen, you may remember, recognized that there were anastomoses, but Harvey preferred the idea of filtration. The de motu cordis constitutes a unique piece of work in the history of medicine. Nothing of the same type had appeared before. It is a thoroughly sensible, scientific study of a definite problem, the solution of which was arrived through the combination of accurate observation and ingenious experiment. Much misunderstanding has arisen in connection with Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood. He did not discover that the blood moved. That was known to Aristotle and to Galen, from both of whom I have given quotations which indicate clearly they knew of its movement. But at the time of Harvey, not a single anatomist had escaped from the domination of Galen's views. Both Servetus and Columbo knew of the pulmonary circulation, which was described by the former in very accurate terms. Cisalpinus, a great name in anatomy and botany, for whom is claimed the discovery of the circulation, only expressed the accepted doctrines in the following oft-quoted phrase. We will now consider how the attraction of aliment and the process of nutrition takes place in plants, for in animals we see the aliment brought through the veins to the heart, as to a laboratory of innate heat, and after receiving there its final perfection, distributed through the arteries to the body at large, by the agency of the spirits produced from the same element in the heart. There is nothing in this but Galen's view, and Cisalpinus believed, as did all his contemporaries, that the blood was distributed through the body by the vena cava, and its branches for the nourishment of all its parts. To those who have any doubts as to Harvey's position in this matter, I would recommend the reading of the De Motu Cordis itself, then the various passages relating to the circulation from Aristotle to Vesalius. Many of those can be found in the admirable works of Dalton, Florence, Richet, and Curtis. In my Harveyan oration for 1906, I have dealt specially with the reception of the new views, and have shown how long it was before the reverence for Galen allowed of their acceptance. The University of Paris opposed the circulation of the blood for more than half a century, after the appearance of de motu cordis. To summarize, until the 17th century there were believed to be two closed systems in the circulation, 
the natural containing venous blood had its origin in the liver from which as from a fountain the blood continually ebbed and flowed for the nourishment of the body the vital containing another blood and the spirits ebbed and flowed from the heart distributing heat and life to all parts like a bellows the lungs fanned and cooled this vital blood here and there we find glimmering conceptions of a communication between these systems, but practically all teachers believe that the only one of importance was through small pores in the wall separating the two sides of the heart. Observation, merely looking at and thinking about things, had done all that was possible, and further progress had to await the introduction of a new method, viz. experiment. Galen, it is true, had used this means to show that the arteries of the body contained blood and not air. The day had come when men were no longer content with accurate description and with finely spun theories and dreams. It was reserved for the immortal Harvey to put into practice the experimental method by which he demonstrated conclusively that the blood moved in a circle. The de motu cordis marks the final break of the modern spirit with the old traditions. It took long for men to realize the value of this inventum mirabile, used so effectively by the Alexandrians, by Galen. Indeed, its full value has only been appreciated within the past century. Let me quote a paragraph from my Harveian oration. To the age of the hearer, in which men had heard and heard only, had succeeded the age of the eye, in which men had seen and been content only to see. But at last came the age of the hand, the thinking, devising, planning hand, the hand as an instrument of the mind, now reintroduced into the world in a modest little monograph, from which we may date the beginning of experimental medicine. Harvey caught the experimental spirit in Italy, with brain, eye, and hand as his only aid, but now an era opened in which medicine was to derive an enormous impetus from the discovery of instruments of precision. The new period in the development of the natural sciences, which reached its height in the work of such men as Galileo, Gilbert, and Kepler, is chiefly characterized by the invention of very important instruments for aiding and intensifying the perceptions of the senses, by means which was gained a much deeper insight into the phenomena than had hitherto been possible. Such instruments, as the earlier ages possessed, were little more than primitive handmade tools. Now we find a considerable number of scientifically made instruments deliberately planned for the purposes of special research, and, as it were, on the threshold of the period stand two of the most important, the compound microscope and the telescope. The former was invented about 1590, and the latter about 1608. It was a fellow professor of the great genius Galileo who attempted to put into practice the experimental science of his friend. With Sanctorius began the studies of temperature, respiration, and the physics of the circulation. The memory of this great investigator has not been helped by the English edition of his De Statica Medicina, not his best work, with a frontispiece showing the author in his dietetic balance. Full justice has been done to him by Dr. Weir Mitchell in an address as President of the Congress of Physicians and Surgeons, 1891. Sanctorius worked with the pulsologue, devised for him by Galileo, with which he made observations on the pulse. He is said to have been the first to put in use the clinical thermometer. His experiments on insensible perspiration mark him as one of the first modern physiologists. But neither Sanctorius nor Harvey had the immediate influence upon their contemporaries which the novel and stimulating character of their work justified. Harvey's great contemporary, Bacon, although he lost his life in making a cold storage experiment, did not really appreciate the enormous importance of experimental science. He looked very coldly upon Harvey's work. It was a philosopher of another kidney, René Descartes, who did more than anyone else to help men realize the value of the better way which Harvey had pointed out. That the beginning of wisdom was in doubt, not in authority, was a novel doctrine in the world. But Descartes was no armchair philosopher, 
and his strong advocacy and practice of experimentation had a profound influence in directing men to la nouvelle méthode he brought the human body the earthly machine as he calls it into the sphere of mechanics and physics and he wrote the first textbook of physiology de l'homme locke too became the spokesman of the new questioning spirit and before the close of the seventeenth century experimental research became all the mode richard lower hook and hales were probably more influenced by descartes than harvey and they made notable contributions to experimental physiology in england borelli author of the famous work on the motion of animals rome sixteen eighty to sixteen eighty one brought to the study of the action of muscles a profound knowledge of physics and mathematics and really founded the mechanical or iatro mechanical school the literature and the language of medicine became that of physics and mechanics wheels and pulleys wedges levers screws cords canals cisterns sieves and strainers with angles cylinders celerity percussion and resistance were among the words that now came into use in medical literature Withington quotes a good example in a description by Pitcairn, the Scot who was professor of medicine at Leiden at the end of the 17th century. Life is the circulation of the blood. Health is its free and painless circulation. Disease is an abnormal motion of the blood, either general or local. Like the English school generally, he is far more exclusively mechanical than are the Italians, and will hear nothing of ferments or acids, even in digestion. This, he declares, is a purely mechanical process due to heat and pressure, the wonderful effects of which may be seen in Papin's recently invented digester. That the stomach is fully able to comminute the food may be proved by the following calculation. Borelli estimates the power of the flexors of the thumb at 3,720 pounds, their average weight being 122 grains. Now the average weight of the stomach is 8 ounces, therefore it can develop a force of 117,088 pounds, and this may be further assisted by the diaphragm and abdominal muscles, the power of which, estimated in the same way, equals 461,219 pounds. Will may Pitcairn add that this force is not inferior to that of any millstone? Paracelsus gave an extraordinary stimulus to the study of chemistry, and more than anyone else he put the old alchemy on modern lines. I have already quoted his sane remark that its chief service is in seeking remedies. But there is another side to this question. If, as seems fairly certain, the Basel Valentine, whose writings were supposed to have inspired Paracelsus, was a hoax, and his works were made up in great part from the writing of Paracelsus, then to our medical luther and not to the mythical benedictine monk must be attributed a great revival in the search for the philosopher's stone for the elixir of life for a universal medicine for the perpetuum mobile and for an arum potabile i reproduce almost at random a page from the fifth and last part of the last will and testament of basil valentine london 1657 from which you may judge the chemical spirit of the time out of the mystic doctrines of paracelsus arose the famous brothers of the rosy cross the brotherhood was possessed of the deepest knowledge and science the transmutation of metals the perpetuum mobile and the universal medicine were among their secrets they were free from sickness and suffering during their lifetime though subject finally to death a school of a more rational kind followed directly upon the work of Paracelsus, in which the first man of any importance was Van Helmont. The Paracelsian Archeus was the presiding spirit in living creatures, and worked through special local ferments, by which the functions of the organs were controlled. Disease of any part represents a strike on the part of the local Archeus, who refuses to work. Though full of fanciful ideas, Van Helmont had the experimental spirit and was the first chemist to discover the diversity of gases. Like his teacher, he was in revolt against the faculty, and he has bitter things to say of physicians. He got into trouble with the church about the magnetic cure of wounds, 
as no fewer than twenty-seven propositions incompatible with the Catholic faith were found in his pamphlet, Ferguson. The Philosophus per Ignem, Toparcha in Merode, Royenborg, as he is styled in certain of his writings, is not an easy man to tackle. I show the title page of the Ortus Medicinae, the collection of his works by his son. As with the pages of Paracelsus, there are many gems to be dug out. The counterblast against bleeding was a useful protest, and to deny in toto its utility in fever required courage, a quality never lacking in the father of modern chemistry, as he has been called. A man of a very different type, a learned academic, a professor of European renown, was Daniel Sennert of Wittenberg, the first to introduce the systematic teaching of chemistry into the curriculum, and who tried to harmonize the Galenists and the Paracelsians. Franciscus Silvius, a disciple of Van Helmont, established the first chemical laboratory in Europe at Leiden, and to him is due the introduction of modern clinical teaching. In 1664 he writes, I have led my pupils by the hand to medical practice, using a method known at Leiden, or perhaps elsewhere, for example, taking them daily to visit the sick at the public hospital. There I have put the symptoms of disease before their eyes, have let them hear the complaints of the patients, and have asked them their opinions as to the causes and rational treatment of each case, and the reasons for those opinions. Then I have given my own judgment on every point. Together with me they have seen the happy results of treatment when God has granted to our cares a restoration of health, or they have assisted in examining the body when the patient has paid the inevitable tribute to death. Glauber, Willis, Mayow, Lemery, Agricola, and Stahl led up to Robert Boyle, with whom modern chemistry may be said to begin. Even as late as 1716, Lady Mary Wortley Montagu in Vienna found that all had transferred their superstitions from religion to chemistry, scarcely a man of opulence or fashion that has not an alchemist in his service. To one scientific man of the period I must refer as author of the first scientific book published in England, Dryden sings, Gilbert shall live till lodestones cease to draw, or British fleets the boundless oceans awe. And the verse is true, for by the publication in 1600 of the De Magnete, the science of electricity was founded. William Gilbert was a fine type of the 16th century physician, a Colchester man, educated at St. John's College, Cambridge. Sylvanus Thompson says, He is beyond question rightfully regarded as the father of electric science. He founded the entire subject of terrestrial magnetism. He also made notable contributions to astronomy, being the earliest English expounder of Copernicus. In an age given over to metaphysical obscurities and dogmatic sophistry, he cultivated the method of experiment and of reasoning from observation, with an insight and success, which entitles him to be regarded as the father of the inductive method. That method, so often accredited to Bacon, Gilbert was practicing years before him. End of section 21. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. Section 22 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 22. Chapter 5. The Rise and Development of Modern Medicine. Part 1. The middle of the 17th century saw the profession thus far on its way. Certain objective features of disease were known, the art of careful observation had been cultivated, many empirical remedies had been discovered, the coarser structure of man's body had been well worked out, and a good beginning had been made in the knowledge of how the machinery worked nothing more. What disease really was, where it was, how it was caused, had not even begun to be discussed intelligently. An empirical discovery of the first importance marks the middle of the century. 
The story of Chincona is of special interest, as it was the first great specific in disease to be discovered. In 1638, the wife of the Viceroy of Peru, the Countess of Chincona, lay sick of an intermittent fever in the Palace of Lima. A friend of her husband's, who had become acquainted with the virtues, in fever, of the bark of a certain tree, sent a parcel of it to the Viceroy. And the remedy administered by her physician, Don Juan del Vego, rapidly effected a cure. In 1640, the Countess returned to Spain, bringing with her a supply of quina bark, which thus became known in Europe as the Countess's powder, pulvis comatisse. A little later her doctor followed, bringing additional quantities. Later in the century, the Jesuit fathers sent parcels of the bark to Rome, whence it was distributed to the priests of the community and used for the cure of ague, hence the name of Jesuit's bark. Its value was early recognized by Sindeham and by Locke. At first there was a great deal of opposition, and the Protestants did not like it because of its introduction by the Jesuits. The famous quack, Robert Talbor, sold the secret of preparing Quiquina to Louis XIV in 1679 for 2,000 Louis de Or, a pension and a title. That the profession was divided in opinion on the subject was probably due to sophistication or to the importation of other and inert barks. It was well into the 18th century before its virtues were universally acknowledged. The tree itself was not described until 1738, and Linnaeus established the genus Chintona in honor of the Countess. A step in advance followed the objective study of the changes wrought in the body by disease. To a few of these, the anatomists had already called attention. Vesalius, always keen in his description of aberrations from the normal, was one of the first to describe internal aneurysm. The truth is, even the best of men had little or no appreciation of the importance of the study of these changes. Sidaham scoffs at the value of post-mortems. Again, we have to go back to Italy for the beginning of these studies, this time to Florence, in the glorious days of Lorenzo the Magnificent. The pioneer now is not a professor, but a general practitioner. Antonio Beneviani, of whom we know very little, save that he was a friend of Marsilio Ficino and of Angelo Poliziano, and that he practiced in Florence during the last third of the fifteenth century, dying in 1502. Through associations with the scholars of the day, he had become a student of Greek medicine, and he was not only a shrewd and accurate observer of nature, but a bold and successful practitioner. He had formed the good habit of making brief notes of his more important cases, and after his death, these were found by his brother Jerome and published in 1507. This book has a rare value, as the record of the experience of an unusually intelligent practitioner of the period. There are in all 111 observations, most of them commendably brief. The only one of any length deals with the new Morbus Gallicus, of which, in the short period between its appearance and Beneviani's death, he had seen enough to leave a very accurate description. And it is interesting to note that even in those early days, mercury was employed for its cure. The surgical cases are of exceptional interest, and number 38 refers to a case of angina for which he performed a successful operation. This is supposed to have been a tracheotomy. And if so, it is the first in the fourteen centuries that had elapsed since the days of Antilius. There are other important cases which show that he was a dexterous and fearless surgeon, but the special interest of the work for us is that for the first time in modern literature, we have reports of post-mortem examinations made specifically with a view to finding out the exact cause of death. Among the 111 cases, there are post-mortem records of cases of gallstones, abscesses of the mesentery, thrombosis of the mesenteric veins, several cases of heart disease, senile gangrene, and one of corvulosum. From no other book do we get so good an idea of a practitioner's experience at this period. The notes are plain and straightforward and singularly free from all theoretical and therapeutic vagaries. 
he gives several remarkable instances of faith healing. To know accurately the anatomical changes that take place in disease is of importance both for diagnosis and for treatment. The man who created the science, who taught us to think anatomically of disease, was Morgani, whose Decedibus et Causis Moriborum per Anatomen Indagatis is one of the great books in our literature. During the 17th century, the practice of making post-mortem examinations had extended greatly, and in the Sepulturitum Anatomicum of Bonetus, 1679, these scattered fragments are collected. But the work of Morgani is of a different type, for in it are the clinical and anatomical observations of an able physician during a long and active life. The work had an interesting origin. A young friend, interested in science and in medicine, was fond of discoursing with Morgani about his preceptors, particularly Valsava and Albertini, and sometimes the young man inquired about Morgani's own observations and thoughts. Yielding to a strong wish, Morgani consented to write his young friend familiar letters describing his experiences. I am sorry that Morgani does not mention the name of the man to whom we are so much indebted, and who, he states, was so pleased with the letters that he continually solicited him to send more and more, till he drew me on so far as the seventieth, when I begged them of him in order to revise their contents. He did not return them, till he had made me solemnly promise that I would not abridge any part thereof. Born in 1682, Morgani studied at Bologna under Vassava and Albertini. In 1711, he was elected professor of medicine at Padua. He published numerous anatomical observations and several smaller works of less importance. The great work, which has made his name immortal in the profession, appeared in his 80th year and represents the accumulated experience of a long life. Though written in the form of letters, the work is arranged systematically and has an index of exceptional value. From no section does one get a better idea of the character and scope of the work than from that relating to the heart and arteries, affections of the pericardium, diseases of the valves, ulceration, rupture, dilation and hypertrophy, and affections of the aorta are all fully described. The section on aneurysm of the aorta remains one of the best ever written. It is not the anatomical observations alone that make the work of unusual value, but the combination of clinical and anatomical records. What could be more correct than this account of angina pectoris, probably the first in the literature? A lady, 42 years of age, who for a long time had been a valetudinarian, and within the same period, on using pretty quick exercise of body, she was subject to attacks of violent anguish in the upper part of the chest, on the left side, accompanied with a difficulty of breathing and numbness of the left arm. But these paroxysms soon subsided when she ceased from exertion. In these circumstances, but with cheerfulness of mind, she undertook a journey from Venice, proposing to travel along the continent, when she was seized with a paroxysm and died on the spot. I examined the body on the following day. The aorta was considerably dilated at its curvature, and in places through its whole tract the inner surface was unequal and ossified. These appearances were propagated into the arteria innominata. The aortic valves were indurated. He remarks, The delay of blood in the aorta, in the heart, in the pulmonary vessels, and in the vena cava would occasion the symptoms of which the woman complained during life, namely the violent uneasiness, the difficulty of breathing, and the numbness of the arm. Morgani's life had as much influence as his work. In close correspondence with the leading men of the day, with the young and rising teachers and workers, his methods must have been a great inspiration. And he came just at the right time. The profession was literally ravaged by theories, schools and systems, iatromechanics, iatrochemistry, humoralism, the animism of Stahl, the vitalistic doctrines of Van Helmont and his followers, and into this metaphysical confusion Morgani came like an old Greek, with his clear observation, sensible thinking, and ripe scholarship. 
Sprengel well remarks that it is hard to say whether one should admire most his rare dexterity and quickness in dissection, his unimpeachable love of truth and justice in his estimation of the work of others, his extensive scholarship and his rich classical style, or his downright common sense and manly speech. Upon this solid foundation, the morbid anatomy of modern clinical medicine was built. Many of Morgani's contemporaries did not fully appreciate the change that was in progress and the value of the new method of correlating the clinical symptoms and the morbid appearances. After all, it was only the extension of the Hippocratic method of careful observation, the study of facts from which reasonable conclusions could be drawn. In every generation there has been men of this type, I dare say many more than we realize, men of the Benevieni character, thoroughly practical, clear-headed physicians. A model of this sort arose in England in the middle of the seventeenth century, Thomas Sydenham, 1624-1689, who took men back to Hippocrates, just as Harvey had led them back to Galen. Sydenham broke with authority and went to nature. It is extraordinary how he could have been so emancipated from dogmas and theories of all sorts. He laid down the fundamental proposition and acted upon it, that all disease could be described as natural history. To do him justice, we must remember, as Dr. John Brown says, in the midst of what a mass of errors and prejudices, of theories actively mischievous, he was placed, at a time when the mania of hypothesis was at its height, and when the practical part of his art was overrun and stultified by vile and silly nostrums. Horae Subsiviae, Volume 1, 4th Edition, Edinburgh, 1882, page 40. Listen to what he says upon the method of the study of medicine. In writing, therefore, such a natural history of diseases, every merely philosophical hypothesis should be set aside, and the manifest and natural phenomena, however minute, should be noted with the utmost exactness. The usefulness of this procedure cannot be overrated, as compared with the subtle inquiries and trifling notions of modern writers. For can there be a shorter, or indeed any other way of coming at the morbific causes, or discovering the curative indications then by a certain perception of the peculiar symptoms. By these steps and helps, it was that the father of physique, the great Hippocrates, came to excel, his theory being no more than an exact description or view of nature. He found that nature alone often terminates diseases, and works a cure with a few simple medicines, and often enough with no medicines at all. Towards the end of the century, many great clinical teachers arose, of whom perhaps the most famous was Borhava, often spoke of as the Dutch Hippocrates, who inspired a group of distinguished students. I have already referred to the fact that Franciscus Silvius at Leiden was the first among the moderns to organize systematic clinical teaching. Under Borhava, this was so developed that, to this Dutch university, Students flocked from all parts of Europe. After teaching botany and chemistry, Borhava succeeded to the chair of physique in 1714. With an unusually wide general training, a profound knowledge of the chemistry of the day, and an accurate acquaintance with all aspects of the history of the profession, he had a strongly objective attitude of mind towards disease, following closely the methods of Hippocrates and Sydenham. He adopted no special system, but studied disease as one of the phenomena of nature. His clinical lectures, held bi-weekly, became exceedingly popular, and were made attractive not less by the accuracy and care with which these cases were studied than by the freedom from fanciful doctrines and the frank honesty of the man. He was much greater than his published work would indicate, and, as is the case with many teachers of the first rank, his greatest contributions were his pupils. No other teacher of modern times has had such a following. Among his favorite pupils may be mentioned Haller, the physiologist, and Van Swieten and de Haan, the founders of the Vienna School. In Italy, too, there were men who caught the new spirit 
and appreciated the value of combining morbid anatomy with clinical medicine. Lanchisi, one of the early students of disease of the heart, left an excellent monograph on the subject, and was the first to call special attention to the association of syphilis with cardiovascular disease. A younger contemporary of his at Rome, Baglivi, was unceasing in his call to the profession to return to Hippocratic methods to stop reading philosophical theories and to give up what he calls the fatal itch to make systems. The Leiden methods of instruction were carried far and wide throughout Europe, into Edinburgh by John Rutherford, who began to teach at the Royal Infirmary in 1747, and was followed by Witt and by Cullen, into England by William Saunders of Guy's Hospital. Unfortunately, the great majority of clinicians could not get away from the theoretical conceptions of disease, and Cullen's theory of spasm and atony exercised a profound influence on practice, particularly in this country, where it had the warm advocacy of Benjamin Rush. Even more widespread became the theories of a pupil of Cullen's, John Brown, who regarded excitability as the fundamental property of all living creatures. Too much of this excitability produced what were known as sthenic maladies, too little asthenic, on which principles practice was plain enough. Few systems of medicine have ever stirred such bitter controversy, particularly on the continent, and in Charles Crichton's account of Brown, we read that as late as 1802, the University of Göttingen was so convulsed by controversies as to the merits of the Brunonian system that contending factions of students in enormous numbers, not unaided by the professors, met in combat, in the streets, on two consecutive days and had to be dispersed by a troop of Hanoverian horse. But the man who combined the qualities of Vesalius, Harvey, and Morgani, in an extraordinary personality, was John Hunter. He was, in the first place, a naturalist, to whom pathological processes were only a small part of a stupendous whole, governed by law, which, however, could not be understood until the facts had been accumulated, tabulated, and systematized. By his example, by his prodigious industry, and by his suggestive experiments, he led men again into the old paths of Aristotle, Galen, and Harvey. He made all thinking physicians naturalists, and he lent a dignity to the study of organic life, and re-established a close union between medicine and the natural sciences. Both in Britain and Great Britain, he laid the foundation of the great collections and museums, particularly those connected with the medical schools. The Wistar Horner and the Warren Museums in this country originated with men greatly influenced by Hunter. He was, moreover, the intellectual father of that interesting group of men on this side of the Atlantic, who, while practicing as physicians, devoted much time and labor to the study of natural history. Such men as Benjamin Smith Barton, David Hossack, Jacob Bigelow, Richard Harlan, John D. Godman, Samuel George Morton, John Collins Warren, Samuel L. Mitchell, and J. Elkin Miggs. He gave an immense impetus in Great Britain to the study of morbid anatomy, and his nephew, Matthew Bailey, published the first important book on the subject in the English language. Before the 18th century closed, practical medicine had made great advance. Smallpox, though not one of the great scourges like plague or cholera, was a prevalent and much dreaded disease, and in civilized countries few reached adult life without an attack. Edward Jenner, a practitioner in Gloucestershire, and the pupil to whom John Hunter gave the famous advice, Don't think, try, had noticed that milkmaids, who had been infected with cowpox from the udder of the cow, were insusceptible to smallpox. I show you here the hand of Sarah Nelms, with cowpox, 1796, notwithstanding the resemblance which the pustule thus excited on the boy's arm bore to variolous inoculation, yet as the indisposition attending it was barely perceptible. I could scarcely persuade myself the patient was secure from the smallpox. However, on his being inoculated some months afterward, it proved that he was secure. 
The results of his experiments were published in a famous small quarto volume in 1798. From this date, smallpox has been under control. Thanks to Jenner, not a single person in this audience is pockmarked. A hundred and twenty-five years ago, the faces of more than half of you would have been scarred. We now know the principle upon which protection is secured, and active acquired immunity follows upon an attack of a disease of a similar nature. Smallpox and cowpox are closely allied, and the substances formed in the blood by the one are resistant to the virus of the other. I cannot see how any reasonable person can oppose vaccination or decry its benefits. I show you the mortality figures of the Prussian army and of the German empire. A comparison with the statistics of the armies of other European countries in which revaccination is not so thoroughly carried out is most convincing of its efficacy. End of part one. End of section twenty two. Section twenty three of the Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 23. Chapter 5. The Rise and Development of Modern Medicine. Part 2. The early years of the century saw the rise of modern clinical medicine in Paris. In the art of observation, men had come to a standstill. I doubt very much whether Corvassa in 1800 was any more skillful in recognizing a case of pneumonia than was Aretius in the second century A.D. But disease had come to be more systematically studied. Special clinics were organized, and teaching became much more thorough. Anyone who wishes to have a picture of the medical schools in Europe in the first few years of the century should read the account of the travels of Joseph Frank of Vienna. The description of Corvassa is of a pioneer in clinical teaching, whose method remains in vogue today in France. The ward visit, followed by a systematic lecture in the amphitheater. There were still lectures on Hippocrates three times a week, and bleeding was the principal plan of treatment. One morning, Frank saw thirty patients out of one hundred and twelve bled. Corvassar was the strong clinician of his generation, and his accurate studies on the heart were among the first that had concentrated attention upon a special organ. To him, too, is due the reintroduction of the art of percussion in internal disease, discovered by Auenberger in 1761. The man who gave the greatest impetus to the study of scientific medicine at this time was Bichat, who pointed out that the pathological changes in disease were not so much in organs as in tissues. His studies laid the foundation of modern histology. He separated the chief constituent elements of the body into various tissues, possessing definite physical and vital qualities. Sensibility and contractibility are the fundamental qualities of living matter and of the life of our tissues. Thus, Bichat substituted for vital forces vital properties, that is to say, a series of vital forces inherent in the different tissues. His Anatomic General, published in 1802, gave an extraordinary stimulus to the study of the finer processes of disease. And his famous Recherche sur la vie et sur la mort, 1800, dealt a death blow to old iatromechanical and iatrochemical views. His celebrated definition may be quoted, La vie et l'assemblée de propriété vitale qui résiste au propriété physique, ou bien la vie et l'assemblée de fonctions qui résistent à la mort. Life is the sum of the vital properties that withstand the physical properties, or life is the sum of the functions that withstand death. Bichat is another pathetic figure in medical history. His meteoric career ended in his thirty-first year. He died a victim of post-mortem wound infection. At his death, Corvassa wrote Napoleon, Bichat has just died at the age of thirty. That battlefield on which he fell is one which demands courage 
and claims many victims. He has advanced the science of medicine. No one at his age has done so much so well. It was a pupil of Corvisa, René Theophile Leonek, who laid the foundation of modern clinical medicine. The story of his life is well known. A Breton by birth, he had a hard uphill struggle as a young man, a struggle of which we have only recently been made aware by the publication of a charming book by Professor Rousseau of Nantes. Leonek, Avant, 1806. Influenced by Corvisar, he began to combine the accurate study of cases in the wards with anatomical investigations in the dead house. Before Leonek, the examination of a patient had been largely by sense of sight, supplemented by that of touch, as in estimating the degree of fever or the character of the pulse. Auenberger's Inventum Novum of Percussion, recognized by Corvisar, extended the field, but the discovery of auscultation by Leonek and the publication of his work, De l'Auscultation Idiot, in 1819, marked an era in the study of medicine. The clinical recognition of individual diseases had made really very little progress. With the stethoscope begins the day of physical diagnosis. The clinical pathology of the heart, lungs, and abdomen was revolutionized. Leinick's book is in the category of the eight or ten greatest contributions to the science of medicine. His description of tuberculosis is perhaps the most masterly chapter in clinical medicine. This revolution was effected by a simple extension of the Hippocratic method from the bed to the dead house, and by correlating the signs and symptoms of a disease with its anatomical appearances. The pupils and successors of Corvisa, Bale, Andral, Houlon, Chomel, Fiori, Retourneau, Rayer, Cruvelier, and Trousseau, brought a new spirit into the profession. Everywhere, the investigation of disease by clinical pathological methods widened enormously the diagnostic powers of the physician. By this method, Richard Bright, in 1836, opened a new chapter on the relation of disease of the kidney to dropsy and to albuminous urine. It had already been shown by Blackwell and by Wells, the celebrated Charleston, South Carolina physician in 1811, that the urine contained albumin in many cases of dropsy. But it was not until Bright began a careful investigation of the bodies of patients who had presented these symptoms that he discovered the association of various forms of disease of the kidney with anasarca and albumous urine. In no direction was the harvest of this combined study more abundant than in the complicated and confused subject of fever. The work of Lewis and of his pupils, W. W. Gerhardt and others, revealed the distinction between typhus and typhoid fever, and so cleared up one of the most obscure problems in pathology. By Morgani's method of anatomical thinking, Skoda in Vienna, Schonlein in Berlin, Graves and Stokes in Dublin, Marshall Hall, C.J.B. Williams, and many others introduced the new and exact methods of the French and created a new clinical medicine. A very strong impetus was given by the researches of Virchow on cellular pathology, which removed the seats of disease from the tissues, as taught by Bichat, to the individual elements, the cells. The introduction of the use of the microscope in clinical work widened greatly our powers of diagnosis, and we obtained thereby a very much clearer conception of the actual process of a disease. In another way, too, medicine was greatly helped by the rise of experimental pathology, which had been introduced by John Hunter, was carried along by Magendi and others, and reached its culmination in the epic-making researches of Claude Bernard. Not only were valuable studies made on the action of drugs, but also our knowledge of cardiac pathology was revolutionized by the work of Trauba, Kahnheim, and others. In no direction did the experimental method effect such a revolution as in our knowledge of the functions of the brain. Clinical neurology, which had received a great impetus by the studies of Todd, 
Romberg, Lockhart, Clark, Duchesne, and Dwyer Mitchell was completely revolutionized by the experimental work of Hitzig, Fritsch, and Ferrier on the localization and functions in the brain. Under Charceau, the school of French neurologists give great accuracy to the diagnosis of obscure affections on the brain and spinal cord, and the combined results of the new anatomical, physiological, and experimental work have rendered clear and definite what was formerly the most obscure and complicated section of internal medicine. The end of the fifth decade of the century is marked by a discovery of supreme importance. Humphrey Davy had noted the effects of nitrous oxide. The exhilarating influence of sulfuric ether had been casually studied, and Long, of Georgia, had made patients inhale the vapor until anesthetic and had performed operations upon them when in this state. But it was not until October 16, 1846, in the Massachusetts General Hospital, that Morton, in a public operating room, rendered a patient insensible with ether, and demonstrated the utility of surgical anesthesia. The rival claims of priority no longer interest us, but the occasion is one of the most memorable in the history of the race. It is well that our colleagues celebrate Ether Day in Boston. No more precious boon has ever been granted to suffering humanity. In 1857, a young man, Louis Pasteur, sent to the Little Scientific Society a paper on lactic acid fermentation, and in December of the same year presented to the Academy of Sciences in Paris a paper on alcoholic fermentation in which he concluded that the deduplication of sugar into alcohol and carbonic acid is correlative to a phenomenon of life. A new era in medicine dates from those two publications. The story of Pasteur's life should be read by every student. It is one of the glories of human literature, and as a record of achievement and of nobility of character, is almost without an equal. At the middle of the last century, we did not know much more of the actual causes of the great scourges of the race, the plagues, the fevers, and the pestilences, than did the Greeks. Here comes Pastor's great work. Before him, Egyptian darkness. With his advent, a light that brightens more and more as the years give us ever fuller knowledge. The facts that fevers were catching, that epidemics spread, that infection could remain attached to articles of clothing, etc., all gave support to the view that the actual cause was something alive, a contagium vivum. It was really a very old view, the germs of which may be found in the fathers, but which was first clearly expressed, so far as I know, by Fracastorius, the Veronese physician in the sixteenth century, who spoke of the seeds of contagion passing from one person to another. And he first drew a parallel between the processes of contagion and the fermentation of wine. There was more than one hundred years before Kircher, Leuvenhock, and others began to use the microscope and to see animalcula, etc., in water, and so give a basis for the infinitely little view of the nature of disease germs. And it was a study of the processes of fermentation that led Pasteur to the sure ground on which we now stand. Out of these researches arose a famous battle, which kept Pasteur hard at work for four or five years, the struggle over spontaneous generation. It was an old warfare, but the microscope had revealed a new world, and the experiments on fermentation had lent great weight to the omni vivum ex ovo doctrine. The famous Italians, Reddy and Spallanzani, had led the way in their experiments, and the latter had reached the conclusion that there is no vegetable and no animal that has not its own germ. But heterogenesis became the burning question, and Pouchet in France and Bastian in England led the opposition to Pasteur. The many famous experiments carried conviction to the minds of scientific men, and destroyed forever the old belief in spontaneous generation. All along, the analogy between disease and fermentation 
must have been in Pastor's mind. And then came the suggestion. What would be most desirable is to push those studies far enough to prepare the road for a serious research into the origin of various diseases. If the changes in lactic, alcohol, and butyric fermentations are due to minute living organisms, why should not the same tiny creatures make the changes which occur in the body in the putrid and suppurative diseases? With an accurate training as a chemist, having been diverted in his studies upon fermentation into the realm of biology, and nourishing a strong conviction of the identity between putrefactive changes of the body and fermentation, Pasteur was well prepared to undertake investigations which had hitherto been confined to physicians alone. So impressed was he with the analogy between fermentation and the infectious diseases, that in 1863 he assured the French emperor of his ambition to arrive at the knowledge of the causes of putrid and contagious diseases. After a study upon the diseases of wines, which has had most important practical bearings, an opportunity arose which changed the whole course of his career and profoundly influenced the development of medical science. A disease of the silkworm had for some years ruined one of the most important industries in France, and in 1865, the government asked Pasteur to give up his laboratory work and teaching and to devote his whole energies to the task of investigating it. The story of the brilliant success, which followed years of application to the problem, will be read with deep interest by every student of science. It was the first of his victories in the application of the experimental methods of a trained chemist to the problems of biology and it placed his name high in the group of the most illustrious benefactors of practical industries. In a series of studies on the diseases of beer and on the mode of production of vinegar, he became more and more convinced that these studies on fermentation had given him the key to the nature of the infectious diseases. It is a remarkable fact that the distinguished English professor of the 17th century the man who more than anyone else of his century appreciated the importance of the experimental method, Robert Boyle had said that he who could discover the nature of ferments and fermentation would be more capable than anyone else of explaining the nature of certain diseases. In 1876, there appeared in Cohn's Beitrage zur Morphologie der Pfanzen, Volume 2, pages 277 through 310, a paper on the etiology of anthrax by a German district physician in Wallstein, Robert Koch, which is memorable in our literature as the starting point of a new method of research into the causation of infectious diseases. Koch demonstrated the constant presence of germs in the blood of animals dying from the disease. Years before, those organisms had been seen by Pollander and Duvain, but the epoch-making advance of Koch was to grow those organisms in a pure culture outside the body, and to produce the disease artificially by inoculating animals with the cultures. Koch is really our medical Galileo, who by means of a new technique, pure cultures and isolated staining, introduced us to a new world. In 1878, followed his study on the ideology of wound infections, in which he was able to demonstrate conclusively the association of microorganisms with the disease. The next great advance was the discovery by Pasteur of the possibility of so attenuating or weakening the poison that an animal inoculated had a slight attack, recovered, and was then protected against the disease. More than 80 years had passed since on May 14, 1796, Jenner had vaccinated a child with cowpox and proved that a slight attack of one disease protected the body from a disease of an allied nature. An occasion equally famous in the history of medicine was a day in 1881 when Pasteur determined that a flock of sheep vaccinated with the attenuated virus of anthrax remained well 
when every one of the unvaccinated infected from the same material had died. Meanwhile, from Pastor's researches on fermentation and spontaneous generation, a transformation had been initiated in the practice of surgery, which, it is not too much to say, has proven one of the greatest boons ever conferred upon humanity. It had long been recognized that, now and again, a wound healed without the formation of pus, that is, without suppuration. But both spontaneous and operative wounds were almost invariably associated with that process, and, moreover, they frequently became putrid, as it was then called, infected, as we should say. The general system became involved, and the patient died of blood poisoning. So common was this, particularly in old, ill-equipped hospitals, that many surgeons feared to operate, and the general mortality in all surgical cases was very high. Believing that it was from outside that the germs came which caused the decomposition of wounds, just as from the atmosphere the sugar solution got the germs which caused the fermentation, a young surgeon in Glasgow, Joseph Lister, applied the principles of Pasteur's experiments to their treatment. From Lister's original paper, I quote the following. Turning now to the question how the atmosphere produces decomposition of organic substances, we find that a flood of light has been thrown upon this most important subject by the philosophic researches of M. Pasteur, who has demonstrated by thoroughly convincing evidence that it is not to its oxygen or to any of its gaseous constituents that the air owes this property, but to minute particles suspended in it, which are the germs of various low forms of life, long since revealed by the microscope, and regarded as merely accidental concomitants of putrescence, but now shown by Pasteur to be its essential cause. Resolving the complex organic compounds into substances of similar chemical constitution, just as the yeast plant converts sugar into alcohol and carbonic acid. From these beginnings, modern surgery took its rise, and the whole subject of wound infection, not only in relation to surgical diseases, but to childbed fever, forms now one of the most brilliant chapters in the history of preventative medicine. With the new technique, and experimental methods, the discovery of the specific germs of many of the more important acute infections followed each other with bewildering rapidity. Typhoid fever, diphtheria, cholera, tetanus, plague, pneumonia, gonorrhea, and, most important of all, tuberculosis. It is not too much to say that the demonstration by Koch of the bacillus tuberculosis in 1882 is in its far-reaching results, one of the most momentous discoveries ever made, of almost equal value, have been the researches upon the protozoan forms of animal life as causes of disease. As early as 1873, spirilla were demonstrated in relapsing fever. Laveran proved the association of hematozoa with malaria in 1880. In the same year, Griffith Evans discovered trypanosomes in a disease of horses and cattle in India, and the same type of parasite was found in the sleeping sickness. Amoeba were demonstrated in one form of dysentery, and in other tropical diseases, protozoa were discovered, so that we were really prepared for the announcement in 1905 by Schauden of the discovery of a protozoan parasite in syphilis. Just fifty years had passed since Pasteur had sent in his paper on lactic acid fermentation to the Lilla Scientific Society, half a century in which more had been done to determine the true nature of disease than in all the time that had passed since Hippocrates. Celsus makes the oft-quoted remark that to determine the cause of a disease often leads to the remedy, and it is the possibility of removing the cause that gives such importance to the new researches on disease. End of Part 2 End of Section 23
Section 24 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Section 24. Chapter 5. The Rise and Development of Modern Medicine. Part 3. Internal Secretions One of the greatest contributions of the nineteenth century to scientific medicine was the discovery of the internal secretions of organs. The basic work on the subject was done by Claude Bernard, a pupil of the great Magendi, whose saying it is well to remember, When entering a laboratory, one should leave theories in the cloakroom. More than any other man of his generation, Claude Bernard appreciated the importance of experiment in practical medicine. For him, the experimental physician was the physician of the future, a view well borne out by the influence his epoch-making work has had on the treatment of disease. His studies on the glycogenic functions of the liver opened the way for the modern fruitful researches on the internal secretions of the various glands. About the same time that Bernard was developing the laboratory side of the problem, Addison, a physician to Guy's Hospital in 1855, pointed out the relation of a remarkable group of symptoms to disease of the suprarenal glands, small bodies situated above the kidneys the importance of which had not been previously recognized. With the loss of the function of these glands by disease, the body was deprived of something formed by them which was essential to its proper working. Then, in the last third of the century, came in rapid succession the demonstration of the relations of the pancreas to diabetes, of the vital importance of the thyroid gland and of the pituitary body. Perhaps no more striking illustration of the value of experimental medicine has ever been given than that afforded by the studies upon those glands. The thyroid body, situated in the neck, and the enlargement of which is called goiter, secretes substances which pass into the blood and which are necessary for the growth of the body in childhood, for the development of the mind, and for the nutrition of the tissues of the skin. If, following an infectious disease, a child has wasting of this gland, or if, living in a certain district, it has a large goiter, normal development does not take place, as the child does not grow in mind or body, and becomes what is called a cretin. More than this, if in adult life the gland is completely removed, or if it wastes, a somewhat similar condition is produced, and the patient in time loses his mental powers and becomes fat and flabby, myxedematous. It has been shown experimentally, in various ways, that the necessary elements of the secretion can be furnished by feeding with the gland or its extract and that the cretinoid or myxedematous conditions could thus be cured or prevented. Experimental work has also demonstrated the functions of the suprarenal glands and explained the symptoms of Addison's disease, and chemists have even succeeded in making synthetically the active principle adrenaline. There is perhaps no more fascinating story in the history of science than that of the discovery of these so-called ductless glands. Part of its special interest is due to the fact that clinicians, surgeons, experimental physiologists, pathologists, and chemists have all combined in splendid teamwork to win the victory. No such miracles have ever before been wrought by physicians as those which we see in connection with the internal secretion of the thyroid gland. The myth of bringing the dead back to life has been associated with the names of many great healers since the incident of Empedocles and Panthea. 
but nowadays the dead in mind and the deformed in body may be restored by the touch of the magic wand of science. The study of the interaction of these internal secretions, their influence upon development, upon mental process, and upon disorders of metabolism, is likely to prove in the future of a benefit scarcely less remarkable than that which we have traced in the infectious diseases. Chemistry. It is not making too strong a statement to say that the chemistry and chemical physics of the 19th century have revolutionized the world. It is difficult to realize that Liebig's famous Gießen Laboratory, the first to be opened to students for practical study, was founded in the year 1825. Boyle, Cavendish, Priestley, Lavoisier, Black, Dalton, and others had laid a broad foundation, and Young, Freudenhofer, Rumford, Davy, Joule, Faraday, Clerk Maxwell, Helmholtz, and others, built upon that, and gave us new physics, and made possible our age of electricity. New technique and new methods have given a powerful stimulus to the study of the chemical changes that take place in the body, which only a few years ago were matters largely of speculation. Now, in the words of Professor Lee, we recognize that, with its living and its non-living substances inextricably intermingled, the body constitutes an intensive chemical laboratory, in which there is ever occurring a vast congeries of chemical reactions. Both constructive and destructive processes go on. New protoplasm takes the place of old. We can analyze the income of the body, and we can analyze its output, and from these data we can learn much concerning the body's chemistry. A great improvement in the method of such work has recently been secured by the device of enclosing the person who is the subject of the experiment in a respiration calorie meter. This is an airtight chamber, artificially supplied with a constant stream of pure air and from which the expired air, laden with the products of respiration, is withdrawn for purposes of analysis. The subject may remain in the chamber for days, the composition of all food and all excrete being determined, and all heat that is given off being measured. Favorable conditions are thus established for an exact study of many problems of nutrition. The difficulties increase when we attempt to trace the successive steps in the corporeal pathway of molecule and atom. Yet these secrets of the vital process are also gradually being revealed. When we remember that it is in this very field of nutrition that there exists great popular ignorance and a special proneness to fad and prejudice, we realize how practically helpful are such exact studies of metabolism. End of section 24 Section 25 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson the Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler Chapter 6. The Rise of Preventive Medicine Introduction The story so far has been of men and of movements, of men who have consciously or unconsciously initiated great movements, and of movements by which Nolans, Volans, the men of time, were molded and controlled. Hippocrates, in the Tractate on Ancient Medicine, has a splendid paragraph on the attitude of mind towards the men of the past. My attention was called to it one day in the Roman Forum by Commendatore Boni, who quoted it as one of the great sayings of antiquity. Here it is, quote, But on that account I say we ought not to reject the ancient art, as if it were not, and had not been properly founded, because it did not attain accuracy in all things, but rather since it is capable of reaching to the greatest exactitude by reasoning, to receive it and admire its discoveries, made from a state of great ignorance, and as having been well and properly made, 
and not from chance. Unquote. I have tried to tell you of what the best of these men in successive ages knew, to show you their point of outlook on the things that interest us. To understand the old writers, one must see as they saw, feel as they felt, believe as they believed, and this is hard, indeed impossible. We may get near them by asking the spirit of the age in which they lived to enter in and dwell with us, but it does not always come. Literary criticism is not literary history. We have no use here for the former, but to analyze his writings is to get as far as we can behind the doors of a man's mind, to know and appraise his knowledge, not from our standpoint, but from that of his contemporaries, his predecessors, and his immediate successors. Each generation has its own problems to face, looks at truth from a special focus, and does not quite see the same outlines as any other. For example, men of the present generation grow up under influences very different from those which surrounded my generation in the seventies of the last century, when Verkow and his great contemporaries laid the sure and deep foundations of modern pathology. Which of you now knows the cellular pathology as we did? To many of you it is a closed book. To many more, Weichau may be thought a spent force. But no, he has only taken his place in a great galaxy. We do not forget the magnitude of his labors, but a new generation has new problems. His message was not for you. But that medicine today runs in larger molds and turns out finer castings is due to his life and work. It is one of the values of lectures on the history of medicine to keep alive the good influences of great men even after their positive teaching is antiquated. Let no man be so foolish as to think that he has exhausted any subject for his generation. Virchow was not happy when he saw the young men pour into the old bottle of cellular pathology the new wine of bacteriology. Lister could never understand how aseptic surgery arose out of his work. Ehrlich would not recognize his epoch-making views on immunity when this generation has finished with them. I believe it was Hegel who said that progress is a series of negations, the denial today of what was accepted yesterday, the contradiction by each generation of some part at least of the philosophy of the last. But all is not lost. The germplasm remains, a nucleus of truth to be fertilized by men, often ignorant even of the body from which it has come. Knowledge evolves, but in such a way that its possessors are never in sure possession. Quote, it is because science is sure of nothing that it is always advancing. Unquote. Duclo. History is the biography of the mind of man, and its educational value is in direct proportion to the completeness of our study of the individuals through whom this mind has been manifested. I have tried to take you back to the beginnings of science and to trace its gradual development, which is conditioned by three laws. In the first place, like a living organism, truth grows, and its gradual evolution may be traced from the tiny germ to the mature product. Never springing Minerva-like to full stature at once, truth may suffer all the hazards incident to generation and gestation. Much of history is a record of the mishaps of truths which have struggled to birth, only to die, or else to wither in premature decay. Or the germ may be dormant for centuries, awaiting the fullness of time. Secondly, all scientific truth is conditioned by the state of knowledge at the time of its announcement. Thus, at the beginning of the seventeenth century, the science of optics and mechanical appliances had not made possible, so far as the human mind was concerned, the existence of blood capillaries and blood corpuscles. Jenner could not have added to his inquiry a study on immunity. Sir William Perkin and the chemists made Cook technique possible. Pasteur gave the conditions that produced Lister. Davy and others furnished the preliminaries necessary for anesthesia. Everywhere we find this filiation, one event following the other in orderly sequence. Mind begins mind, as Harvey de Generation says. Quote, opinion is the source of opinion. Democritus with his atoms, and Eudoxus with his chief good, which he placed in pleasure, impregnated Epicurus. The four elements of Empedocles, Aristotle. The doctrines of the ancient Thebans, Pythagoras and Plato. Geometry, Euclid. Unquote. 
and thirdly to scientific truth alone may the homo mensura principle be applied since of all mental treasures of the race it alone compels general acquiescence that this general acquiescence this aspect of certainty is not reached per saltum but is of slow often difficult growth marked by failures and frailties but crowned at last with an acceptance accorded to no other project of mental activity is illustrated by every important discovery from copernicus to darwin the difficulty is to get men to the thinking level which compels the application of scientific truths protagoras that mighty wise man as socrates called him who was responsible for the aphorism that man is the measure of all things would have been the first to recognize the folly of this standard for the people at large but we have gradually reached a stage in which knowledge is translated into action made helpful for suffering humanity just as the great discoveries in physics and chemistry have been made useful in the advance of civilization we have traced medicine through a series of upward steps a primitive stage in which it emerged from magic and religion into an empirical art as seen among the egyptians and babylonians a stage in which the natural character of disease was recognized and the importance of its study as a phenomenon of nature was announced a stage in which the structure and functions of the human body were worked out a stage in which the clinical and anatomical features of disease were determined a stage in which the causes of disorders were profitably studied and a final stage in which we have just entered the application of the knowledge for their prevention science has completely changed man's attitude towards disease take a recent concrete illustration a couple of years ago in philadelphia and in some other parts of the united states a very peculiar disease appeared characterized by a rash upon the skin and moderate fever and a constitutional disturbance proportionate to the extent and severity of the eruption the first malady broke out in the members of a crew of a private yacht then in the crews of other boats and among persons living in the boarding-houses along the docks it was the cause of a great deal of suffering and disability there were three courses open to accept the disease as a visitation of god a chastening affliction sent from above and to call to aid the spiritual arm of the church except the peculiar people few now take this view or adopt this practice the christian scientists would probably deny the existence of the rash and of the fever refuse to recognize the itching and get himself into harmony with the infinite thirdly the method of experimental medicine first the conditions were studied under which the individual case occurred the only common factor seemed to be certain straw mattresses manufactured by four different firms all of which obtained their straw from the same source the second point was to determine the relation of the straw to the rash one of the investigators exposed a bare arm and shoulder for an hour between two mattresses three people voluntarily slept on the mattresses for one night siftings from the straw were applied to the arm under all of which circumstances the rash quickly developed showing conclusively the relation of the straw to the disease thirdly siftings from the straw and mattresses which had been thoroughly disinfected failed to produce the rash and fourthly careful inspection of the siftings of the straw disclosed living parasites small mites which when applied to the skin quickly produced the characteristic eruption in the section twenty five Section 26 of the Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Chapter 6 Rise of Preventive Medicine Sanitation. When the thoughtful historian gets far enough away from the nineteenth century to see it as a whole, no single feature will stand out with greater distinctness than the fulfillment of the prophecy of Descartes that we could be freed from an infinity of maladies, both of body and mind, if we had sufficient knowledge of their causes and all the remedies with which nature has provided us. Sanitation takes its place among the great modern revolutions, political, social, and intellectual. 
Great Britain deserves the credit for the first practical recognition of the Maxim Salus Populi Suprema Lex. In the middle and the latter part of the century, a remarkable group of men, Southwood Smith, Chadwick, Budd, Murchison, Simon, Ackland, Buchanan, J. W. Russell, and Benjamin Ward Richardson, put practical sanitation on a scientific basis. Even before the full demonstration of the germ theory, they had grasped the conception that the battle had to be fought against a living contagion which found in poverty, filth, and wretched homes, the conditions for its existence. One terrible disease was practically wiped out in twenty-five years of hard work. It is difficult to realize that within the memory of men now living, typhus fever was one of the great scourges of our large cities, and broke out in terrible epidemics, the most fatal of all to the medical profession. In the severe epidemic in Ireland in the forties of the last century, one-fifth of all the doctors in the island died of typhus. A better idea of the new crusade, made possible by new knowledge, is to be had from a consideration of certain diseases against which the fight is in active progress. Nothing illustrates more clearly the interdependence of the sciences than the reciprocal impulse given to new researches in pathology and entomology by the discovery of the part played by insects in the transmission of disease. The flea, the louse, the bedbug, the housefly, the mosquito, the tick, have all within a few years taken their place as important transmitters of disease. The fly population may be taken as the sanitary index of a place. The discovery, too, that insects are porters of disease has led to a great extension of our knowledge of their life history. Early in the nineties, when Dr. Thayer and I were busy with the study of malaria in Baltimore, we began experiments on the possible transmission of the parasites, and a tramp who had been a medical student offered himself as a subject. Before we began, Dr. Thayer sought information as to the varieties of mosquitoes known in America, but sought in vain. There had at that time been no systematic study. The fundamental study which set us on the track was a demonstration by Patrick Manson in 1879 of the association of filarian disease with the mosquito. Many observations had already been made, and were made subsequently on the importance of insects as intermediary hosts in the animal parasites. But the first really great scientific demonstration of a widespread infection through insects was by Theobald Smith, now of Harvard University, in 1889, in a study of Texas fever of cattle. I well remember the deep impression made upon me by his original communication, which in completeness, in accuracy of detail, in Harveyan precision, and in practical results, remains one of the most brilliant pieces of experimental work ever undertaken. It is difficult to draw comparisons in pathology. But I think if a census were taken among the world's workers on disease, the judgment to be based on the damage to health and direct mortality, the votes would be given to malaria as the greatest single destroyer of the human race. Cholera kills its thousands, plagues in its bad years its hundreds of thousands, yellow fever, hookworm disease, pneumonia, tuberculosis, are all terribly destructive, some only in the tropics, others in more temperate regions. But malaria is today, as it ever was, a disease to which the word pandemic is especially applicable. In this country and in Europe, its ravages have lessened enormously during the past century. But in the tropics, it is everywhere and always present, the greatest single foe of the white man, and at times and places it assumes the proportions of a terrible epidemic. In one district of India alone, during the last four months of 1908, one quarter of the total population suffered from the disease, and there were 400,000 deaths, practically all from malaria. Today the control of this terrible scourge is in our hands, and as I shall tell you in a few minutes, largely because of this control, the Panama Canal is being built. No disease illustrates better the progressive evolution of scientific medicine. It is one of the oldest of the known diseases. The Greeks and Greco-Romans knew it well. It seems highly probable, as brought out by the studies of W. H. S. Jones of Cambridge, that in part at least, the physical degeneration in Greece and Rome, 
may have been due to the great increase of this disease. Its clinical manifestations were well known and admirably described by the older writers. In the seventeenth century, as I have already told you, the remarkable discovery was made that the bark of the Sincona tree was a specific. Between the date of the Countess's recovery in Lima and the year 1880, a colossal literature on the disease had accumulated. Literally thousands of workers had studied the various aspects of its many problems. The literature of this country, particularly of the southern states, in the first half of the last century, may be said to be predominantly malarial. Ordinary observation carried on for long centuries had done as much as was possible. In 1880, a young French army surgeon, Le Verin by name, working in Algiers, found in the microscopic examination of the blood that there were little bodies in the red blood corpuscles, amoeboid in character, which he believed to be the germs of the disease. Very little attention was at first paid to his work, and it is not surprising. It was the old story of Wolf Wolf. There had been so many supposed germs that the profession had become suspicious. Several years elapsed before Surgeon General Sternberg called the attention of the English-speaking world to Laveran's work. It was taken up actively in Italy and in America by councilmen, Abbott, and by others, among us in Baltimore. The result of these widespread observations was the confirmation in every respect of Laveran's discovery of the association with malaria of a protozoan parasite. This was step number three. Clinical observation, empirical discovery of the cure, determination of the presence of a parasite. Two other steps followed rapidly. Another army surgeon, Ronald Ross, working in India, influenced by the work of Manson, proved that the disease was transmitted by certain varieties of mosquitoes. Experiments came in to support the studies in etiology. Two of those may be quoted. Mosquitoes which had bitten malarial patients in Italy were sent to London, and there allowed to bite Mr. Manson, son of Dr. Manson. This gentleman had not lived out of England, where there is now no acute malaria. He had been a perfectly healthy, strong man. In a few days following the bites of the infected mosquitoes, he had a typical attack of malarial fever. The other experiment, though of a different character, is quite as convincing. In certain regions about Rome, in the Campania, malaria is so prevalent that in the autumn almost everyone in the district is attacked, particularly if he is a newcomer. Dr. Sambon and a friend lived in this district from June 1st to September 1st, 1900. The test was whether they could live in this exceedingly dangerous climate for the three months without catching malaria, if they used stringent precautions against the bites of mosquitoes. For this purpose, the hut in which they lived was thoroughly wired, and they slept under netting. Both of these gentlemen, at the end of the period, had escaped the disease. Then came the fifth and final triumph, the prevention of the disease. The anti-malarial crusade, which has been practiced by Sir Ronald Ross, and has been carried out successfully on a wholesale scale in Italy and in parts of India and Africa, has reduced enormously the incidence of the disease. Professor Celli of Rome, in his lecture room, has an interesting chart which shows the reduction of the mortality from malaria in Italy since the preventative measures have been adopted. The deaths have fallen from above 28,000 in 1888 to below 2,000 in 1910. There is needed a stirring campaign against the disease throughout the southern states of this country. The story of yellow fever illustrates one of the greatest practical triumphs of scientific medicine. Indeed, in view of its far-reaching commercial consequences, it may range as one of the first achievements of the race. Ever since the discovery of America, the disease has been one of its great scourges, permanently endemic in the Spanish main, often extending to the southern states, occasionally into the north, and not infrequently it has crossed the Atlantic. The records of the British Army in the West Indies show an appalling death rate, chiefly from this disease. At Jamaica, for the twenty years ending in 1836, the average mortality was 101 per thousand and in certain instances as high as 178. One of the most dreaded of all infections, the periods of epidemics in the southern states 
have been the occasions of a widespread panic with complete paralysis of commerce how appalling the mortality is may be judged from the outbreak in philadelphia in seventeen ninety three when ten thousand people died in three months the epidemics in spain in the early part of the nineteenth century were of great severity a glance through la roche's great books on the subject soon gives one an idea of the enormous importance of the disease in the history of the southern states havana ever since its foundation had been a hotbed of yellow fever the best minds of the profession had been attracted to a solution of the problem but all in vain commission after commission had been appointed with negative results various organisms had been described as the cause and there were sad illustrations of the tragedy associated with investigations undertaken without proper training or proper technique by the year nineteen hundred not only had the ground been cleared but the work on insect-borne disease by manson and by ross had given observers an important clue it had repeatedly been suggested that some relation existed between the bites of mosquitoes and the tropical fevers particularly by the remarkable student knot of mobile and the french physician beauperthy but the first to announce clearly the mosquito theory of the disease was carlos finlay of havana early in the spring of nineteen hundred during the occupation of cuba by the united states a commission appointed by surgeon general sternberg himself one of the most energetic students of the disease undertook fresh investigations dr walter reed professor of bacteriology in the army medical school was placed in charge dr carroll of the united states army dr agramonte of havana and dr jesse w lazier were the other members at the johns hopkins hospital we were deeply interested in the work as dr walter reed was a favorite pupil of professor welch a warm friend of all of us and a frequent visitor to our laboratories dr jesse lazier who had been my house physician had worked with dr thayer and myself at malaria and gave up the charge of my clinical laboratory to join the commission many scientific discoveries have afforded brilliant illustrations of method in research but in the work of these men one is at a loss to know which to admire more the remarkable accuracy and precision of the experiments or the heroism of the men officers and rank and file of the united states army they knew all the time that they were playing with death and some of them had to pay the penalty the demonstration was successful beyond peradventure that yellow fever could be transmitted by mosquitoes and equally the negative proposition that it could not be transmitted by fomites an interval of twelve or more days was found to be necessary after the mosquito has bitten a yellow fever patient before it is capable of transmitting the infection lazier permitted himself to be bitten by a stray mosquito while conducting his experiments in the yellow fever hospital bitten on the thirteenth he sickened on the eighteenth and died on the twenty fifth of september but not until he had succeeded in showing in two instances that mosquitoes could convey the infection he added another to the long list of members of the profession who have laid down their lives in search of the causes of disease of such men as lazier and of myers of the liverpool yellow fever commission dutton and young manson may fitly be sung from the noblest of american poems the tribute which lowell paid to harvard's sons who fell in the war of secession many in sad faith sought for her many with crossed hands sighed for her but these our brothers fought for her at life's dear peril wrought for her so loved her that they died for her fortunately the commander-in-chief at the time in cuba was general leonard wood who had been an army surgeon and he was the first to appreciate the importance of the discovery the sanitation of havana was placed in the hands of dr gorgas and within nine months the city was cleared of yellow fever and with the exception of a slight outbreak after the withdrawal of the american troops has since remained free from a disease which had been its scourge for centuries as general wood remarked reed's discovery has resulted in the saving of more lives annually than were lost in the cuban war and saves the commercial interests of the world a greater financial loss each year than the cost of the cuban war 
he came to cuba at a time when one-third of the officers of my staff died of yellow fever and we were discouraged at the failure of our efforts to control it unquote. following the example of havana other centers were attacked at vera cruz and in brazil with the same success and it is safe to say that now thanks to the researches of reed and his colleagues with proper measures no country need fear a paralyzing outbreak of this once dreaded disease the scientific researches in the last two decades of the nineteenth century made possible the completion of the panama canal the narrow isthmus separating the two great oceans and joining the two great continents has borne for four centuries an evil repute as the white man's grave silent upon a peak of darien stout cortez with eagle eye had gazed on the pacific as early as fifteen twenty saavedra proposed to cut a canal through the isthmus there the first city was founded by the conquerors of the new world which still bears the name of panama spaniards english and french fought along its coasts to it the founder of the bank of england took his ill-fated colony raleigh drake morgan the buccaneer and scores of adventurers seeking gold found in fever an enemy stronger than the spaniard for years the plague-stricken isthmus was abandoned to the negroes and the half-breeds until in eighteen forty nine stimulated by the gold fever of california a railway was begun by the american engineers totten and trotwine and completed in eighteen fifty five a railway every tie of which cost the life of a man the dream of navigators and practical engineers was taken in hand by ferdinand de lesseps in january eighteen eighty one the story of the french canal company is a tragedy unparalleled in the history of finance and one may add in the ravages of tropical disease yellow fever malaria dysentery typhus carried off in nine years nearly twenty thousand employees the mortality frequently rose above one hundred sometimes to one thirty one forty and in september eighteen eighty five it reached the appalling figure of one hundred seventy six point nine seven per thousand work people this was about the maximum death rate of the british army in the west indies in the nineteenth century when in nineteen four the united states undertook to complete the canal every one felt that the success or failure was largely a matter of sanitary control the necessary knowledge existed but under the circumstances could it be made effective many were doubtful fortunately there was at the time in the united states army a man who had already served an apprenticeship in cuba and to whom more than to any one else was due the disappearance of yellow fever from that island to a man the profession of the united states felt that could dr gorgas be given full control of the sanitary affairs of the panama zone the health problem which meant the canal problem could be solved there was at first a serious difficulty relating to the necessary administrative control by a sanitary officer in an interview which dr welch and i had with president roosevelt he keenly felt this difficulty and promised to do his best to have it rectified it is an open secret that at first as was perhaps only natural matters did not go very smoothly and it took a year or more to get properly organized yellow fever recurred on the isthmus in 1904 and in the early part of 1905 it was really a colossal task in itself to undertake the cleaning of the city of panama which had been for centuries a pest house the mortality in which even after the american occupation reached during one month the rate of seventy one per thousand living there have been a great many brilliant illustrations of the practical application of science in preserving the health of a community and in saving life but it is safe to say that considering the circumstances the past history and the extraordinary difficulties to be overcome the work accomplished by the isthmian canal commission is unique the year nineteen five was devoted to organization yellow fever was got rid of and at the end of the year the total mortality among the whites had fallen to eight per thousand but among the blacks it was still high forty four for three years with a progressively increasing staff which had risen to above forty thousand of whom more than twelve thousand were white the death rate progressively fell of the six important tropical diseases plague which reached the isthmus one year 
was quickly held in check. Yellow fever, the most dreaded of them all, never recurred. Berry Berry, which in 1906 caused 68 deaths, has gradually disappeared. The hookworm disease, ankylosomiasis, has steadily decreased. From the very outset, malaria has been taken as the measure of sanitary efficiency. Throughout the French occupation, it was the chief enemy to be considered, not only because of its fatality, but on account of the prolonged incapacity following infection. In 1906, out of every 1,000 employees, there were admitted to the hospital from malaria 821. In 1907, 424. In 1908, 282. In 1912, 110. In 1915, 51. In 1917, 14. The fatalities from the disease have fallen from 233 in 1906 to 154 in 1907, to 73 in 1908, and to 7 in 1914. The death rate from malarial fever per 1,000 population sank from 8.49 in 1906 to 0 0.11 in 1918. Dysentery, next to malaria, the most serious of the tropical diseases in the zone, caused 69 deaths in 1906, 48 in 1907. In 1908, with nearly 44,000, only 16 deaths, and in 1914, four. But it is when the general figures are taken that we see the extraordinary reduction that has taken place. Out of every 1,000 engaged in 1908, only a third of the number died that died in 1906, and half the number that died in 1907. In 1914, the death rate from disease among white males had fallen to 3.13 per thousand. The rate among the 2,674 American women and children connected with the commission was only 9.72 per thousand. But by far the most gratifying reduction is among the blacks, among whom the rate from disease had fallen to the surprisingly low figure in 1912 of 8.77 per thousand. In 1906, it was 47 per thousand. A remarkable result that in 1908, the combined tropical diseases, malaria, dysentery, and beriberi, killed fewer than the two great killing diseases of the temperate zone, pneumonia and tuberculosis, 127 in one group and 137 in the other. The whole story is expressed in two words, effective organization. And the special value of this experiment in sanitation is that it has been made and made successfully in one of the great plague spots of the world. Month by month, a little gray-covered pamphlet was published by Colonel Gorgas, a report of the Department of Sanitation of the Isthmian Canal Commission. I have been one of the favored to whom it has been sent year by year, and keenly interested as I have always been in infectious diseases, and particularly in malaria and dysentery, I doubt if anyone has read it more faithfully. In evidence of the extraordinary events made in sanitation by Gorgas, I give a random example from one of his monthly reports, 1912. In a population of more than 52,000, the death rate from disease had fallen to 7.31 per thousand. Among the whites, it was 2.80, and among the colored people, 8.77. Not only is the profession indebted to Colonel Gorgas and his staff for this remarkable demonstration, but they have offered an example of thoroughness and efficiency which has won the admiration of the whole world. As J. B. Bishop, Secretary of the Isthmian Canal Commission, has recently said, quote, The Americans arrived on the Isthmus in the full light of these two invaluable discoveries, the insect transmission of yellow fever and malaria. Scarcely had they begun active work when an outbreak of yellow fever occurred, which caused such a panic throughout their force that nothing except the lack of steamship accommodation prevented the flight of the entire body from the isthmus. Prompt, intelligent, and vigorous application of the remedies shown to be effective by the mosquito discoveries not only checked the progress of the pest, but banished it forever from the isthmus. In this way, and in this alone, was the building of the canal made possible. The supreme credit for its construction, therefore, belongs to the brave men, surgeons of the United States Army, who by their high devotion to duty 
and to humanity risked their lives in havana in nineteen hundred to nineteen one to demonstrate the truth of the mosquito theory Unquote. one disease has still a special claim upon the public in this country some fourteen or fifteen years ago in an address on the problem of a typhoid fever in the united states i contended that the question was no longer in the hands of the profession in season and out of season we had preached salvation from it in volumes which fill state reports public health journals and the medical periodicals though much has been done typhoid fever remains a question of grave national concern you lost in this state in nineteen eleven from typhoid fever one hundred fifty four lives every one sacrificed needlessly every one a victim of neglect and incapacity between twelve hundred and fifteen hundred persons had a slow lingering illness a nation of contradictions and paradoxes a clean people by whom personal hygiene is carefully cultivated but it has displayed in matters of public sanitation a carelessness simply criminal a sensible people among whom education is more widely diffused than in any other country supinely acquiesces in conditions often shameful beyond expression the solution of the problem is not very difficult what has been done elsewhere can be done here it is not so much in the cities though here too the death rate is still high but in the smaller towns and rural districts in many of which the sanitary conditions are still those of the middle ages how galen would have turned up his nose with content at the water supply of the capital of the dominion of canada scourged so disgracefully by typhoid fever of late there is no question that the public is awakening but many state boards of health need more efficient organization and larger appropriations others are models and it is not for lack of example that many lag behind the health officers should have special training in sanitary science and special courses leading to diplomas in public health should be given in the medical schools were the health of the people made a question of public and not of party policy only a skilled expert could possibly be appointed as a public health officer not as it is now so often the case the man with the political pole it is a long and tragic story in the annals of this country that distinguished man the first professor of physic in this university in the early years of last century dr nathan smith in that notable monograph on typhus fever eighteen twenty four tells how the disease had followed him in his various migrations from seventeen eighty seven when he began to practice all through his career and could have returned this year in some hundred and forty or one hundred and fifty families of the state he would find the same miserable tragedy which he had witnessed so often in the same heedless sacrifice of the young on the altar of ignorance and incapacity in the section twenty six Section 27 of The Evolution of Modern Medicine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler. Chapter 6 Rise of Preventive Medicine Tuberculosis in a population of about one million seventeen hundred persons died of tuberculosis in this state in the year nineteen eleven a reduction in thirty years of nearly fifty per cent a generation has changed completely our outlook on one of the most terrible scourges of the race it is simply appalling to think of the ravages of this disease in civilized communities before the discovery by robert cook of the bacillus we were helpless and hopeless in an oriental fatalism we accepted with folded hands a state of affairs which use and want had made bearable to-day look at the contrast we are both helpful and hopeful knowing the cause of the disease knowing how it is distributed better able to recognize the early symptoms better able to cure a very considerable portion of all early cases we have gradually organized an enthusiastic campaign which is certain to lead to victory the figures i have quoted indicate how progressively the mortality is falling 
Only do not let us be disappointed if this comparatively rapid fall is not steadily maintained in the country at large. It is a long fight against a strong enemy, and at the lowest estimate it will take several generations before tuberculosis is placed at last with leprosy and typhus among the vanquished diseases. Education, organization, cooperation. These are the weapons of our warfare. Into details I need not enter. The work done by the National Association under the strong guidance of its secretary, Mr. Farrand, the pioneer studies of Trudeau, and the optimism which he has brought into the campaign, the splendid demonstration by the New York Board of Health of what organization can do, have helped immensely in this worldwide conflict. Some years ago, in an address at Edinburgh, I spoke of the triple gospel which man has published, of his soul, of his goods, of his body. This third gospel, the gospel of his body, which brings man into relation with nature, has been a true evangelon. The glad tidings of the final conquest of nature, by which man has redeemed thousands of his fellow men from sickness and from death. If in the memorable phrase of the Greek philosopher Prodicus, that which benefits human life is God. We may see in this new gospel a link betwixt us and the crowning race of those who eye to eye shall look on knowledge, and in whose hand nature shall be an open book, an approach to the glorious day which Shelley sings so gloriously. Happiness and science dawn though late upon the earth. Peace cheers the mind, health renovates the frame. Disease and pleasure cease to mingle here. Reason and passion cease to combat here. Whilst mine unfettered o'er the earth extends its all-subduing energies and wields the scepter of a vast dominion there. Damon of the World, Part 2 End of Section 27 End of the Evolution of Modern Medicine by Sir William Osler